Damn. You'd think I'd be more careful with my uh, boom arm there. You gotta get that Skyrim ambience just right. Can't be too loud or people complain. How are we doing, hustlers? <clears throat> I don't hate the AI Dagothur memes. I just think that the last funny one was made the day 11 Labs released. <laughs> Look, chat, there you are. Maybe I shouldn't pin Morrowind as bad, though. I'd hate to spoil my upcoming video. I'm a bit low. That's not impossible, but it doesn't look like it to me. I could always turn myself up. Hang on. Should I do it with the interface or with the interface's software? Okay, Let's see here. Y'all just tell me if it's um peaking. What's your IQ? I don't know. Who gets IQ tested these days? Who has time to get IQ tested? I'm trying to hustle here. Are you going to review Hogwarts Legacy? Oh, yeah. Well, I say, oh, yeah, like it's um, some guaranteed thing. I played Hogwarts Legacy. I plan to write about Hogwarts Legacy. But until I actually do write about it, I've only played it. Are we getting Castius or Waifu VTuber? Um... Is Cassius the name of the... <laughs> the... <laughs> I know you're thinking of Caius, uh, not Cassius. No, I got both loaded up today. We can do uh, whatever VTuber model people pay for. By the way, shout out to the guy that donated two, or not two, but 20 Norwegian Crones. Like an hour after the stream came up yesterday. Because, <laughs> uh... If I wasn't watching the chat, I would have never known. I would just have this mysterious $1.91. And no sign of the donation. Amalgamation of Crassius and Caius. Oh, that's true. Would you be against writing reviews for a website? It would be a fundamental change of face. And it'd have to be a website that, like... Um, I'm kind of invested in on the management side because otherwise I'm just a games journalist. Will you eventually do Elden Ring? I'd love to do Elden Ring. Like uh, Cyberpunk, though, it's kind of waiting on the, the DLC to all finish up before I actually consider that a, a viable option. But yeah, I think Elden Ring would be a cool project. Classic WoW video win. Um, um, you know, I get those feelings sometimes and... Uh, like, I've seriously considered it as a project. I think it'd be a fun challenge. And I think a lot of people would like it. But I was thinking about the other day that, like, the window is slowly closing now because more and more people have gotten to play it. So. Um, YouTube chat. Cannot stay, but I'd like to hurt you all with the knowledge that they're tearing down all the unique houses of King County and replacing them with plywood million-dollar McMansions. You know, that hegemony will end um, within the next year once all those contractors lose their budgets because the housing market crunches 20 to 30 percent. 20 to 30 percent, that's crazy, but it's not impossible. God forbid we ever get an interest rate that's like 10 percent, people will lose their minds. An ironic waifu tier list of Elder Scrolls for the meme. There's not enough waifus, really. You would need, like, for waifu tier lists to work, you need, like, 30 options. So I could do that for Overwatch, and I've done it for Overwatch. Because Overwatch is 
nothing but sex appeal, but I don't know, there's just like what, five characters? Any Soulsborn series retrospective coming? It's a possibility. Um it's a distinct possibility. I've always liked the idea of that kind of project. But, um... I think, obviously, people would like other things. Who are we doing first? Who's the first waifu? Ratwoman from Balmora, number one. I don't have the Ratwoman from Balmora. Altmer waifu. Here's another 191. Thank you. I was shaking with indecision here. Oh no, I'm a VTuber. Oh, how'd the position get so messed up? <laughs> I don't think I've been this zoomed out on the VTuber model before. Some of you are seeing that this girl has midriff. You doing another Morrowind video? Um, I'm not, but I am researching Morrowind. Go buy some Sudafed, you sound sick. Thank you for saying that I sound sick. No, I'm not sick. I'm parched. <laughs> nern rut. Nern rot. Uh, nern root. Nern rout. It was like my speech teacher insisting that uh, poor said, poor. We have to charge the poors to breathe. <laughs> Argonian waifu, please. Oh, I've got the Argonian waifu loaded up. Both versions of her. Long retrospective. I don't have time to finish that in my lifetime. Once we've got the, uh, the mind transfer, mind upload technology sorted out, that's when I can start the long projects. So I can spend the next thousand years... Reviewing games from a 15 year time period. <laughs> How does the VTuber stuff even work? Do you have mocap thingies glued to your face or does it track automatically? It's just a webcam that uh, that is calibrated to um, the uh, girl I have next to me, her face, yeah. It's kind of like uh, pimping, if you've ever heard of that. Currently working on a game as a solo dev. Heavily inspired by Morrowind. Off the top of your head, what is the biggest thing you would add to the game to improve it? Also, Cassius for life. Biggest thing to add to Morrowind to improve it. Um, Let's see. I'd have to pick one category and go with that. Um, uh, probably the scale of the world. Kind of spacing everything out more than it is. So that you can get more like verticality packed into it. That's a big thing I'm missing in games these days, is just vertical. Um, another thing is like the dungeons. A lot of base Morrowind dungeons are either like one room lobbies or like... Uh, I don't know. They could be more impressive. They could do more. Orc Waifu is the best girl and quest giver. It's true. I think... Are all the orc women in Skyrim quest givers? It's a distinct possibility. Remove spellcrafting. Mm, no. Spellcrafting's too fun to just remove. And there's a lot of situations where creativity is fueled by spellcrafting. Or creative use of game mechanics, anyways. Need more cat girlfriends and more wins. Well, you know, more options. Romance mod. I'll never install. Dungeon generation in AD&D Appendix A, and it makes better dungeons than I've seen in most video games. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Research for the sake of research? No! We're doing research for somebody else's video.
Why do so many people hang on to old Bethesda games like Fallout New Vegas and Morrowind so hard? That's what made Fallout New Vegas? Is this April Fools? No, it's a real stream. Have you played through the Morrowind DLC on Elder Scrolls Online? Uh, I wouldn't say played through it, but I have played it and uh, not impressed. Somebody said earlier, like, um, an ESO video would be, like, talking about why the early content makes the game bad, and it's like, yeah, but also, like, the, the later content and, like, every expansion... Like, I'm pretty sure I've heard ESO players talk about how, like, the ratio of good to bad content's, like, 1 to 10. What are they saying to Reverine so weird in ESO? I always thought it was, like, um... Multiple pronunciations. So, like, your regional affects of how you would say it. It's not the worst thing, in my opinion. And it'd be cool if that's, like, what they were intentionally going for. Uh, and there's... I mean, there might be some telling, but... They could also lie and say, Oh, yeah, that's totally the reason. We just didn't, you know, didn't know how to say it. And got a bunch of voice lines that kind of contradict. But they're from the region. Yeah, but Morrowind's, like, a big area. So if you think about, like, New England and how many different accents exist in just that area, or let alone, like, you go to the UK where it's like every 10 miles or so, there's a new accent. I think regional accents are a cool idea. And if you want to push the envelope in an open world RPG, you should be like really getting into that. Because that's like the next step in audio design. It's not like, I see what sound designers are doing and I'm like, yeah, it's cool that you got super authentic car sounds, but it's like, could we get some realistic accents? That would be impressive. They have Rethan Manor on the Odai Plateau in the Second Era. Yeah, Tiber Septim burned it down. When he did the big retcon that fixes everything. I believe a character pronounces Nereverine differently twice in 30 second time window. Well, listen, it's the finer points of the language, you know. Um, if it's the masculine Nereverine, then you say it that way, but if it's the feminine Nereverine. <laughs> Go ahead, put a romantic language. Put a romantic uh, con language in your game. Love your videos. How do you think people would react if it does announce the next Elder Scrolls game to have an adult-only rating? I feel like the jokes would write themselves. I feel like I don't even have to try there. That would be them embracing the inevitable market that exists. What is a work stream? A work stream is where I uh, bully, relentlessly bully other YouTubers. Any update on LARP episode number five? Uh, it's probably not going to be about... Uh, what the hell was their name? G4TV and Rooster Teeth? Who controls the realm of Sovngarde? Sure, but it's part of Ethereus. So. Are we bullying Salt Factory today? Oh yeah, he did make a Morrowind video. But no. We're bullying a different overrated content creator today. The jokes would write themselves and then people would write them anyways. Yeah, they would write them incessantly. Because they do like six daily uploads. How do you feel about Magicka region mods from Morrowind? It's inauthentic, but at the same time, authentic in Morrowind is just resting to recover all your Magicka anyways, so it's, like, not the biggest deal. Can we bully Salt Factory at some point in the future? I don't think he deserves it that bad. It depends on if he's, like... We gotta let him put out a few more videos to see if he's, like, improved. Or if he's still doing the, like... I was thinking about it last night, um, because I was thinking about, like, the ratio synopsis to analysis. Your signal-noise ratio, and it's like, how many sentences of synopsis before it's too much? You know, how do you space out your analysis? 
Which is a stylistic thing. I don't think there's any right answer. And I think there is such a thing as too much signal. Hey, Morrowind's DLC is a contentious topic. I can... Um, I don't think I did them justice. <laughs> what do you mean he's done, not done anything wrong? He got a quest in Skyrim wrong. Don't you understand? That's like the most important thing. <laughs> So is this research for private sessions? Yes, let's get them in here. Hey, hustlers. You got to get involved. Wait, that might not make sense for you. Um, favorite tabletop role-playing game? You know, I haven't played enough because I don't have any friends. I don't have time for tabletop. Were you waiting for someone to bring it up? Someone, like, spoiled it in, like, the first five minutes, if that. Do you think your biggest failure with the Morrowind video is the lack of focus on side quests in the expansions? That, well, I don't know if you noticed, that theme kind of continues into the later videos anyways. I made the rookie mistake. I forgot it was muted. Oh, I thought that was intentional. Hello. Chat. We're doing co-op today. Should I edit the stream title? The at you? I guess so. It's your show. Hey, you come up in two letters. I don't know if that means anything. I think for you, I need to do like four or five before it pops up. Yeah, PA is a pretty common... Um, combination so p a r t private sessions has done the most for orc female visibility is that true <laughs> is that true i post the i post the boston orc porn scene guy and you're telling me that he's done more than that I saw someone say your Tez videos all have overarching emotional tones in them. Morrowind's very reverent, Oblivion's comedic and lighthearted, and Skyrim's dreary and depressing. Was that intentional? Um, no, not really. <laughs> People say that the, my Skyrim video is dreary and depressing. I think that's like two parts that uh, actually qualify as that. Your ending to the Skyrim analysis made me feel sad, genuinely sound broken. I mean, yeah, the, the ending for sure. <laughs> but at the same time, you should be happy for me because the, the greatest joy in life is that I'm not working on that fucking Skyrim video anymore. <laughs> You know, I'm sitting right here. I still have yeah. <laughs> about 800 man hours left on that project before I get to be free. The Skyrim video needed more humor and shit talking. That was the way. Hang on. That's the most I shit talked in the video. I think anyways. Imagine if it was a Witcher 3 video and you were still working on it for four years. You know, poor Joseph Anderson. I wouldn't feel so bad for him. He's a he's a Twitch streamer now. Yeah, he's Makes a successful good. successful Twitch streamer. N unironically, yeah, he gets like two thousand viewers on his tw uh, Twitch channel. Oh yeah, I like, wasn't I wasn't shit talking. I'm genuinely, <laughs> that's uh, why I said like he ain't coming back. People think he's coming back to YouTube. Yeah, it's a shame. You hate to see it, but you got that. It opens it opens up an opportunity for more people to get in. You know, game analysis to streamer uh, grind set. 
This is why I stream so infrequently, so I don't take the pill. Twitch seems like a miserable existence. It's true. Every time I look at Twitch as an option for streaming, something about it breaks even further. <laughs> and so, like, I've never seriously considered it as a place to stream. I had a realization yesterday where I was looking at my recommendations and it was all IRL streamers. I was just like, yep, that's, uh, that's this platform now. We got a question for us both. How much do you think they're going to retcon lore and simplify gameplay in Test 6? Feels like it's going to become open world Uncharted or something. I usually don't engage in the Elder Scrolls 6 black pilling that people do because that conversation goes the same way every time, which is that you just spitball bad ideas about ways that you can simplify everything even further. So, I mean, looking at what they're doing with Starfield, I think it's I think it's safe to say Tez 6 is going to have some more RPG elements and stuff again. There yeah. was a quote. I, I really need to track this quote down where, what's his face? Todd Howard was saying that people weren't ready for RPGs when they were making skyrim or some shit like that but like with starfield people are ready now i mean is he wrong there was like a huge explosion in casual market whereas now like rp the rpg niche is kind of stabilized so like it sucks that it happened but i mean man made bethesda worth like seven billion dollars so no i mean it makes sense from a business perspective i just think it's disingenuous to say people did not want rpgs when months before uh dark souls one came out and uh you know mm -hmm. people were people were pretty happy with it so and i think the dark souls train took a while to rev up to skyrim it did. numbers oh it's a skyrim numbers sure but i don't know I, I still feel like it's a disingenuous thing to say that people weren't ready for rpgs and it's just like is outer worlds bad i did the editorial pass on my outer world script <clears throat> and yeah, I can pretty confidently say that the Outer Worlds is not good. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, it's sad to say, but like, no, it's really, really not good. And the biggest example of this is like uh, Roseway, which is like um, this optional piece of content. Like, it's not tied into the main quest or anything. Like, there's a decent chance if you do one side of the quest line, you never go there. Um... Roseway was like their vertical slice and it doesn't have like two of the three core problems that the rest of the game has. So there was a there was a chance. It was just at some point they decided that the game needed to have like way too much humor. And then the worst part is like in the documentary they talk about how like they needed the humor to space out the dark tones of Outer Worlds. Is dark tones in Outer Worlds? Yeah, I mean, like, Amazon fulfillment warehouses have more dark tones than Outer Worlds. <laughs> Are we going to talk about Rooster Teeth soon? What's there to talk about? They did do a rebranding recently. Yeah, it looks awful. Yeah. I feel like it's a, I've already I've... mostly forgotten your and Sessions videos. Can't wait. For the end of Private Session's Skyrim Saga. Too bad most RPGs aren't RPGs nowadays. Well, the indie scene's having a revival. Did you see the Actman stuff? No, I didn't. Actman um, made a video, which is like a five-year-old take of like arena shooters being dead. Recently he did this? He, he, like a month ago, yeah. Oh, God. So like all the FPS people were putting him on blast. <laughs> Dusk. Ultra Kill. I mean, you have an entire fucking indie studio, an indie publisher that launched off of the revival. And Actman being Actman, of course, as soon as he was like, as soon as he was mildly criticized and told that like, hey, if you had put some indie games in your video, they would, <laughs> the genre might come back. He was like, um, actually, I think your editing sucks and you can't do re that. So typical Actman yeah. um, nonsense. He said Duke Nukem was a Doom clone. That's pretty funny. <laughs> there's always um, there's always weird takes like that, especially with the build engine games. Because I've heard Blood described as a Doom clone too, which is uh, in a different way as hilarious. Is Hogwarts Legacy deserving of a badass seal of approval? Yeah, I think so. It's actually pretty good.
The best part of Hogwarts Legacy is I don't have to talk about the trans stuff because it has nothing to do with the game. He, he isn't wrong about multiplayer arena shooters, which was what the video is mostly about. I mean, well, the weird thing is people have this definition of multiplayer games where, like, if they have less than a thousand players, they're dead. When there's plenty of multiplayer games out there that thrive on, like, 100 player counts. Isn't there, like, uh, that Quake? Like, Quake Live or something like that? Isn't that still going? Yeah, um... There's a few to games, few multiplayer games that people are still playing. Now I think it's safer to say the uh, the Halo Arena shooters. That's those are dead right now. Yeah, that um, that balance between like a military first person shooter and an actual arena shooter. Yeah. Well, Halo's dead in general. Yeah. <laughs> we saw that, um... He changes his name a lot, but it's Andy's video on Halo Infinite, yeah. parts 1 and 2. Actually, pretty good video. Made me want to play the single player of Halo Infinite out of curiosity, because... Um, I'm the guy who's subsidizing the entire open world genre. <laughs> I like the people on Twitter that are like, I think open world games are overrated. And it's like, I'll play your weird open world conversion of Halo. Harry Potter has fans. No, Harry Potter fucking sucks. But I like Hogwarts Legacy. That's kind of the thing is like outsiders don't quite get that. Um, Harry Potter is different than the setting that it's in. And a lot of people who like that setting don't like Harry Potter because it's poorly written. Halo has no reason to be dead. Oh yeah, it was murdered. Murdered for sure. Yeah, Halo, Halo Reach was uh, just a neglectful installment and then 343 came in and it's just like, alright, we're gonna just take this thing out back now. I don't see a Total War question. Are you talking about Total Warhammer? Hogwarts Legacy is Harry Potter, but alright. I mean, again, not really. Because the core of Harry Potter is the character that the story's named after. It's not in the game. It's not about blood purism. So that, that makes it like 100% better by default. ODST is underrated, for sure. Nian. <laughs> <laughs> JK didn't care about world building. So JK Rowling's problem, this is a spoiler for the video, but who cares? JK Rowling's problem is that she will introduce world elements for the sake of establishing a character, and she won't consider the long-term implications of those world elements. So it's like... Time Turners only exist because she wants to say that Hermione, like, works way too hard at her classes. So let's invent time travel to justify why she can take all these electives. What's the April Fool's joke with this? Once again, I am uploading on April Fool's. Not a joke. I actually don't care for April Fool's, so I usually just do, like, you know, normal stuff. I wanted to stream, uh, and E3 is dead. Ad oh, yeah. Ads will run shortly for some viewers. Hey, viewers, you've got 48 seconds to say whether or not you want to watch ads. <laughs> Wait, it's it's playing ads automatically? Uh, yeah, there's a setting you can enable that will, like, um, oh. do your ad breaks by default. So it's probably been some... Oh, yeah, it's been almost... It's going to happen in, like, exactly 30 minutes. Wow, I'm surprised. I wonder if that means they fix the auto ads for um Here's the Okay, so here's odds. Here's the deal chat. You've been good with donations. So I'm going to skip the ads. <laughs> uh that was so disruptive. Didn't you ask a question? Did I? Mm. I don't I don't remember now.
Is the dislike of April Fool's PTSD from their Elden Ring video? No, I was making fun of April Fool's before the Elden Ring video. Want a break from the ads? Oh yeah, E3. E3 died. That's what we were going to talk about. Yeah, uh, what a shame. It's not actually dead. Kind of. Basically what happened is E3 was always a show where uh, everybody that was attending was like doing all the work to host it anyways. And they just kind of realized from, I think Nintendo started it with Direct, that they could just do their own E3 whenever they wanted to. Yeah, and they don't have to fight for all the noise and everything like that so they can just stagger everything i think it's funny that the only people that i've been seeing lamenting about the death of e3 were the game journalists that would go there and probably just get like shit faced and you know oh no just... i have to go to europe to go to gdc yeah <laughs> and it's like they're like oh this is what a loss for gamers and it's like what the fuck are you guys talking about Wait for E3 2024 when it's revived as a Crypto Bro showcase. <laughs> uh, I think, isn't E3 run by the ESA? So I don't think that's likely. Do you think current events slash politics ever have a place in good video games or fiction in general? Um, allegorically, sure. Literally, no. Because um, you kind of want to let things like play out so you can get the full context if you want to write a mature story. I never understood E3. It was just getting advertised to. It's like a... Well, journalists would use it as an opportunity to talk to developers and make connections. For consumers, like, yeah, it is just getting advertised to. What's your opinion on the South Park RPGs? There's two, right? I played the first one. And I didn't think it was bad, so... Back in the 90s, E3 definitely had a practical purpose. Yeah, but they should have seen... the way things were going, like, even then. I remember watching G E3 coverage on G4 as a kid. That's... Definitely a very dated statement now, because <laughs> both are dead. <laughs> but that was, that was funny, it was G4 really was propped up by their exclusive E3 coverage for a while. Mm -hmm. And I remember G4 coverage would be worse than just, like, Than just watching else. trailers online. Yeah. Oh, yeah, or GameSpot or something like yeah, that. Like... Their coverage was usually better as well. But, you know. Having a physical trade show for digital content is strange to begin with. I mean... Not necessarily. Again, it's an opportunity to give people limited access demos in like a very controlled way. Which is where uh, Penny Arcade Expo came in and just did it for the public. Mm. There was a lot of nails in the coffin for E3. I feel like PAX was one of them, like a major one. Yeah, the, well, the other one was just everybody having to do their own show. And then, like, yeah. so, and then Bethesda comes along and is doing their show, and, like, they don't get to be in the main E3. They have to do their own thing. And it's like, well, if they can do their own thing, then why can't Microsoft? And it's like, EA doesn't have enough in the stable anymore to do their show. Does Ubisoft? Like, both those companies are suffering because they went to the live service route of releasing, like, three products a year. Yeah, a lot of things survived the pandemic. E3 could have survived if it wanted to. I don't think it wanted to. Yeah. Yeah, when you have your main attendees not wanting to do it anymore, that's that's when you know you're basically done. Was nobody asked for the... Was nobody asked for this one, huh? Like, this one exists. I don't have to be an anime girl. 
The crowd demands I be an anime girl. The life service means scam. Who needs E3? We have Creator Clash 2. Do we? Do we? And a Deep Rock Galactic roll. Yeah, remind me after the stream and I'll get around to doing an opt-in roll for the Deep Rock Galactic players. And no, I don't play it uh, with anybody from the server. It's just somehow a Deep Rock Galactic group is formed uh, spontaneously on my server. And people don't think that evolution's real. Is it really Creator Clash if Sam Hyde isn't beating Hassan Piker bloody? That's my whole thing. Is as long as they act like exclusive to like Sam Hyde and that stable of creators, they're never going to be able to take get taken seriously because it's a wrestling match. And who's better at like wrestling promos than the million dollar extreme people? Jeff Keighley gets to turn the VGAs into a more of a replacement E3, I guess. Yeah, but the problem the problem with um the problem with the VGAs is they take place in mid-December. So it's like you someone pointed this out recently. They did an award show where the winner of a category came out after the award show that year. So I guess they just have to go into next year. How goes work on the Hogwarts Legacy video? Um, uh, <laughs> Harry Potter's number one fan asking. Uh, so, I haven't written anything down for it yet. I'm going to be doing footage review soon. I've got 76 in Outer Worlds scripts written. I've got 76 voiceovers done. So, after all that, it's not going to be like a, like a timely video. But I kind of realized I don't like doing that anyways. I don't like it's point. Yeah. It's pointless. I don't like competing in the timely review game. If you make a good video, ideally it should pay itself off in the long run. Timing timing really shouldn't matter all too much. Unless you really time it poorly. Yeah, the 76 in Outer Worlds videos are what I call a medium length project, so do with that information what you will. Can I get Uncle Hawaiian Shirt Caius? What's your favorite platformer, if you have any? Not a big platforming person. I have to switch. Oh, no. Has 76 fixed its issues? Which ones? The bugs that have been in it since launch? The busted progression? The janky servers? What? <laughs> the, the best all time, of these issues still exist the best time to play fallout 76 was in like february of 2020 i'm sorry you missed the boat <laughs> i still think it was the best time to play it was when it originally launched just for the fun of it i wish i got to play it then the lag oh well you can pay for fallout first so you can have access to private servers so you don't have to deal with the lag the game as is, much the game is so laggy it will literally change your story because it can't pull up the <laughs> quest stages fast enough yeah that was pretty wild why are game devs so resistant to fixing bugs usually that's a management side issue um it's not that the game developers don't want to do it it's that there's not a particular incentive to do it because um consumers aren't discerning enough about not buying games that get released as buggy so mm -hmm. there also comes a point where it's just you fix a bug and then like two more bugs pop up and everything so especially with bethesda games
Bethesda can't rely on the unofficial patch of 76. Yep. That's, what's funny, too, is I've, I've seen people giving Bethesda credit for addressing bugs in this game, and it's like, yeah, because it's an online game, people can't just mod it anymore. Do you think Skyrim would have lasted in popularity this long without the modding scene? No, modding's half the copium. Modding's all the copium, really. The positive for reviews for 76 feel AI generated? That's not entirely impossible. <laughs> um, it's definitely a lot of people justifying the time they've sunk into the game at this point. Yeah, you'll have people who are like, I play Fallout 76 eight plus hours a day, and it's like, okay, you should not be allowed to make a review of the game. Fallout MMO is such a great concept, but they didn't lean into it being a Fallout MMO. Yeah, they didn't lean into it, and I don't think they even had the skills to be able to pull it off. Thoughts on Among Us 2? Um, That's a thing. Go play uh, Space Station. Hopefully 14, if it works. Or separate the reviews between professional time dumpers versus casual player reviews. Well, and the whole deal with the, the eight-hour Fallout 76 players, which is kind of bizarre to me. You're free to explain why playing eight hours of Fallout 76 a day isn't really, like, a regular thing to do. It should be kind of self-explanatory, but, like... Can you explain for the audience that? Oh, the fact that you're arbitrarily limited to like only two hours of content a day because everything just stops after a point. Yeah, like there's just, l there's limited there's limits on the stuff that you can do on everything, yeah, literally on everything. With, like currency limits. It's not like a mobile game where it's like you get two hours of energy a day. It's like literally. Um, you can't play a single character for more than three hours. Yeah. You'll either I mean, run out of stat... Well, unless you just start dropping stuff, I guess. Remember that time your save corrupted after hundreds of hours? No. I've never had a save corruption issue. I don't know what's different between me and other people other than I don't go hard in the sauce on modding. Alrighty. Um, <clears throat> well, chat, I think we're warmed up. We're going to be watching a special uh, Morrowind video today. That's right. Salt Factory's time has come. Actually, it's uh, my video. So, Mr. Sessions, when are you going to yeah. get Corporal Sessions? Um, I got to approve the promotion. Mm, okay. Um, you haven't actually seen this video, have you? Um, I watched bits and piece pieces of it, but uh, not the whole thing. Oh, that's the wrong answer. What happened to you not having seen it? I, I I haven't watched most of it. Does that count? I guess. <laughs> I, it's been a while. I haven't watched it in a... I don't remember, like, anything. Except the intro. Do you want to watch the intro? No. Alright, then we can skip to, like, nine and a half minutes. I will say... Uh, I was going to say about this intro... This, this set... I do miss this set... 
So was this set, like, was this actually your setup, or is this just something you made? It was something I made in Unity. I had the assets from, like, an asset bundle, and I was going to do this series reviewing uh, magic in different games, and so this was going to be, like, kind of the set of that. That never happened, and so I just kind of had, like, this asset sitting around. I do like the uh, the AK there in the corner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a lot of fun details I was able to um, <laughs> back into it. Like the red lights that you can see in the background, those would actually like blink in and out. Kind of like what a router would do. I do like the era of, well, I would think I was, I think these are just like still frames of the character. It's not like today where I have a, an actual VTuber rig that I could use, but don't. Let's see, 956, yep. Talking about Vardenfell. Look at these uh, transition screens. Look how low Get res it is. Gets the job done. I know. I got so much better at, at doing these. Well, it becomes a time investment thing. You, you can only justify so much time. I when you get better at it, you just get faster at it, so. Yeah, I, I don't even think that's the case, because, I mean, like, I do it, like, once every year or so, so. I don't think it's that I've gotten better. I think it's that my standards got higher. How do you feel about the Skyrim conversion projects, and how do you feel about fan-created content being added? I mean, they're allowed to do their own thing. I don't necessarily think any of them are going to pan out to be... Um, like, ideal replacements for whatever it is they're converting to. So yeah, I, I, never, I never got the appeal for, like, Marwind and Skyrim's engine. I just... Especially after playing Morrowind, it's like, I don't really see it. Well, when I made this video, it was a hobby, so, you know. There is that. Let me preemptively make sure the volume's not going to blast everybody's ears away. Alrighty, are we ready, chat? Which your which of your long form Tez videos are monetized? Um, all of mine except for part two of the Skyrim video. Yeah, all mine are monetized. Morrowind is an open world game, and the world of Arden. All right, where's, hang on, what's a good speed? One five. Hey chat, you've watched my videos before. What's a good speed? One five, chat says. Chat speaks. One. Seeing a lot of ones. I'm not doing this at one. We get more done if we do it at one, two, five. Um, I've been working on the subtitle project for this recently. I've got an hour and 15 minutes done, but I think an hour and nine minutes is on YouTube. Are you remaking the Morrowind video? No. <laughs> Oh, no, I'm, I'm going to be doing a Morrowind video at some point in the future after Skyrim's done. I'm not going to fall into the value trap that is, like, endlessly remaking your own videos. <laughs> <clears throat> the only way I'm updating Morrowind is if I upload it on, like, Spotify, because there's some things I would need to change. That's about it. 
Ardenfell is just as much a character in this story as any other, if not more so. Morrowind is, however, deceptive in its name, perhaps as is tradition in the Elder Scrolls series where- I like the off-center map. Go back. <laughs> oh no, no, no micro adjustments. Right, because it's fucking eight hours long. I gotta pause Morrowind faster. Morrowind is an open world game, and the world of Vardenfell is just as much a character in this story as any other, if not more so. Morrowind is, however, deceptive in its... Yes. Um, Off-center maps and uh, your opacity masks that have, like, the default feather value of 10. So you see Maybe. that, like, it kind Maybe. of fades yeah. off. Yeah. It's only the left one that I'm seeing that. Yeah. The right one... Well, the right... Like she's so the left one is a bigger map image that's like all of Tamriel, and then it's got the opacity mask on it. The right, <laughs> the right one is the full image, so it doesn't have that problem. Uh. It's name, perhaps as is tradition in the Elder Scrolls series where Arena was anything. I always liked this joke. The, um... It's like they went uh, massively overboard with what they advertised versus what they released. But Daggerfall was just a city and a whole country, Oblivion was a dungeon, and Skyrim wasn't an Elder Scrolls game. Oh, that's clever. That's very clever. Yeah. The broader province of Morrowind has been stripped away. Have you seen this map before? Um, no. Yeah, this was a map they released on the 10 year anniversary, I think. Um,. And it was showcasing, so the idea is the pink squares are partial customization and the red squares are full customization. And then everything else was proc gen. This was their initial plan for doing Morrowind. Oh, this is the initial plan. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. And you can see that the proportions of Vardenfell are kind of weird. Um, I don't know at what point in development they changed their mind. I think what happened was they were messing with... Oh, I forget the original name of um, of the engine that they were using. I know what it's called now, but the engine has a different name that they forked it from. But they tried to make Procgen work in 3D, and it didn't work out. And so they decided to do it all handcrafted, like they had with... Um, red guard and so like the first area they made was uh nisus net immerse everybody knows that it's now called game brio but it was called something else before bethesda used it because they didn't make the engine uh there's some interesting things about this map you've got sagerith forest and it's in the interior of the island. And Stonewood, which is what Balmora means, but... Um, and then, like... I don't... Because it's covered up, but Vivek has a different name. Is that why Nisus has some weird quirks, like a custom greeting? Uh, there's actually a decent number of, like, towns that have custom greetings. That VTuber's turtleneck is off-putting. True. She's taking up too much space. No! It's because if I switch to the 3D model, it, like... It would be, um... Can I edit the this one? It would be, like, down here. There. All right. Way and the focus has been placed on. I don't know what this map is. <laughs> Where'd you get it from? Uh, this says it's concept art, so this might be like later concept art of what they made of the map. Um, because it looks a lot more like what's in the game, but <laughs> it's just kind of ugly. <laughs> I bet you have a nude version of that model. I don't have a nude version of any of these models. That'd be way too much work. 
from the island of Vardenfell. Although unlike Arena, this time the lack of a name change is probably down to the fact that Morrowind is a better game name than Vardenfell. There's a certain love video games have for islands. They are areas where invisible walls do not need to exist, where there is no boundary or limitation that players will hit while exploring. Oh, Vardenfell, 76. the game world, is tight. Strip back the view distance or look at any map and realize that just over the crest of any hill is a rapid change in scenery. You can go from low-level civilization to high-level volcanic nightmare areas in less than a few hundred... Look, it's like basically West Virginia. With how close together these hills are. You know, it's, you're actually not wrong there. <laughs> Better than Fallout 76's interpretation. Meters, ...but the terrain of Vardenfell is its greatest asset. I have seen some theories made on this before, that the slow movement speed, plus the low view distance, makes Vardenfell feel bigger than it actually is. What do you think about that argument? Um... I kind of disagree. A after I started to get to know the island more, it felt smaller. Just... Do you think that there's like a kind of a just intimidation factor to Morrowind because of the reputation it has? Oh, no doubt. Um, yeah, I don't know. It didn't feel like, if anything, especially once you start to unlock the, uh, like the fast travel points and everything, it felt very, it's as, almost as, uh, approachable as, like, Oblivion's map, honestly. Why do so many places in Tez end with Fell? I don't know. Why do, Why so, do many so many places in the real world end in IA. Yeah, or Berg. Yeah. Just naming conventions. Well, the slow movement speed isn't always the case, and one of the more common modifications I see people using strips back the view distance limit, so I don't think there is merit in this argument. No, the reason Var- Yeah, you love the Xbox view distance compared to when we play Tez 3 MP. Vardenfell <laughs> feels like a big place, despite its small size, is that there isn't any wasted space. Ever play a game where you land on a planet that's procedurally generated and it's like any other spot on that planet? Who knew that this was going to be prophetic? We didn't know uh, Starfield was going to be... I didn't know if Starfield was going to be proc gen when uh, I was making this video. So, I wonder if this is going to hold up for Starfield. You quickly realize that the area isn't actually that big because the entirety of the planet can be summarized in that one spot. You can't go in any direction for very long without eventually running into something, and oftentimes that something may be related to another quest line you aren't actively doing. It's interesting to play one character and pass a ruin, only to get a quest to visit it on the next character. It's this compacted level design that makes Morrowind feel larger than it really is, not the illusion of movement speed. The Bitter Coast region is the first region that new players will start. Real, not fake. <laughs> So, I got a question for you then. With Fallout 4 has the same thing, where it's a small map and they just packed it in with a crap ton of stuff. And then you compare it to Fallout 76, and I don't know, it, it, Fallout 4's map still felt really small. Especially once I got to 76 and I realized, like, oh, this is what a larger Fallout 4 map would feel like. Yeah, so, Fallout 4 is just small. I think it has to do with just... Like, I think you're on the right track with this with this idea, but... I think there's a caveat where it has to be, you know, intentionally designed and stuff. So, like, Marwind benefits from having a bunch of mountains and stuff that you can't traverse at first. Whereas Fallout 4, you can literally just pick any direction and just start walking. And you're not really going to hit anything. Like, even water, you just, you know, swim across. So, I think, I think there's more to it. But I, I think, like, I would agree In. As such, it's occupied by what are generally the weakest creatures on Vardenfell, like mud crabs, Kawama foragers, and scribs. It's a swamp alongside the island's southwest coast, and its geography has not been conducive to the construction of settlements. This is something I stopped doing with time, which is the um the like discussion of the world biomes. 
kind of like as their own individual sections. I mean, I feel I feel like Morrowind lends itself towards that. What biomes are you really going to talk about? I mean, I guess Skyrim has somewhat distinct biomes. You could talk about it, but yeah, I think Oblivion killed it for sure. Yeah. Oh no, no doubt. But Good. like in Skyrim, it's like there's visual character to the biomes, but that's about it. Navigational lot, like navigation wise, the only biome that really requires any sort of consideration is the reach. Everything else is just it's just different visual. Not enough distinction. Yeah. Yeah. Ads. Uh oh, it's YouTube. Auto playing ads. I don't see it. I don't believe you. Would chat lie? Yeah, I think Dude, with, I... The, with the Oblivion video, my idea was to switch it over to doing the cities, kind of like individually. And even even then, there isn't even that much to distinguish the cities, I feel like. Yeah, there's some... Um... There's some stuff, like you can talk about the building design, but cat girl, cat girl, wake up. There she goes. <laughs> there are three towns in the region, Sidonin, Hala'od, and Narmak. Sidonin is the starting town, which we'll go into later. Synopsis. Hala'od and Narmak are both fishing villages with diverse populations of outlanders, an affectionate term for non-Dunmer, not native in Vardenfell. They're also both hubs for smuggling activity on the island, given that Vardenfell is currently under a quarantine for the blight and corpus disease. This smuggling activity is reflected in the region, with many caves being occupied by smugglers. The swampy soil have not stopped Daedra worshippers from building ruins in the area, although the fate of Boethia's long-lost shrine is an indicator of these ruins' futures. North of the Bitter Coast, the West Gash forms a shelf along Vardenfell's northwestern shores. It's a maze of ravines and jagged terrain, the lack of farms in the area suggesting the land is not as fertile as other regions. This region's host to towns such as Nisus, Kool, and Aldvalathi, operating as trade hubs between traders from the coast and Ashlanders from the interior of the island. The area is home to many outcast Ashlander bandits, and its proximity to the channel that leads towards Skyrim means- I knew somebody would say it. Building ruins? I mean... Yeah. Sorry, I should have taken the extra sentence to say building structures that would eventually become ruins. a fair few of the structures on the coastline seem to be built more militaristically, a sign of the prior wars between the Nords, Dunmer, and Kymer during the days when the land was named Res Dane. It makes sense, then, that the factions that primarily operate here are more militaristic in nature, with the Imperial Legion recruiting a Nisus while House Rodoran protects its settlements, and the Tribunal Temple keeps the roads safe for pilgrims from predators like Nyxhounds and Kaguti. Wow, simple world-building stuff. You, you love to see it, don't you? Yeah, I'm. I'm just thinking how I would handle that. That sort of setup. I feel like, because I feel like, a lot of people who are going to be watching this video, eh, it's probably like 50 50 Have never played Morrowind before, so, and this information is pretty relevant, because a large part of the game is genuinely just what's going on in the world. So that you know, different people in different locations have to live different lifestyles. So it's like this is information that is actually relevant you well just, yeah you know. that, that's what i'm saying is like different parts of the map have different approaches to how the what, what factions are there and what they're doing yeah which doesn't seem like it's the case in any of the other bethesda games um like maybe fallout 3 i don't think even fallout <sighs> see because it's like I guess in Fallout 3, you have different settlements. They kind of get into... Not really. The only one that I can think of is, like, Rivet City. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm trying to think, like, in Skyrim, if anyone... No, because, like, the whole province is, like... Well, Skyrim's a weird thing where it's, like... 
there's a war going on and yet like all the forts are controlled by bandits at the start yeah <laughs> Um, Fallout 4, no. Fallout 76, no. <laughs> but Fallout 76 has an excuse, at least. And if you think about what Fallout 76 was doing with his factions before they all died, it does actually didn't make kind of sense. Because that does play into the world building, like the physical separation between the factions and like the ones that were better were on the side that was more dangerous. So, Fallout 76, kind of. That's because Fallout 76 is the best Bethesda game since Morrowind. Naturally, a part of Vardenfell's volcanic Where do they grow their the food? ...at the base of Red Mountain. The Oscadian Isles forms a breadbasket that supplies the island. This is one of many things I appreciate about Morrowind, the fact that it painstakingly shows where the region's food supply comes from. And it isn't just- You know, I had, don't think I had heard of the whole Shantification thing. Shantification, yeah. <laughs> uh, when I was writing this, it was just like, yeah, I like that they have farms. I liked that their food supplies were actually alien. You, you look at the, the shit that they grow and the uh, the animals that they domesticate, and it's like, this just yeah, these people are just trying to survive on this island. They have to adapt. Everybody's yolked out because they eat eggs all day. <laughs> That's why everybody's super muscular in Elder Scrolls. <laughs> they eat eggs and yams. Funny Oblivion story. I didn't realize Oblivion had fast travel and didn't read the tutorial that told me so. I completed the main quest and hated Oblivion. Then upon restarting, I read the fast travel tip. Can you imagine? Oof. Just the odd farm. Large-scale plantations operate in the area, such as the Dren Plantation. Khajiit and Argonian slaves working the field is a common sight in the area. It should be no surprise, then, that the abolitionists keep their headquarters in this region. The region is populous with giant mushrooms providing shade and peaceful niches can often be seen floating around, as well as the odd guar grazing in the area. The region's host of Pelagiad, on the road from Sidonine to Balmora. It appears to have originally operated as a way station for Imperials to travel from their dock to Moonmoth Legion Fort. Pelagiad's such a weird town. Um, because it's a divine intervention point, at least in Test 3 MP it is. Yeah. So it can, like, it can mess with travel. Because you'll go to, you if you take the Silt Strider to, to Vivek and Divine Intervention, you end up going to Pelagiad instead of Ebonheart. Made that mistake. I can't run for president. I'm not an American. Why is Patrician a furry? Because nobody's donated to take off, take me off the Khajiit girl yet. And further into the interior of the island from there. Pelagia now, however, is a community of farmers and traders capitalizing on a popular route. Saran borders the edge of the isles in Malagamore. It's a walled city of Halau affiliation. Saran is notably the home of a pleasure house and serves as a launch pad for excursions into the ash wastes to the east. Opposite Saran, Ebonheart sits as the head of government operations in Vardenfell, housing representatives from the Great Houses and the Duke of Adem Dren, and of course across the water from Ebonheart, the great city of Vivek, home to the titular god of the tribunal. The eastern shore of Vardenfell is Azura's coast, its name likely attributed to the open shrine to Azura at its apex. Owing to its treacherous terrain, the coast is scarcely populated, it's a series of small- The weirdest part of making the Morrowind video was, um, on the first iteration of this, I Kind of Azura's coast is everything from like um everything from the Ascadian Isles up to like Tel Vos to like just that whole stretch of eastern um uh... Take it off, you didn't specify what. You better be thankful somebody else uh had your back. <laughs> oh oh wait, the true descendant of Aldmaris, okay. But yeah, I thought that whole stretch of eastern shoreline was one biome, but it's not. All islands and reefs, even though it's all the same stuff anyways. Life will host life. 
Since Vardenfell's waters are plagued with slaughterfish and drow, navigating the area by swimming can be dangerous. This appeals to the isolationists in Telvanni, who leverage the region's dangerous nature to protect them. As the Telvanni once said condescendingly, you can fly, can't you? The Zafferbell Bay is an often- Have you done House Telvanni yet? No, I haven't. I've been there, though. I've uh, interacted with some of those people there. Yeah, it's definitely a, a highlight of the game. You'll see how um, Dragonborn doesn't do them justice. <laughs> I already saw that. It was just passing through for some of the mage, uh, mage guild stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like obvious on casual contact with them. The forgotten region of Morrowind, as its geography is fairly similar to Azura's coast. I actually forgot this area in my first drafts, and the only reason you're hearing about it now is because both the unofficial Elder Scrolls pages and the Elder Scrolls fandom wiki do not consider it to be an actual region distinct from Azura's coast. Well, it's marked on the physical game of the year map with the same text that all the other regions are. Running along the eastern shores of Vardenfell, the bay is primarily occupied by the Telvanni with settlements at Sadrith Mora, Tel Mora, and Tel Arun. The Grayslands form the northeastern shore of Vardenfell. I did the opacity ma mask edges on this one, right? Yeah, I, this is just a section of map. But yeah, you know, just, you, you miss you miss those things from time to time. It's easy. Mm -hmm. It's easy to miss that. Despite their fertility, the area remains in the hands of two I separate like random Ashton pop in the background. <laughs> oh, I thought that was while you. One of the younger Telvani lords has taken up residence along the coast at Telvas. The Grayslands are born. No, it's like a drastic difference because there was like a moment where um, I realized it was a problem and started to address it. Yeah. I have console commands. I am prepared to use them to change race. Order to the west by a perfect north to south mountain range along the Foyada a geographic feature formed by lava flows during the eruptions of Red Mountain. The area claims the largest diversity in wildlife, with a range from Nixhounds and Guar to Elite and Kaguti. The area also has more dangerous- Drink every time I change avatars? I don't think that's a good idea. Because I think, I think people would start trying to kill the people playing the drinking game. This residence, <laughs> with Daedra openly wandering the surfaces, there isn't really anyone here to stop them. The lack of access to the region is reflected in its ruins. God, the Xbox UI, like, butchers such a good thing. <laughs> like, how intrusive having the magic bar at the top is. <laughs> like, the nice thing about Morrowind is that the UI is at the bottom, and so, like, everything above the bottom, uh, like, 5% is, is yeah. just game world, other than the crosshair. And you'll be looking up at the sky a lot because you'll be looking for cliff racers, so, you know. Yeah, so I don't know why, like... The Xbox designers decided that the right side of the screen was more important. I actually really like this part of the map. This, this was... So far, this has actually been my favorite, I think. It's got more verticality than Fallout 76. Yeah. <laughs> looks like West Virginia without trees. So, it looks like the pastoral uh, areas along, like... Uh, what was that? Like, 92. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm just thinking back, and it's like... We had the tundra in Skyrim, but I don't remember seeing any. Like you would think, you would see a location like this in Oblivion, right? It's like a yeah, like a river um, basin area. You would see some areas without like just trees. There's that part by Hammerfell. I forget the name of the actual biome, but it's north of Kavach. Oh, and that's uh, about it. Near like the Gold Coast. Uh, further inland. Okay. I guess mm, there's well, it's where I go whenever I want to look for mountain lions in that game. There's um the eastern like uh east of the Imperial City between like uh the Imperial oh, yeah. City and Shadenhall. That, that random, area is a little bit that random yeah. patch of no trees. Yeah, yeah. Like that's that's that was their attempt at uh doing like a pastoral area. Doing an updated grazelands. What, do I sound like I smoked a pack of cigarettes? Ah, oh, allergy season. I apologize. It's with sparse or Dwimmer and Daedric areas. And filling out the final shore of Vardenfell, the northern shore of the island is restricted by an archipelago named Sheogorad. 
These are the backwaters of the region, a remote area with little value claimed by few people. It's the only settlement that Dagon fell being a community of the miserable. The land is difficult to farm, and the waters are rough to fish. There is little of value for lawful residents, making the region a haven for the various sects of Daedra worshippers that inhabit it. Sex. Sect. <laughs> And speaking of undesirable areas, the Ashlands. Existing in the shadow of the volcano... Hey, guys! We want lively voices? Who's ready to hustle? I did say that this was going to be a hustle grind set stream, after all. Who here is working 80 hours a week? Okay? Who's got their passive income stream set up? I'm talking master courses on how to make YouTube videos. Everybody <laughs> needs one of those. Ashlands are in a perpetual state of being covered in fresh coats of ash. Since the land is not particularly valuable, it is primarily home to the Ashlanders who subsist in it. Bordering the Ashlands is all Druun. Why didn't Ash Sheep have ash storms? Well, you know. It, it, it had, it had, it was overcast, if you remember. If you look up at the sky, the, mm. the, the, you know, the, the sky's a little bit orange. There's weird shadows everywhere. <laughs> They try. Listen, they tried their best. It's it's hard, okay. Yeah, world design's hard. We're getting shown up. You know, Morrowind was developed by like a AAA main mainline <laughs> studio, had like three hundred devs at the time, and Bethesda's just an indie team. Well, so, you know, seventy six was it was an online game. Mm -hmm. They had to work with that new with the new weather system, where Breach. you know it would have have like localized weather effects. It's just it, it was just too much. It was just too much. So true. Capital of the Great House Redoran, forced on the retreat through years of trouble until their backs were up against the Red Mountain. What lives in the Ashlands? Daedra and their worshippers. Vampires and their thralls. Sixth House cultists, necromancers, the undead, rogue members of House Telvanni. The Ashlands are really a home to anyone uncommon enough to be able to survive in an area where food doesn't grow, where sea access is limited, where trade routes change constantly due to ash storms, and where everyone is in constant state of warfare with everyone else over what resources do exist. And this goes doubly so for Malak and Moor. Malagamore is all of those aspects that made the Ashlands untenable if the Ashlands also happened to be a giant maze network full of lava pools that was even farther from civilization. If the people lived in the Ashlands because it was remote and isolated but still close enough to civilization to buy their groceries, people live in Malagamore because they outright hate civilization. That's likely why it has been named after the Daedric Prince Molag Ball. Malagamore sits between the Ascadian Isles and the Grayslands. There's only the most uh, uh, tragically underused part of the map. Oh yeah, by the way, I forgot to tell you. I increased the difficulty again. Oh, in the... In Tes 3 MP, in yeah. MP. <laughs> yeah, we're increasing the difficulty five points for every level between us. So we're at like 145 now, which is like 50% harder than max difficulty in single player. one settlement here, Malag Mar, which exists solely for pilgrims to prepare for pilgrimages up to Mount Cand. It's a dangerous area only for the bravest, aka highest level character. Yeah, we're getting married, guys. Keep up on the lore. Red Mountain is Malag Mar, but vertical, full of mon- You hear the voiceover change? Yeah. This was, um... So the, the other parts previously were, like, I think a year recorded a year before this part was. Oh shit! Yeah, this video had a very long like production, and so, like, so I inserted a Red Mountain section, and um, it just sounds like obviously different. Monsters fenced off from the rest of Vardenfell by a giant wall, the ghost fins, and constantly in the midst of a giant blight storm. You hear How much more storm? enthusiastic I am? I didn't I'm also hearing something else in the background. Yeah, because I'm not um I'm not recording this after like my shift at work. <laughs> what section do you think is the weakest in this video? Um well the 
So the videos came out originally by themselves, and whatever I thought was weak I worked on in the final release. So in the final release, I don't know, like, uh, I guess the Vivek section, I could have, um, I could have, like, propped that up more, I guess. It's an Ash. Oh, yeah, you are hearing something in the background. There's, um, the Dagoth wave song playing. Oh, okay. Form that spreads blight. The area is full of sixth house cultists and corpus beasts. I still love the shitpost of this shrine taking the, sh the Star of Azura. With the primary structures in the region being Dwimmer, Red Mountain is, thusly, the most dangerous of the regions. I have ordered the regions of Vardenfell in order of how terrible God. they are. Uh, God, yeah, speaking of weakest sections, the Vivek section is probably the weakest just because I didn't update it. <laughs> and not even that I think it's, like, particularly bad, it's just there's stuff I could have worked on. Did you know that Ted Peterson and Julian LeFay are working on creating their own? I didn't know Ted Peterson and Julian LeFay were leads in Morrowind. <laughs> but yeah, everybody knows about Wayward Realms. They are to be in. Naturally, the last of these regions is Vivek itself. Vivek is a large city, separated into nine cantons. The Foreign Quarter, Halau, Redoran, Telvani, the Arena, St. Olms, St. Delvin, the Temple, and the Palace of Vivek. These cantons are then separated by bridges from one another. These cantons are large structures with multiple layers. Atop them is a plaza, usually host to manors and wealthy businesses. Below that is the waste works, with more average businesses and commoners. And below that, a canal works, with services like the temple or tombs. And finally, sewers, full of criminals. Vivek is unpleasant for several reasons. The first is that its large scale, at the time it came out on PC, and to this day on Xbox, posed a technical challenge for the game, which is surprising considering it's just a series of static cantons with the complicated parts going on inside the city itself. Barring the framerate issues, there are still problems. The interiors of the cantons- God, fucking assault me, why don't you? <laughs> At this speed, you sound like a Ben Shapiro's par uh, parody. Um, well, it, and it, it's like, even at 1x speed, this part talks faster. I don't know what. I don't remember recording this, so I don't necessarily. Um... I think it's also just the forcefulness in your delivery. Yeah, it was. Um... This is the original voiceover. Yeah, what speed are we at? 125? Yeah. I do hear the Ben Shapiro comparison. Ben Shapiro was copying me, okay? Nobody knew who Ben <laughs> Shapiro was until after my Morrowind video blew up. It can only be reached from the second level. This means you need to run up to the giant ramps just to get inside. You didn't have to run around to the outside of the second level to reach the plaza, or in the case of the foreign quarters, around the canton, up and up. I do think Vivek is a mess, though. I don't know how much you've tried to engage with the city. I feel like... It just needed a little bit more vis like um, visual distinction between some of the areas. Especially like when you get inside the places and you're just looking at like four hallways that look identical to one another and you just get very easily turned around in there. But I mean, I learned I, I picked up pretty quickly how to navigate it. So it's like I, I went in there. I went in there with like much worse expectations and I was kind of pleasantly surprised after like I I think the big problem is there needs to be merchants in Vivek that have like three to five thousand gold. The fact yeah. that like the merchants in other cities have more money than the yeah. ones in the capital city means there's not really that huge of an incentive to ever use Vivek. Yeah, the only reasons I was going there were for actual quests and stuff like the, uh, you know, the rare book vendor and stuff. That was, that was pretty much it. Otherwise, just Balmore or something. Yeah, I think he's the only service provider that is superior to your options elsewhere. And that's usually just because if there's like a quest book, he has it. Yeah. Another ramp around the canton again and then up to the plaza. Worse still, while the core four cantons, Rodoran, Arena, and the two saint cantons are connected to the second level, the foreign quarter, Halau, and Telvani are not. To travel between these cantons, you need to go all the way to the bottom to cross. 
Some cantons are connected via a gondola system. However, these gondolas only connect the lower levels of the cantons. So assuming you arrive at Vivek to go to Halau Canton via boat or strider, you arrive at the northernmost point of the city, have to run around the four and quarter bottom, cross a bridge onto Redoran, run around it, cross another bridge onto Halau, and then run up the ramp and either enter the wasteworks or run around the second level and enter the plaza. The words I'm looking for here are wasted space. You may have noticed if you were looking that the exteriors of Vivek are not ornamented. Seeing NPCs on the outside of the cantons are rare, and there are no market stalls. In fact, it can be difficult to tell at any point in Vivek where the hell you even are. This is only natural. Like I said, the city barely runs on the ex- I can't stop hearing Ben Shapiro now. <laughs> Listen, Joe, my, my VTuber avatar, I know, it's got big tits. I just want to know why they designed Vivek City the way they did. Um, Conceptually, it was a very early on thing. So you can see in like promo art that they had Vivek kind of spaced out very early. Mm, okay. Um. I think the goal was, so the goal was like, it was going to be open air plazas. And then that was like too much for the engine yeah. to handle. Yeah. So they closed off the plazas, but um, I don't think they really had the time to like distinguish the cantons from each other. And so instead of feeling like the kind of like chaotic um, Eastern style city of like there's a million things going on and you got to be careful because like oh some kid ran into you yeah you just pickpocketed you it's more like this heavily regimented city that is like identical in structure everywhere you go so it like ends yeah. up being the exact opposite aesthetic yeah it feels it feels more like brutalist architecture like the like the um the temple or well, something is imposing this on people. It's just, you well, have to Joe, live. Well, Joe, you see, um, actually, that says something about Vivek's character. <laughs> I take this over their absolutely sad version of Almalexia more and hold any day. Yeah. I think Mornhold just has, like, Mornhold has that problem with, like, the edges of the city. I don't, you probably haven't been actually too uh more hold yet uh i don't think so yeah so like the ed it's too spacious on the edges and so um what's actually there feels like kind of small compared to the giant walls which only exist because of levitation uh actually joe um the strict regimented nature of vivek <laughs> which is which is not replicated anywhere else in Dunmer society that is typically presented as more chaotic. Um, it, it's actually saying something about the tribunal religion. Yeah, see, like that's that, that's what I wanted to read into it, but it's I, I assumed it had something more to just do with uh, development. That's why it's important to ask these sorts like, of questions. So you look at Balmora. Balmora is like kind of a chaotic city. It's got alleyways and. Um, you know, like it's kind of haphazardly built. It's definitely got like a poor part of town, that kind of deal. Aldrun, same way. Uh, you know, built to kind of fit the landslide. I don't even have to say that Tovani is chaotic, right? And then you get to Vivek and it's like everything has a place and it's in order and it's in line. It's because it's fucking done cheaply and didn't get the attention it needs. Balmora does so much more with so much less space. I think Balmora is my favorite city in all three Elder Scrolls games. I would second that already. Do you think it's a coincidence there's a secret police patrolling every corner of Vivek? I mean, yeah, you got a point, but at the same time, you know, Chinese cities are pretty chaotic and they have secret police. Which is what, like, the aesthetic is going for, is, like, a Canton city. Xbox and barely ran back on the day in PC. I have a sneaking suspicion the plazas were originally intended to be exterior cells, but had to be closed up due to performance issues. 
God bless if you decide you want to use the merchant services in Quebec. There's no advantage over just going to the people you know outside the city. Most of them are oddly <laughs> poor, they have a limited selection, and it's hard to just stop and go, I want to go to the Alchemist, and figure out where the nearest one is even supposed to be. Like, in Balmora, where's the Alchemist? Probably near all the other businesses. And see, so in retrospect, um, I probably would have cited the Imperial City as being exa an example of having a good commercial district. Yeah. Because it's got that strong American commercial district. Let's put all the businesses in one area along the six-lane arterial strode. And then... <laughs> But no, like, the Imperial City kind of sucks, but it does one thing right, and that's that, like, it's got the best oh. merchants in a centralized yeah. location. Yeah. If anything, it's almost too good, because you can't deplete the uh, the vendors of their money or anything like that, so you're basically disincentivized to ever, like, yeah, you know, go to another city. Yeah, and gold has a lot less value. But yeah. so like if Oblivion and, and had... there and there's and like their inventories are very homogenous and stuff. Like, what's the difference between going to, I don't know, the fucking Golden Karaf and whatever the Alchemist is in uh in Leowin? It's like it's gonna be the exact, pretty much the same inventory. Yeah, because it's just all leveled lists with like a yeah. couple custom items that are like probably yeah. garbage. No, this is what I'm talking about with Balmora being chaotic. Almost none of the buildings line up with each other. Like, even the two Imperial Guilds don't line up with each other perfectly. Yeah, it, fe it feels more organic. So, like, there's these uh, stair these winding staircases to get around the different parts of the city and, um, like, side alleys. And you've got, like, people stacked on top of each other and, like, loft apartments. It's cool. It's cool. <laughs> it's chaotic. And that's House Hulalu. Yeah, but yeah, Balmora is way more of like a centralized capital hub area in Morrowind than Vivek is. In Aldruin, where's the Alchemist? Probably near all the other businesses. And again, look, nice chaotic city. There's not really like a... Uh, there's no homeowners association, that's for sure just built into the landscape in vivek where's An and then you got like perfectly regimented and organized cities i think it just appeals to like the autistic community <laughs> maybe that's what it is it's perfectly orderly unfortunately despite the long videos i don't actually have autism an alchemist maybe it's in the waste works maybe it's in the canal works maybe it's in the plaza maybe it's in another canton but yeah, this, this, this section of fucking not sucks. The city. It's an issue of the city being <laughs> poorly laid out. And everything looks the same. Since everything is made out of the same adobe material, the principal colors of Vivek are brown and orange interiors, with dark brown exteriors. While most of the game uses the same principle of using cookie-cutter pieces together to build interiors, nowhere did I feel the downsides of that design philosophy more than Vivek. Is this the studio apartment of a down-on-his-luck gay popper? Or is it the secret hideout of the- You know, I I'm curious why I never got in trouble for the gay popper thing. Uh, 23 minutes into the video? Probably why. It's too deep in. Yeah. I don't know. The, I get in trouble for stuff that's way later in, with the other videos. <laughs> the head of an, a criminal organization. So you know, the NPCs just play coy like, Hee hee, don't worry player, we get lost too. Like, that's the excuse of a defeated designer. It's not funny or cute when the end result is such a dreadful city. And if it wasn't known at Bethesda that Vivek was such a terrible end result of what was an ambitious idea, then Damn. why are there still so many Cancel quests this that entail fucker. navigating it? It's a shame You're too, like just going hard. City yeah, so this is why I have issue with people saying that I just praise Morrowind. Like, no, I fucking... <laughs> I cut loose on some stuff. I was, I was just... I don't know, maybe it's because I haven't been in Vivek enough, but I was just like, yeah, it's, you know, it's not great, but I, I got used to it. I find navigating the inside of the Aldrin Crab confusing. The Aldrin, the only part of, problem with the Aldrin Crab is knowing uh, which manors belong to who and competing with the guards for space on the bridges. Oh God, that, yeah. <laughs> um, well, so for me, the first part was uh, just figuring out that I can go inside the thing. Because like you talk to the, you talk to the people and um, their direction is like, yeah, it's under the crab. And it's like, I'm like, what does that mean? Does that mean it's in front of the crab? I was like wandering around that whole area and then eventually I realized, oh, I can go inside it. That's what they meant by under it. 
from Oblivion, I think Bethesda became scared of trying to create large cities, so they went the inverse in Skyrim and had its capital be smaller than Balmora. To that I say, big cities don't need to be full of ornamented cinematry or repetitive architecture design, which create most of the problems people have with Blaine in them. Most big historical cities were chaotic messes that were poorly planned out. To create a capital city like that, instead of assuming the city planners of Tamriel share such clear, common values. No, we'll go the other way. We'll fucking, uh, we'll, we'll make Charleston, West Virginia. <laughs> I think Charleston, West Virginia is smaller than Balmora. Um... I don't know. In I think, terms of I like, think it is. In terms of horizontal space, I think Charleston is larger. But in terms of overall stuff that's inside it, yeah, I think Balmora wins. Oh yeah, I'm not saying the guards in Aldrin are terribly an issue cuz you can just like parkour around them, but How much cut video is you running around of Vivek? It depends on which section we're talking about. I think um, the most I spent in Vivek was probably during the Tribunal t Temple section. Because with the Morag Tong, you can just use magic to, um, go back and forth on that quest line. Was Charleston ever relevant in 76? Um, the you, designers seem to think so. You That's go why they back, sent us to it, like, five times. Yeah, you go back to it, like, way too many times. <laughs> and to go the, to the same Capitol part, building three times. I know, I've been to the Charleston Capitol building. I don't think the DMV's in it. <laughs> just get the steel blade of heaven yeah it charges too slowly you can learn um a one point levitate effect for 11 seconds that like anybody can cast it costs one magicka Hold on I'll be, I'll be right back i'll be right back hey chat do you want to buy my master course thoughts on tyranny i haven't played it God will strike me down if I ever play a, a CRPG. What's the worst town from a design angle? Vivek or Megaton from Fallout 3? Megaton's just stupid. Um, but I like that it's, like, chaotic. But it's really hard to work around the premise of Megaton. If you ever buy a house, make sure it has two bathrooms. That's all I'm gonna say. Thoughts on Outer Worlds? It's not not great. Per go play Peril and Gorgon. Except, oh wait, you got to play fucking most of Outer Worlds to play Peril and Gorgon. Oops. <laughs> I find no difference between the street merchants in Nisus and the ones in Vivek. In fact, I think they're better. Are you talking about the street merchants in Nisus being better? Because yeah, I think they add a lot of character to that city to have, like. I think if you add street vendors to Vivek, like especially as like a way of saying, like there's there's stuff you can do with Vivek. Say each canton in Vivek has like its own city council, like it's a borough of New York or whatever, and then so they all have their own different rules and regulations on like the street merchants, and so you have like on different cantons different um, levels of sophistication from them. That can add a lot of character to the city and really help with navigation. And the merchants would be on the outside. It's kind of the problem is that they're not. I don't know enough New York lore to answer that question. Vivek is in a rent crisis. I don't know. I think currency deflation's the norm in Elder Scrolls. You've talked about written dialogue being better than voice one. What are your thoughts on Morrowind day AI voices? If that's your thing, that's your thing. I start. You know, I'm still going to, like what I said in the Oblivion video, I'm still going to approach it, read the whole dialogue, and then after the first sentence, next line, next line. So, I mean, it doesn't really add a whole lot for me. Yeah, what I appreciated about Morrowind's uh, written dialogue is that if I read something and I'm playing on another character, I can skip through that conversation in about three seconds.
I've always disagreed with you saying Balmora is super big. It seems like you think it's a lot bigger than it really is. I don't think it's super big. I think it like if you compare it to other cities that Bethesda's done, it is actually pretty decent sized. A lot of it is just housing on the east side, obviously, but... Like, it's a decent-sized settlement for what it's supposed to be. Are we out of the Vivek section? Part of section? what makes Vardenfell feel alien is the unique... Wild oh, nice. Yeah, if I ever redid the video... Oh, I don't know. I don't know about redoing videos and, like, changing things. We'll leave the Morrowind video as is. ...on life inhabiting the island. Trade in your standard wolves and bears for a land full of strange creatures. To start, we have a host of two-legged creatures. Guar are the beast of burden of Vardenfell, operating as pack animals. Wild Guar are fairly rare, probably because they have canonically lost fights with mud crabs. Elites and Kaguti, on the other hand, are not domestic animals. Elites are omnivores, foraging alone while Kaguti are pack hunters, plaguing the roads. And speaking of plagues, Vardenfell is full of large rats carrying the diseases endemic to the region, split into common and blight. Okay, fine. Cliff racers. Everyone loves the meme. It's a perfect combination of factors, from the sound they make, the fact that they're surprisingly hardy and can do a lot more damage than you would think, and that they live in every region across the map. Cliff racers overrated. Uh, so, how much had you heard the Cliff Racer meme before you had played Morrowind for the first time? Oh god, that was probably the first thing I ever heard about Morrowind. That and, um, people shit talking hit chance. Did, did, did the Cliff Racers live up to your expectations? Um, no. They were slightly annoying, and bear in mind, this is on a character that was mostly melee. And, uh, yeah, really wasn't that bad. I, th I think the problem is just that there's so many of them. I My favorite part of Cliff Racers is that racer plumes are super useful. <laughs> like, they're, they're probably one of the best enemies to have the generic loot table. Because, like, do our enemies drop... Well, besides, like, Daedra that drop Daedra hearts. Like, do our enemies drop scrap metal, but scrap metal is super heavy. Mm-hmm. But yeah, this is definitely one of those um, perception versus reality kind of situations. I believe the idea was that cliff racers were meant to be an enemy for players bypassing the roads with levitation and flying over mountains, hence their hardiness. But they weren't tuned right and ended up harassing every passing traveler in startling numbers. But I don't think they're bad enemies, largely because they're one of the few creatures that it isn't a waste of time to hunt. Their plumes are both valuable and light, whereas most creatures either drop hides or meats that are both heavy and almost worthless. It's actually surprising to me how worthless it is to hunt creatures outside of their applications in alchemy, which is admittedly one of my weak points. Cliff racers having a valuable drop means I'm never really mad when I get attacked by a flock because I'll always be walking away just a little bit richer. Honestly, I find random animals stopping me from resting more annoying than cliff racers, since cliff racers at least make themselves fairly obvious to find. This leads into Vardenfell's other resident flying creatures, Neches. Basically just flying jellyfish, their friendly nature means you don't really have to fight a whole lot of them, although there is the odd quest to do so. This leads into the aquatic creatures. Mud crabs and slaughterfish will be nothing new to Elder Scrolls regulars, although they may be Remember surprised Remember aquatic creatures? Ah, uh, the slaughterfish. And, um... Uh, we, got, we got mud crabs and stuff in Skyrim, too. Are mud uh, can mud crabs fight when they swim? I don't know if you ever even see them in water in Skyrim. Yeah, they're, they're land creatures. They're just on the water's edge. Yeah. They live in the mud. Mm hmm. I was always disappointed they never worked in the giant mud crab fight they made. It's in the mod jam into one of the DLC. Like, can you imagine how fun that quest would be? It was probably janky. Workers and crabs are restricted to land, I believe. Oh, right. Workers. Forgot about them. 
the Horkers had an interesting... It was an interesting idea where it's like they're all packed together. So, you know, you, you kind of want to avoid them because they can, in theory, swarm you. But at the end of the day, it's still Skyrim, so, you know. Yeah, it's, it's swarming in Skyrim, so it's like... <laughs> oh no, I'm being overwhelmed by three people. Yeah. But at least there was some consideration there. They they tried. They tried to do something. I didn't I didn't know that the dreg were in Skyrim. I don't think they are. But go off, chat. Yeah, I don't think so. By how big the mud crabs of Bardenfell are. Especially the dead mud crab whose shell makes up the capital of House Redoran. Slaughterfish are the common aquatic nuisance, not really posing much of a threat even at low levels and with high numbers. Drow, on the other hand, pose a substantial threat when underwater, uh, which actually, is Actually, in Oblivion, there's a line that says it's drag. Or whatever <laughs> whatever the fuck the correct pronunciation is. It's all made up. It's all made up. Go learn a... S you fucking English as an only language speaker? Go learn a second language and realize how arbitrary it is. ...given their mysterious nature. Drow are the true descendants of Ald Maris, but they can be soul-trapped, so more Drow. likely they're just... Dangerous Drow! ...as water elves. It's C and D. Shock are giant fire beetles, which are always. I love shock. Is worth fighting because they're guaranteed. That, that's to my insight. For that. Lastly, Nyx hounds are large insects that feast on. What? What's that weapon? Is that modded? What? What weapon? This weapon I'm using on screen right now is this modded? I, I, I don't see a weapon. I think you're crazy. Does it exist? It won't exist for another. 200 years. <laughs> Blood and are fairly easy to beat. Nice nice transition there, idiot. <laughs> <laughs> this was a added section. It wasn't in the original script. Morrowind's OST was composed by Jeremy Soule, who has had an interesting career in the game industry. Did you know that Morrowind's OST lost an award to a Medal of Honor game? But guys, that Medal of Honor game had a really good soundtrack. Way better than Morrowind's. <laughs> Which Medal of Honor? Um, I think Medal of Honor. Got chat, tell me, which Medal of Honor subtitle am I so stupid for not knowing? <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe it's maybe it's the original? Seen oh, the original any came out the <laughs> yeah, the original came out in the 90s. Yeah. Frontline. Frontline. Frontline assault. Oh no, you can't say Jeremy Soul and assault in the same sentence. Chat, what are you thinking? <laughs> what do you think of Chris Avalon getting off? Oh, that was interesting. Was there any doubt? I don't know. The man who wrote Caesar's Legion? Assaulting women? No way. That's what we call a cheap shot. Okay, anyways. <laughs> We've been listening to Morrowind's soundtrack in the background, and it creates a good Have we? Ambience, I've been playing Skyrim's soundtrack play, in the background. Had to turn it off. This is a contentious thing. People are like, how could you turn Morrowind's soundtrack off? Uh, because it's like 40 oh. fuck, it's like 47 yeah, I minutes. I already I, did it. I already play, I played like 120 hours. I played for 15 hours, and I had to turn it off. Granted, I can justify it because recording footage and stuff for videos, but... Um, yeah, it, it, it's good. It's not 40 minutes on repeat good, though. And it's not even like you hear the whole soundtrack, because you don't hear the main theme. Yeah. Yet. So, yeah. And it, and it isn't, it isn't as, like, even as context aware as, like, Oblivion. Oblivion's soundtrack is the absolute limit for me. Like, that, that game dances on a razor's edge of me turning it off every time I play it. But... Uh, I guess nostalgia wins out in that case. The soundtrack is divided into two sections, explore tracks and battle tracks. This is honestly the best way to refer to them. See, when Morrowind's Collector's Edition came out, the soundtrack was remastered complete with new titles for all the tracks. Most people know this song as Nerevar Rising. Go off, king. <laughs> 
I downloaded a mod for Morrowind that adds silent sound files so it doesn't play well, all the time. I think that's the preferable thing magic. to do. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Like Skyrim has it's called silent sections because I think it's kind of necessary. Four underscore three. Or a topic that I want to talk about with Skyrim. Theme. No, I'm not sure what the explore tracks are MX underscore. Um, so I figured out how its ambient music is actually constructed. Um, so they there are like actual tracks that play, but um, I don't know if you noticed um in the in the official soundtrack, there's like a 40 minute long song that's just like ambient music. Yeah. And um, yeah. So that that's that started giving me a, like a hint as to how it's really done. So then when I um, unpacked the uh, the soundtrack from the game files, I noticed that it was like a bunch of palettes in there. And then I noticed that the palettes were assigned not only biomes, but times a day. And then I just sat there in the game and I just started listening to like the, uh, the, the music for like 40 minutes or so. I noticed that what it started doing was just, it, it'll play like a regular song and then it'll switch to like an ambient track for like 10 minutes. And the ambient track is like, kind of procedurally generated based off of those palettes and then it'll switch back to another track and then it'll go back to and it kind of just does that on repeat and it it's actually yeah, kind of it's, it's more sophisticated than morrowind and skyrim going uh play yeah. exploration track yeah random number With... generator says eight play number eight but it's it's like they could have even gotten away with that in skyrim because there's just so much more music but they went the extra mile and uh, made those like palettes and stuff. And a lot of the palettes are based off of like uh, like actual songs. So they just like strip away some of the layers and then it'll layer some of the palettes on top of each other. So you could get like three palette songs playing at the same time. And uh, yeah, I was very impressed by that. I don't know how I'm assuming Fallout 76 does something similar because it has the palettes as well. That's what like turned me on to it was when i unpacked 76's music oh, i'm sure fallout 4 does it as well Pro yeah i would imagine so what you but the trash can lid <laughs> <laughs> explore but the backs are mw space battle and yes battle track 6 is missing did you know that explore 7 was named the ending theme I have a theory, and this I isn't love based the, on anything original, real, that Morrowind's OST uh, was probably a slap job that was later reformatted into a more functional soundtrack after Morrowind didn't flop on release. I say this based on some context that will become apparent later in this video about Bethesda's financial state during Morrowind's development. Now to be clear, this isn't to say it's poorly composed, just that Jeremy Soule composed it and then sent Bethesda the files and let them format the soundtrack, hence the strange names and odd formatting. I mean, one of the song's names is Trick Suspense. Then when Morrowind's was successful- No, guys, you don't get it. Uh, actually, Joe, uh, Trick Suspense, uh, is, is very <laughs> representative of the Halalu lifestyle, where <laughs> they rely on trickery. Well, when people were buying the soundtrack, Soul quickly realized this and came in with some much-needed name changes. Not that it matters anyways, since I'm sure the average person who knows this soundtrack probably knows the Dragonborn version. Onto the soundtrack proper. Call of Magic is fairly well known since elements of it were later lifted for Skyrim's theme. I like the people uh, there were people who argued about this and like Todd Howard literally said uh, is it Todd or was it actually Jeremy Soul? Somebody said that like it's the Elder Scrolls motif. Yeah. Like, I'm not wrong. We'll handle the exploration. But people first. will argue about dark anything. Cavern sounds nothing like a dark cavern. Uh well actually, Joe, you see, um the uh the pads here, uh they're they're very, they're inspired by actual dark caverns in Peace at last has a Maryland. Melody. Hang on, I gotta turn the Skyrim music off for this part. I know sacrilege. Am I right? The main theme, confusing, right? This part has always stood out to me. This is why I don't do soundtrack sections anymore. They're mm -hmm. just they just kind of like are there. It's like yep. That's what Several the soundtrack sounds like. I don't have the different. vocabulary to do it. I'm doing 76's soundtrack for like five minutes, I think. 
and only because we were listening to it while driving through West Virginia. I it's think like, so I actually have something to talk about now. I think 76 has a good soundtrack. So. Feeling of exploring a world I, much older a than you very good soundtrack. The the I started listening to it over the Outer Worlds world soundtrack while writing about Rise Outer Worlds. The so. <laughs> with a dominant horn piece. Yeah, my the, my joke is that I think the only person who actually did go to West Virginia was Anand Zor because like the music fits so well to the <laughs> to the landscape. There's good music sections and videos. It would be interesting just, to know how much Jeremy Soul knew about Morrowind. They're written by people who know what music is. Because while it would be nice to say this is a theme for the Imperials, I can't. Love Lost shows how well the soundtrack flips between a couple instruments to an orchestra and back again. New Pleb Tier video soon. Uh, Pleb Tier is out of fashion. It's not very progressive to say this stuff's pl plebeian. That was breaking the mold back in 2018. Yeah, it's music. Oh my god, why is the example so long? <laughs> <laughs> Who made this fucking video? This element of the soundtrack is important because what you are hearing can't be allowed to overpower what you're seeing. Morrowind's music sounds magical because there's some good stuff in here. I just think the progression like a road going long. through a hilly countryside. Mm -hmm. This is the reason I didn't use music from the ESL Morrowind soundtrack because this song is called. Oh, this, this part Idol. slaps. Especially at 1.25. Yeah. <laughs> 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 True. And you can say, well, that's taking it out of context. Okay, here's some more. ESO soundtrack is so fucking extra. <laughs> the word idle, I mean, you could probably guess what it means, but if you can, it means peaceful, picturesque. Well, you know, World of Warcraft had that huge swelling orchestral Every time we get yeah it also had like the fucking baron's theme that was like <laughs> really low-key yeah <laughs> peaceful the composer takes another 50 milligrams of ritalin and shoves sorry only, i only ever song. played uh alliance true true No, I don't blame anybody for going straight to part three. The game isn't allowed to sit with a player before we're pushing in another complex idea. You're overworking it. You're trying to make a movie score for a video game. Sorry, I literally got off track. Ending theme has this playful little part. Yep. That persists through the song. <laughs> oh, that's it persisting? You sure that's not just you replaying the same section? It is, but... <laughs> I don't get what about the song made them title it ending theme. So we go on to the battle themes, which the game switches to whenever an AI detects the player. Interestingly, Desperation features a reprise of the main theme of the game. My favorite part of the Morrowind video is when you go over the world's travel systems. Oh yeah, that, I think that is part Unity, two. Which is an odd so maybe part two is not is a skip. To rise to reality. I think, let's see, what did I do after Vivek? Wildlife? Okay, skip. Like, once the Vivek section starts, just skip to whenever I start talking about, I think, Satanine. Did you actually not make a Skyrim joke with Rise to, uh... You like horns? Well, horns are the sound of battle. <laughs> Traveling fan is to what? similar to the previous two tracks. Yeah, the, the, the other song, Rise to... I forget. That probably did, wasn't sophisticated enough to make that joke. It should be stated that Morrowind was very primitive in terms of how it incorporated music, as Bethesda didn't use any adaptive music solutions. Yeah, I remember. You're doing Morrowind last. I did Morrowind first, so... <clears throat> Instead, opting to switch which MP3 file is playing contingent on whether the player is in combat. So if a fight lasts longer than two minutes, then you need to play another combat MP3, meaning there's a lot less room to change things up. Uh, Joe, songs, which makes who won the lottery? Because it ends with a That's out, right, which can lead I did. Silence in the music. <laughs> Still a good piece, though. Hey, what song is this? 
Uh, choices made. This represents the choices that players make in an RPG. Trick Suspense has probably the most aggressive percussive yeah, but I, like, soundtrack. I don't think I've ever heard that song when I was playing. You're too good at combat. You ended it in like five seconds. Mm, maybe. Break the Cycle is the seventh battle track, which should upset your brain. It actually has a fitting title due to this section. Whoa, they broke the cycle. <laughs> Trick Suspense has a very KOTOR sound to it. Yeah, it's almost like it was the same composer. That's almost a reprieve of an exploration theme in the midst of a battle track, but it doesn't last. Forever There was retitled Drum Beats of the Dunmer for a good reason, because I can imagine the banging of the Ashlander Gwarskin drums in the background. Yep. So how long is the this stream been going? This the game's special tracks. Um, Introduction plays during a beginning cutscene, which makes it unusual to listen two to hours. hearing Azura's voice. Almost exactly. Darkened Depths play during another cutscene later in the game. Oh my god, with the synopsis. Who gives a shit about these songs that play during cutscenes? <laughs> like, is this actually pertinent information that I need to share with the world? <laughs> and the prophecy fulfills played at the end of the main quest. Think of how many quests I could synopsize with the time that I make up for cutting this stuff. <laughs> Just padding for runtime, shaking they don't really my add head. Anything. They just serve a utility function. Finally, there's a short piece that plays every time you level up. There's also a death track in. No. Not my fault. <laughs> I was I was expecting some sort of insight for the for the level up for the level up song. It's just like, yep, that's what that's what it sounds like. Sorry guys, had to recover from the death track. <laughs> Thank God, some hot takes. Now that the world has been introduced, we can talk about transportation. The microwave there is takes. no simple one-click fast travel option in Morrowind, which was in fact the exception. Oh, we talked about the Actman thing earlier. He just kind of made fun of him because he he did what Actman does, which is like, um, not admit that he could have like just shouted some people out and insulted people's editing. But yeah, I don't blame anybody for coming straight here on a rewatch. Since the games before and after rely on it. In the case of Daggerfall, because the world was so large. In the case of Oblivion, because Bethesda was afraid kids on the Xbox would get bored. Instead, transportation becomes a major concern in the world of Vardenfell. Every quest, once received, requires the simple thought process. How do I get there? What do I need to get there? And what will I need once I'm there to avoid- Generic premiere font. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> avoid needing to come back before I'm done. So let's introduce some of the ways of getting around quickly. Sold Striders are the. I think that was before they um made it easy to do like outer strokes. So those were like literally drop shadows. Because <laughs> oh. for some for some reason in Premiere twenty seventeen they decided that drop shadows should be easy, but outer stroke nah, that's it's too much. Yeah, and uh, in Da Vinci, it's literally just you just go into a setting and just. Type a number. Listen, in. it was a different time period. <laughs> we didn't know how to put text in videos. <laughs> we, we were used to making it in uh, an, an image editor and then just importing the text that way. I do, I've been doing that with some of the Fallout 76 stuff because it's like I could either have 10 layers right now or one. Wait. Um, Resolve makes each text thing its own layer. Um. Yes. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> no, thank you. I mean, you can go in and you know, like, fill out a whole text field and play with it that way. But 
if you're just dropping in like different titles and everything yeah go, each one has to be on its own separate uh track oh r.i.p that's how premiere used to be i guess you could then do a combined clip or something i mean you that could do like a ne- you could do a nested sequence yeah or you just make yeah, like but... its own sequence and put all the text in there and then How many VTuber skins have we gone through at this point? I don't think we've used all of them. Like, uh, we haven't done Dwimmer Girl yet. We haven't done either of the Bosmer. We haven't done Argodian one. There is no Argodian. <laughs> Skyrim music, come back. I'm sorry, I left you. <laughs> Bring out the bald guy first pillar of Morrowind's transit system. They are large insects with hollowed out shells. You will ride the bug. Those <laughs> that are ridden inside. They fill the bulk of the transportation needs from the West Gash through the Bitter Coast and into the Ascadian Isles, ranging as far as the northern village of Kool down to Malagmar. While you ride in-game time passes, usually only a couple hours, and it counts as resting time. Have you seen the video of the Zoomer saying Morrowind's bad? He even, he does even, he does ever <laughs> meme of Missing attacks and running out of stamina. He debated people in the comments. I saw that video existed. I didn't see the video. I don't go out of my way to watch like bad videos on my own time. I can make that stream content. But I'm not going to stream other people's Morrowind videos because I'm not doing a Morrowind. And even then, like... Yeah, so some guy has like a shit take on Morrowind. That's not new. Even in 2023, it's not surprising. Is Dwimmer Girl just a ghost? What do you mean, just a ghost? She's got a big personality. The Caravaneers can serve as information hubs for the areas you arrive in. They have an independent disposition to their local factions, meaning you can't alienate them accidentally. Boats are the second pillar of Morrowind's transportation Morrowind system. Morrowind fans fall Circling for obvious fate way too easily. I don't know. If they start debating people in the comments, it goes from bait to, like, no, they actually think that. Like, when I did the Elden Ring bait video, I had a pretty hard time arguing with people in the comments. <laughs> it's hard to sustain that kind of energy. Oh, hang on. There's a mistake on this frame that I've never noticed before. Above all Druun, you can see the yellow line was, like, accidentally drawn on there. Major fishing God, I miss fast, safe side and need. fast the travel like this. Robust, uh, but is also Fallout 4 actually has diagetic fast Still, travel because you get like birds, birds like a bird, bird. Yeah. And 20 the hours into the game. Connected only by boat. Like the Caravaneers, the ship's captains are independent of faction affiliation. And then the Fallout 76 the adds pillar. fast traveling from uh, from interiors because we lose the console. So if you get yeah. stuck, you, ha you have to always be able to fast travel. At least you have to pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you need some sort of sink on the uh, on the economy there. Lord knows this isn't going to come anywhere else. Yeah, we can do one of the Bosmer. Here we go. Instantaneous. Oh, clicked on the video. Instantaneous transportation. These cities include each great house capital, Balmora, Aldruin, and Sage of Mora, as well as Vivek and Caldera. While robust, they do carry a downside. The Mages Guild, as a faction, can be influenced by membership and deeds in other factions, and can be alienated into higher prices, or even denial of service. To give an example, House Telvanni and the Mages Guild are at odds, and membership in House Telvanni may require you bribe, admire, or charm the guild guides into providing services again. Since transportation is instant, you also don't regenerate health or magicka, which is another downside. That said, the Mages Guild is the only fast travel service in Caldera, and also can bypass several boat trips when heading out towards Sage of Mora. To be fair, I don't I don't expect a post-apocalyptic wasteland to have a stable trans. No, you see, there's this group called the Blue Ridge Caravan Company. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Who exist for one whole quest? No, no. There's a world event that you can randomly stumble upon. It's not even a public event. It's a world event. Oh my. <laughs> and there's dialogue to acknowledge if you did the world event. Whoa. Whoa. Teleportation magic. 
Yep. That's teleportation magic. The mysticism skill, may it rest in peace, had a few handy... We pour one out for the mysticism skill. <laughs> what do you think it, of uh, ha having played it? What do you think of mysticism? Um, I actually haven't messed with my mysticism yet. Um, well, except for what the teleportations, mm -hmm. mysticism, right? Yeah. I mean, that's cool. I, I like being able to teleport. Um, yeah, I don't know. I haven't really messed with it all that much, though. I think I did some soul trapping. So uh, it's it's a magic school. I, I mean, it's it's only a label. Any chance you invite Saul on the podcast? That's if there's something to talk about, which I don't think there is. Most of the salt contention is literally just Salt Factory's fans. Nobody respecting my boy Thaumaturgy. Thaumaturgy got replaced. Mysticism didn't get replaced. It just got like shuffled off into other skills. What what was left of it anyway? Yeah, after they cut half the spells. R.I.P. These spells that were actually really important, even to non-spellcasters. The first two are Alms of E and Divine Intervention. These spells teleport you to the nearest shrine of their relevant. Nice map. Acer podcast. Can I? It, it would Acer Thorn sue me for the rights to the podcast because he was a contrib contributor. God, alms of to tribunal temples and divide to imperial shrines. Yeah, it's just the maps could be done like way better now. Now, while the nature of the spell sounds like it should be reserved for emergencies, it shouldn't. Once business is finished, wait, did you make that? Yeah, I made these maps. Oh, okay. That's not bad. That's why they got like such rough edges to them. You can see parts that like aren't highlighted. It's not. If you're between Ebonheart and Wolverine Hall and that little sliver of the map, it's not like Divine Intervention Scrolls stop working there. I'm just a fuck up. <laughs> Onward bound, interventions get you back to civilization quick. On the western half of the map, alms of ease are better. Divines tend to take you to Moonmoth and Buckmoth forts, which, while near Balmora and Aldrum respectively, both those towns have their own tribunal temples. On the flip side, Divine Intervention is very useful when operating in the eastern side of the map since it can be used to quickly get to Wolverine Hall in Sagerth Mora, and from there, basically anywhere on the map. These spells are also available in scroll form, and even as amulets for those who can't- I like that we're still on this clip of me, like, repairing. Bu buying repair hammers and fixing <laughs> stuff. <laughs> I, listen, I, I, I get it. It's sometimes certain topics, mm -hmm. you just gotta- Certain topics, you just have to throw a, throw footage of you killing insects because there's nothing else that's going to work. <laughs> well, listen, one of the most exciting events in Fallout 76 was us <laughs> killing insects. So. Well, I definitely had a lot of a lot of those, a lot of footage for that. Muster up the skill to cast the actual spells themselves. However, the stars of the show are Mark and Recall. Mark, when cast, sets a marker where you're standing, recalled, and teleports you to that marker. This greatly expands your options since you can mark stuff like merchants, quest givers, or master trainers, and quickly return to them. Propylons are a neat idea, but an extra- Should there be a repair- a reward for the sort of people- right, hang on. Should there be a repair equipment spell? That sounds like a good idea. Yeah. I would- I would say so. I feel like there should be a spell- if there's- there should just be a spell for almost everything. Because- if you don't like it, you can just not use it, assuming there's, you know, viable alternatives to not using it. Yeah, I would like to see a balancing redo on um, Magicka cost, like base costs for spells in Morrowind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, um, yeah, but, no, I don't see a problem with the, repair armor spell. I mean, the nice thing about Morrowind, too, is, like, you just rest and you get all your, uh, your Magicka back. You mean the cheesy thing. <laughs> Morrowind no. difficult Morrowind difficulty mod disable uh, makes every cell a wait cell instead of a rest cell. You can only rest it. Take away beds as well. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Deal with it.
people that read the wiki, or who install the Master for Pylon Index plugin. We will be discussing the Master Index plugin in more detail in a couple hours when we discuss all of the downloadable content. I always like saying saying that when I can. We're going to talk about this in a couple hours. <laughs> Just so you know what you've signed up for. Each Dunmer Stronghold has a per pylon chamber with two teleporters. If you have the index that corresponds with the teleporter, you can use it to travel to the next stronghold. The strongholds form a loop, but if you are missing any of the indexes, then you're forced to stop. The indexes, however, are rare. And I suppose the original idea was that they would serve as both a reward for long-term players, but also an option for vampires and criminals to get around. The index's locations are rather obscure. All Only right, a few of my characters I've played for this video ever actually found an index. The most one character found was two. The Master for Pylon Index converts a Mage's Guild NPC into a quest giver who will point you in the right direction for all 10 indexes, and as a reward, will give you a Master Index. This turns Caldera into its own hub where you can go to any stronghold. However, this itself is only circumstantially useful. If you need quick access to one of the Ashlander tribes or a fast the way out of a remote area that? back to civilization, you just I walk guess. off screen. Okay, now, this is a tangent, but in the Dawnguard expansion in the Forgotten Veil, vale, there were these teleporters that could quickly teleport you around the area, but you needed to unlock them. Now, I always thought, hey, that's pretty cool. Maybe Bethesda will go back to incorporating diegetic fast travel. Then Fallout 4 came out and basically killed that notion. No, we had vertebrates. We just talked about this. All right, let's let's stop for a bit. You probably went to the bathroom. Yeah, I don't think I I don't th the index thing I hadn't even heard of yet. I haven't even come across that in game. working on the Marwind analysis. I'm working on a Marwind video uh, after Skyrim's done. I wouldn't really call it an analysis video. It's probably going to be more like, an, uh, more like a review. Because, uh, you know, I I'm watching the definitive analysis right now, so uh, I can't compete with the guy who did, uh, you know, 10 minutes of just talking about the soundtrack. But there is, I, I feel like, so a lot of people were surprised that um, I've never played Marwind before. Uh, especially after seeing some of my suggestions with Skyrim where people are like, oh, you just want to make it Marwind. I was like, yeah, I, I don't know, I never played Marwind before. <laughs> the Skyrim stuff coming along. Um, I haven't really even gotten to work on it that much. I'm finishing up Fallout 76 this week, and then I'm going to start recording. It's, uh, yeah, it's going back to it. All right, I'm back. All right, now I'm going to go away because I have to go to the bathroom, so you can entertain chat. Hey, chat, what's up? Did you know that you can buy Private Sessions' channel from me? Yeah, I've had his password for some time. I think he's got, what, like, 5k subs? That's got to be worth at least, I don't know, a Steam key for Total Warhammer 3. One dollar. Donate that shit right now. I'll post his password in chat. Can we get a bid war going? We got, I hear ten dollars. Ten dollars for Private Sessions password. You'll take it? Nah, that's not a winning bid. How about a Chris high five? One condom. Is it a Trojan extra large? Because that's the only thing that fits. Pat, where's the test 3 MP server? That's too hard. I hear $20. I hear 69 yen. What's that, like fucking 30 cents? 30 bucks Chaos Dwarves, let's go. That man's got the best offer right now. He's buying DLC for me. 50 bucks? Mmm, but I think the DLC is better than 50 bucks. <laughs> $10,000. I think you're definitely overpaying. You could uh, pay to bot some subs and probably get a better value proposition. Not, uh, not that I'm recommending you do that. $1 per sub. What's private sessions at? What's private sessions at? Okay. Maybe I need to be selling Tetramore's channel. That might be more appropriate. He's at the 28.8k range. Okay, the floor is $30,000. 
Would you invite Jeweler for a discussion? I need okay, so I need to bring LARP back. I was I foolishly said in December, I'm gonna do one LARP episode per month of 2023. And uh it's now April. And I still haven't even done like the G4 thing, so hmm, eh. I should though, because I want to bring on like more small channels. But I'm not confident in my, in my ability to actually send people their way. Because I'll say like, hey, Tetramore is really good. And if you like my videos, you'll probably like his. And then people will be like, uh, I don't know. I think he's a furry or something. Like, fucking, fucking click the link. Click the link. All right, I'm posting uh private sessions password uh in chat right now excuse me i i auctioned off your account oh how did jeweler get a reservation at dorsia <laughs> let's see let's see jeweler's youtube channel he's doing well nice What's his, uh, what's his arena video at now? Damn. How does schmuck like you get so classy? <laughs> Tetramore decided to style on the whole video essay genre and show off that he has a wife. <laughs> Do you think your long videos are successful because of round-off links? Uh, I wouldn't say they're successful just because of that. I think they're successful because it's just an absurd, like, length. And I think I broke that meta. Because it's like, you know, I know there's a 20-hour video on YouTube, so fuck it, who cares? But, yeah, for the time. For sure. Shark Tank episode for Sessions Channel. Mm, I get $30,000 for 25% equity. <laughs> Actually, that would probably be like an amazing deal for you. It's like, sure, I'll give you 25% equity for $30,000, you fucking idiot. What would you do with a $30,000 investment for your YouTube channel? Mm. Start working on the... Uh... RuneScape yeah. video. You gotta YOLO all that into fucking VTubers or something. I don't know, like, fuck. <laughs> I'd probably just go offline for, like, a year and just work on my magnum opus RuneScape video that I've always wanted to do. Or a big-ass trip. Did you not do watch the Morrowind character guide? Who starts the mage? I'm glad you enjoyed it, but... <laughs> I... I feel like... You should go Conjuration Short Blade. That's probably like the best build in the game. I did actually use that video uh, to make some of my characters. Yeah, you, made, of the, course... you made the first one by yourself, right? And then the other ones. Yeah. Yeah, the first one was based off of uh, just what I assumed would be good from my experience with uh, Oblivion for the most part. And what little I did know about Marwind. But then, yeah, the uh, ones after that. I used your video and then sent you the builds so that you could tweak them. Yeah, I like uh, when people, like, when when friends don't fucking come to my <laughs> Discord server and send me your build and ask for advice. I mean, you can, but there's no guarantee of response. But I do like when friends send me their Morrowind builds. They're like, hey, what should I do? I can usually, it's usually something I can fix. Yeah, I've I've really enjoyed the uh, the Tez three MP character. How does it feel to be responsible for popularizing super long form videos? I wouldn't say I popularized it. I would say I pushed the threshold. Yeah, I think you got to get to like uh, Joseph Anderson's level in order to start claiming ownership. Over I'm gonna replace like that. Joseph Anderson. I'm gonna take his <laughs> YouTube channel. <laughs> I'm Start gonna, I'm on gonna make Witcher the Starfield videos. video. What's gonna happen first, Witcher Three or Starfield? What for you? For Joseph Anderson. 
He's got to do Starfield because he's been in the Bethesda space since inception, so. Does he? I mean, I guess. Yeah, it would probably be Starfield. What he happened? Did the, he did the Elden Ring video, so. What happened to it being almost done? No, I'm going to do the Witcher series. I'm going to take that from him. Anyone actually hyped for Starfield? That is a good question. I don't think I've talked to a single person that has actually admitted to being hyped for it. What, you're not talking to Mr. Matty Plays? <laughs> the only people who are, who are super hyped about it are content creators who are exclusively Bethesda channels. Yeah, they're like, oh, thank God. I don't have to yeah. stretch shit out any longer. I don't, I don't have to sit there living on the Nexus mods looking for the next uh, Skyrim mod to review. Please, give me that copium hit. <laughs> Is Starfield's Todd Star Citizen? I think Starfield's going to be like more functional than Star Citizen. Didn't Star Citizen go down recently because they implemented some new technology? Why do you see an elf? Not just an elf. A boy elf. <laughs> <laughs> Here, I gotta accurately portray the Altmer height. Hang on, do this better. This is lore accurate how tall, uh, sorry, Bosmer are. <laughs> Oh my god, they have legs? Yeah, all the models have legs. What? I know, it's a it's a real shocker. Oh, well, yeah, they, they would have to have legs because they have to have feet. Mm-hmm. Why are you a boy elf? I could be a girl elf. Hang on, let me switch to the girl elf model. See, this is accu lore accurate girl elf height. And then this is the lore accurate boy elf height. <laughs> Can they track your legs? No, no. Guys, I'm a, I'm a basic basic tier VTuber. A one year delay is a pretty big one, is it? Is it? Listen, I can tell you what happened. It's the same thing I've been saying on stream for like two years at this point, which is that the pandemic is going to have like a ripple effect that last years in the industry. Yeah. Like companies are still recovering from work from home. And not only that, now, you, now we're going into a recessionary period and stuff, so it's going to be even more difficult. Uh, but those is probably recession proof. I think if there's anything Bethesda can do, it's like creative financing. <laughs> I would hope so, anyways. All right, let's get back to it. We've got, uh, what, nine more hours ahead of us. <laughs> we're here for we're here for the the marathon chat. You have to understand. Hang on, I gotta put text on the screen. I will have to order food soon. No, you gotta starve. No, I, le I learned that lesson the hard way when we were in that Chick-fil-A in West Virginia. What town was that? Was that Clarksburg? I have no clue what town that was. That was some, like, random corpo settlement. There wasn't a <laughs> town because there's no residences. <laughs> that, that was some bizarre location yeah it's just this random strip mall in the middle of the fucking mountains of west virginia and then and then we got to that town where it was just all like weird mcmansions built on crazy hills and shit i think that was i think that was peak just strange uh just strange development
That was definitely... That, no, that was a scam for sure. There's just this part of West Virginia on this state highway that's like, what were they, like six fives or something like that? And it was like uh, McMansion Hills. And those poor fucking kids that we saw get dropped off the school bus. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> they have to climb this giant hill to get up to their McMansion. Oh my god. It's like, it was like an eighth of a mile long driveway <laughs> up probably about, what, like 300 feet, I would yeah, say? Yeah, it was like a 10% grade. That's your on a gravel line. on like a gravel road that you know some Mexicans been killed trying to mow it because <laughs> their <laughs> mower tipped over and landed on top of them. <laughs> You're rich, but you live in the middle of nowhere. You guys met IRL. How did it go? It was really gay. Like just straight up. Could fan, not stop. Fan fiction material. Every, every time I would go to fucking shift, your your mm -hmm. leg was there somehow. Mm -hmm. Somehow. It was an automatic, too. That was the weird part. <laughs> <laughs> Travel in Morrowind is itself interesting. It's not just running or walking around an area to go do stuff. Along the way, you can encounter unexpected quests, like lost pilgrims or naked nords that have been tricked by witches, etc. You'll have to contend with monsters, like cliff racers, or unexpected contractions of diseases from cliff racers, or even just taking the time to explore a dungeon of cliff racers you find along the way. How you get- I still need to make the cliff racer dungeon. <laughs> I had made a dungeon that had, I think it was a flying rat enemy before. So there's fun stuff you can do with Morrowind dungeons. We need to have a Morrowind dungeon jam. Also, what is this drip? The fuck is he wearing? Get there takes a good deal of planning. If you are tasked to go from Balmora to Aldalathi, you could just walk out the door and start hiking, or you could stop, take the guild guide to Aldrun, <laughs> then strider to Cool, and walk a much shorter distance. I think you can get most anywhere in about ten minutes, provided you know how to take advantage of the fast travel. There are exceptions, of course, like the Ashlands. Yeah, I don't know why live chat died there. But most of the there. time, this rings true. So why do I consider this superior to a fast travel system? If, in the end, fast travel is more convenient and lets me get to the mm. immediate action faster, mm. I will tell you in story form. I was con Super chats are are competing, to say the least. What's How do we get this guy his $2 money worth from the Falmer girl? Two All right. minutes. Alright, there you go. No, I, I just shook. <laughs> Oh, I didn't realize you had a, you had like something on the screen for uh, your rates now. Oh yeah, I just put that up there. <laughs> we gotta get the donations up. You gotta understand. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get the Chaos Dwarves DLC for Total Warhammer Three. Those, uh, those hel those hotel rooms were not cheap. Mm-hmm. Fucking like, how much better was uh the one in uh DC compared to the one in Charleston? For them being almost the same price. <laughs> uh. take care of a bounty. He'd been spotted near Telmora, but this was old information. I find out in Telmora that his hideout is in a remote part of Sheol Goreth, so I now need to plan to go up there. I need water walking and cure disease. Oh, but see, twenty crones is only a dollar ninety. All right, I probably probably got to take it off. It's gonna be too distracting. Look, hair physics. Your papers, please. I gotta get the chat on screen. I've been serious. I don't like I don't like April Fools, so I'm dead deathly serious. See the problem is it's just your voice lacks sincerity sometimes. Mm. You're, you're, you have that curse. Mom, upload your work on Spotify as an audiobook. 
I said earlier, um, I need to revisit the audio. So like, there's a couple things that have to happen before the, the Spotify deal gets made. Which is that they're going to have to come to me and, and, and offer me like a... Maybe not a Joe Rogan 70 million or whatever, but like maybe 70,000, you know. Exclusivity deal. Honestly, though, honestly... I, I feel like Sp if Spotify was savvy, they could be scooping up uh, long-form analysis creators. It's like the it's like the perfect genre for them to for them to chase because YouTube's abandoning it. I don't know if YouTube's abandoning it. They're just ch they're just chasing after the TikTok thing. I need to decide if I should pay boat fare to come to Dagon Fell or if I should go there from Kelmora. <clears throat> after a short hike, I'm at the spot. Only the bandit. This is my actual hair. It's are not. The cave itself I think this is ESO music. Tomb inside which is a vampire. This is not an enemy I'm prepared to fight, but from my perspective, it's possible that my target is behind the vampire, and so I need to fight her. This is a tough fight, and the tension builds as I know that while going back to town is a possibility, that would entail preparing and performing the journey all over again. I could set a mark, but then I would lose. No, the wait, it's sc it's uh, it Skyward. I can save at any time. That doesn't lessen the tension now. any because it just means I'll either be wasting my time walking back up or wasting my time save scumming until I kill her. Let's compare the situation with Oblivion or Skyrim. First of all, it's very rare that I would be put in a situation where I wouldn't be able to attrite an enemy down anyways. But assuming this isn't the case, and the enemy poses enough of a threat that I need to return to town, it's as easy as one button click. Then, So, having played it, what do you think? Um, I haven't really even hit any situations where I had to leave the, leave the dungeon. Because I was usually if anything, over-prepared for basically every encounter. Right. Because uh, Mara wins the hard game, so, you know. And, th and then I actually started playing. I'm like, uh, actually, it's not that hard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's kind I of mean, the thing. Is like, I'm doing this at level four. If I had to if I had armor. to leave, I would just use, like, a scroll or something like, you know, like, um, Alms of the Intervention or... Uh, like just something like that. If I didn't have a mark and recall set. How do you feel about your imminent replacement as a content creator? I think it's really interesting how much money has magically appeared for AI development that can do stuff like replace artists and voice actors and you know, mm. all those all those people that all those tricky independent people that uh, were outside the system. Yep. I'll be planning my return to the Amazon Fulfillment Center. <laughs> I mean, if you thought fucking the storm of bad Skyrim videos was bad, wait until the the AI chat generated the chat GPT yeah. generated uh, AI voice just stream of garbage. My like, friend, uh, my friend knows like in um in one of his classes, uh, he knows some dude who's like a YouTuber or whatever. He does um. Like music reviews and shit, and like music, like reactions to albums and everything. And the dude literally says, "Like, yeah, I use ChatGPT now to write my scripts." Oh. Uh. And then, and then I watched one of his videos pre pre uh, the ChatGPT thing, and I was like, I genuinely could not tell that this dude was even writing scripts. This shit was so fucking bad. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's basically a crutch for people who uh, already aren't very good. Yeah. But the problem is, is that that does produce more noise. So, just got to be better to try and cut through that noise. Chat GBT, oh, what, you see... what are good? What are good Morrowind videos for me to watch? Oh, I did that too. I asked it. I was like, oh, can you recommend me some stuff? And it's just, it's so the way it works is it's not actually able to like you know do searches online and shit. Mm -hmm. You gotta and... ask the Bing bot that. Rather than telling me that, which I already knew, it started making things up. Like it literally invented a a, a uh, like a, it said Racific did a, a Bioshock Infinite video. I was like, I don't that doesn't sound right. And I went and checked his channel. Like, no, he never did. AI just... generation replacing creativity. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> um, we already live in that era. I I'd hate to break the news to you. There's already YouTubers who are doing it, and you're only going to see an increase in like just generated garbage like if there's any money to be made there's going to be some third worlder who's like probably using a stolen um ai voice model of somebody it 
it's just gonna get harder and harder to find actual videos on YouTube made by humans versus like videos mm -hmm. made by but still made by humans but using AI. When I'm ready, I can instantly be back at the dungeon because not only can I teleport back to town. So yeah, I. I I made my Skyrim video at the last opportunity where you can say there's a genuine human made Skyrim video. <laughs> Effortlessly, I can teleport to anywhere on the map as well. Any tension that is created as a consequence of having to repeat a journey is lost because at any time, I can just fast travel to safety. Further, tension can't be built up in the first place because I could have just fast traveled up to a nearby point on my first trip up there. This also applies to housing and quest givers. What's the point of carefully selecting a place to live out of if, at the end of the day, I can instantly fast travel there? What's the point of planning how I do my quests so I can complete multiple objectives while in the same region if I can always just fast travel to my objectives instantly? It's not even like in Daggerfall where there are time limits on quests, making the act of losing time a consequence in of itself. The world is always willing to wait for you. Oh, a hermit living in the middle of nowhere is the only person who can train you in marksman past skill level 70? Well, come on, stupid. Chat GPT only predicts the next word. It cannot think and analyze. Doesn't matter. It's just like, what I'm saying is there's such a body of Skyrim work already that... AI could like feasibly write a Skyrim video. Like, do AI, I need do I need to get the bingo card out? I was literally telling it to write dialogue between Delphine and Parthenax, and it was able to pretty much nail both characters. And there isn't that much out there for for it to pull from that. So, I mean, like, it's, yeah, it's going to have to be, like, curated by a human being. But it is, it is still very much the case that, like, you're going to be looking forward to a future where you're going to be, like, five minutes <laughs> into the video and realizing, I'm pretty sure this was written by an AI. So, it's, like, it's going to become impossible to distinguish between who's a bad writer and who's, like, not actually human. And the thing is, you got to think, you're thinking about this from the perspective of people being good faith actors. You have to remember there's people like Acer Thorn in the world. Do you think Acer Thorn is above using an AI voice model? Like, even if it was just his own voice. But just use a nearby cave as a fast travel point to get to him. I could go on, but I think I've illustrated my point. Diegetic travel systems and more... And even then, like, That's honestly... Nice. I would listen to an AI, a fully AI-generated video. The problem is the human that's in the process who's just using it as a fast shorthand to make money. Like, the problem isn't the AI. The problem is the shitty people using the tech. Yeah. Morrowind helped Vardenfell feel like a real world because you understand how it was that people get around. I'm not demonstrating my mastery of the systems as some Freudian way of self-admitting that I secretly long for fast travel. I'm demonstrating it because I want you to understand that this is a game that rewards you for learning how to navigate in the space effectively. Travel is an unspoken part of every single quest we'll be doing. Oh, in hey, nice voiceover Before, change. During, and after every single story point, I will be making decisions related to travel that I won't be telling you about, but will play a part of the story. Editing can cut out what is otherwise a massive part of the role-playing experience. That's kind of, well, that's kind of the thing is it's just going to be an escalating arms race of defense from AI versus offense AI, where they're going to try to, like, push the envelope on, uh, on what they can get away with when making an AI, uh, and then, like, yeah, I think that, like, made by humans is going to be a tagline that's going to be kind of popular in the future where you say no part of this project used ai technology or like and you'll have you, you you know we've been through all this stuff before like you go to the supermarket you see free range versus you know feedlot um meat so it wouldn't let me type all this for two dollars yeah, YouTube, YouTube do be weird like that. Was there another supermodel, uh, another $20 chat request? Hang on. Oh, hey, I did. I apologize. But listen, he got his way eventually. Uh, actually... 
on screen it didn't say on screen that i had a purchasable oh did i ever unmute private sessions whoops i've Sorry. been muted this yeah i muted, muted you because there was like i thought you were uh talking to somebody in the background no i apologize <laughs> <laughs> whoops it's not an intelligence eh, it doesn't matter if it is an intelligence or not I definitely, yeah, there's definitely, like, a lot of the fear-mongering around it is like, dude, you watch way too much science fiction. That's not actually how yeah. the technology is panning out. I th I'm, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about it. I, the way I see it, it's just a new, new way for new tools and stuff for, especially game development, things like that. In indie game development, imagine if you can actually uh, get good enough AI to produce, like, decent art and stuff. It's like the no motion capture thing that some movies put in their credits when Polar Express and those movies were coming out. Yeah, I guess. Um, I think in the case of AI, it's going to be like... Because the, the people that are primarily at risk, your writers and your voice talent and... Um, I don't know. I feel like every creative job is at risk. What are we researching? We are researching AI. But yeah, like, of course, it's not actually artificial intelligence. That's just the term they use. But like, fucking, you know, learn the distinction. Oh, you know, you gotta, got, gotta get the uh, funding somehow. Mm -hmm. Gotta get the mark, the um, investment people in it. Paper Your SVBs. Oh wait. Paperclip maximizer will destroy humanity. Well, no. The only problem with uh the paperclip game, I love the paperclip game, but the only problem with it is that there aren't other AI at the same time. Like, I feel like the AI wars would start way sooner than they do in that game. I love that the the thing image generator AIs are mostly used for either for shit posting or weird fetish porn. Actually, speaking of, I was messing with um, with uh, stable diffusion. I know, I know, dangerous thing. Um, let me see if I can find the folder. I was going to use a stable diffusion uh, thumbnail, but I decided against it. But I ended up generating uh, I like it. But I feel like the only way I would actually use that would be um, to send to an artist to, so that they can draw it. Oh, that was gen that was AI generated. Yeah, that was uh, stable diffusion. <laughs> like it actually got the armor right, which is nice. Yeah. It didn't assume that the armor was uh, something weird. With all chat GPT generated war propaganda and fake AI war technically already began. Well, that's what I'm saying is like it's already going on. During some more wins. Hence why it does. I could see AI being used as a middleman in commission discussion. Yeah, I mean, that's where I see the, the technology going is like if I need a quick draft of something that I want to have drawn. Instead of sending them, you know, toddler drawings, I can uh, actually give them something how do ai art sites like that work if anyone actually knows uh well in the case of stable diffusion it's a thing that you download if you go through a website it's almost always an inferior version to what you can do on your like client deserves its own section up front and center now nah, that's a fake girl look at the knuckles Man, I didn't know when I made the Santa Nin section that this was going to be prophetic for, like, every game I play other than Fallout 76 that have awful, like, 18-hour-long introduction sequences. <laughs> are you still planning on making that Attack on Titan video? Uh, are they ever planning on fucking finishing that series? It's like the fucking, uh... I forget the name of it. It, um, there's a story about, like, a monkey and a tiger, and it's like... The monkey says the tiger can only close half the distance. It'll let the it'll let the tiger eat it, but it can only go half the distance. That's kind of uh, Attack on Titan. They just like 
keep cutting it in half over and over and so infinitely subdividing it. It's been done for years. The fucking anime, you nonce. Wait, is that a slur in the UK? But yeah, the manga's been done. And, uh, whew. It's an ending, all right. I want you. Head down to the dock and I'll show you to the census office. Dedicating an entire section of one of these parts to a single town may seem somewhat unnecessary, as though I'm artificially padding out the length of the video. However, in this case, I'm only doing it because of all my playthroughs. They have this one point in common. Sida Neen. The game starts simple enough, with a cutscene of Azura... Oh, well, I, ap plots, I apologize. ...and then you awake to a shirtless man asking if you're okay and acquiring your name. After this, you're led onto the top deck, where a guard asks where you're from. So like The Archer's Paradox? Uh, is that a JoJo's reference? ...in your race and customizing your character along certain preset faces and hairstyles. You're then let inside, where you're processed. You're first asked about class, where you can fill out a questionnaire, select from a list, or create your own. Well, I thought it was a slur for gay people, but it's just a slur for pedophiles, so... I'm probably in the clear. You then select your birth sign, are shown your character sheet, and asked to confirm the information, before being given documents and sent onwards. In the next room, you're given the option of swinging a free iron dagger around as practice. Craftier players can loot the place, or even use the lockpick on the table to unlock the chest filled with a small amount of gold. Outside, you're told to take a magic ring out of a barrel, introducing magic. Once inside the final room, you're introduced to dialogue. Dialogue in Morrowind is almost entirely text-based. Beyond the odd quest, most NPCs have a stock vocal greeting based on race and disposition, but 99% of the dialogue is performed in this window. Morrowind is a lot of reading, and I know that bothers some people, particularly the people that play while sitting on a couch with their brains turned off. I think. What do you think of all the reading? I know, um, that, I know that you play on your, your couch with your brain turned off. <laughs> I play on my PC, thank you very much. Um... I think my main problem with the text is uh, everybody has like an encyclopedia's worth of entries and stuff, and it becomes a little bit too much. I, I wish there was a way for me to like filter out some of those. Uh... It it's really just how it's presented is more. You don't more, like, like the, the criticism all of the it. topics on the side. You're, yeah, you're overwhelmed. I I I well, it's just it just becomes too much. Like when I'm trying to find just like something specific, and it's like mm. related to the quest, and it's like oh, I've seen that dialogue option for like the past twenty hours now. Like, can I please get it removed, or at least just like hidden? It, it just needs like folders. Oh, so nothing ever gets like filtered out. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Like there'll be characters that I've talked to, like especially in the mages' call or mages' guild. Um, I've talked to him, you know, like 10 times or so, and their their list just keeps getting longer and longer and longer. And, uh, yeah, that, like, it's really my only complaint. It's, just, it's a minor complaint, but, you know, it's worth addressing, I guess, worth bringing up. Sorry, we couldn't do shirtless Caius Casades. I was surprised when we met that you weren't wearing a, uh, a Hawaiian shirt. I had one. <laughs> I uh, wasn't going to wear it on the way there, though. If you're committed to watching the series, you probably are not this sort of person. Now, I know reading can be difficult, but believe it or not, there are some good reasons it is superior. Dialogue is split. Morrowind completion rates tied to literacy. <laughs> into topics. You can then ask about a topic and the NPC will elaborate on it. Wait, did you say that text-based dialogue is superior? Well, that can't be true. Well, it is, and here's why. First of all, text-based dialogue is friendlier to a low-budget game. Modern Elder Scrolls may be a top-dollar production, okay. but back when Morrowind was coming out, it was a risk. I see. I see why people gotten triggered by this. Hmm. It j you, the, you're you're the, just like... Uh, uh, straw manning? Yeah. Yeah, I, get, I can see that. You see that and weak chin? <laughs> um this isn't actually something that people get triggered over they they more so discuss it than like um be overly upset about it hmm yeah a, a discussion like this i would i would uh phrase it differently or at least present it differently that Bethesda took to save the company from an eternity of producing shovelware. He's talking about dialogue, but he's showing mercantile. 
title after Battlespire and Redguard underperformed. And although it looks like a lot, it really isn't. 400 words is just over 3 minutes of speech. For instance, since I started talking about this tutorial, I have said about 400 words. I believe most people see a disparity between how long it takes to read the written word versus listen to it. I can't knock listening versus reading entirely, considering you are listening to my words, not reading them. But while you may look at the dialogue on screen and say, yeah, fuck all that, consider that something that is written- Actually, Joe, <laughs> nobody has time to read. Everybody I know is doing audiobooks these days. You gotta, you just gotta learn how to speed read, you know? Get an app and just take all the data, take all the stuff all the text, put it into a speed reading app, and uh, just read it that way. Um, okay. I, I think <laughs> I think reading uh, reading is actually for the woke, the woke elite. You know, Harry Potter was a book series. <laughs> but you know what's based? It's Star Wars. That was a film. I mean, like, I look at this, this isn't a lot of text, but other people look at it and it's like, oh my god, that's like a thousand words. That is not much at all. And that was the other thing, too, that surprised me with uh, with Morrowind, um, was how little text there really was. Mm -hmm. e even in, like, the, the more extensive uh, conversations and stuff, there really wasn't that much. You're talking... I, I think... I think the books in like Oblivion and Skyrim were more ver verbose than like entire conversations. Yes. ...is not limited by the reality of it being spoken aloud. In fact, a great deal of the strengths presented in Morrowind's storylines owe themselves to the detailed explanations one can receive. I can't help but think that Morrowind is impossible to remaster for the simple fact that Bethesda would have to change so much just to make the dialogue all fit on any hard drive made by man, because naturally something Bethesda would try to do in a Morrowind remaster is voice acting. However, there is another reason, and it has to do with logistics. It is not just a coincidence that stuff like directions to the quest location disappeared around the same time voice acting came about. Oblivion's voice acting was a nightmare for Bethesda because it meant that everything had to be written with the idea in mind that it had to be spoken aloud, saved, and take up file space. So no longer could you have quest givers explaining how to get to a spot because they likely couldn't afford much more than the bare essentials when it came to voice acting. Quest markers were as much a consequence of laziness on the part of players as it was a consequence of laziness on the part of Bethesda. This was one of the reasons I was horrified at the prospect of player voice actors in Fallout 4. Not because being sp What's your thoughts on player voice acting in Fallout 4? Oh, it was fucking terrible. I I have no problems with player voice acting. Um, I think it enhances the experience in uh in Mass Effect because Shepard's an actual like defined character, but in Fallout that was fucking terrible. Yes, I think like the one occasion where it made sense was like when you go to the uh, veterans hall and finish the speech. If if you play the female character, finish your husband's speech. I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah, like that's like the only occasion where it makes sense. And that's only because that puts that makes Nora a character. So it, it's even a situation where it's like because it works more like Mass Effect, where the player character is a Yeah. Actual written character that the scene works. Pick it on its own, like, yeah, it's completely like a non starter of a thing. We got to add player voice actors to Fallout 76. That's what will fix Wastelanders. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, you got to replay it. They added player voice actors. Spoken for bothers me. But because it meant that there had to be a severe limitation on what the player could now say. I mean, Bethesda's developed games hardly ever provided more than four options in dialogue, but now they really couldn't if it meant paying a voice actor for the extra words. Just as I said that 400 words was three minutes, 400 words of written dialogue was now three minutes of voice actor pay, assuming they didn't flub up the lines in the process. You can't afford to have voice actors talk about the latest rumors or little secrets or advice or give directions to somewhere specific or someone in particular or casually elaborate on topics because that costs money, and that is money that could be spent on hiring expensive voice actors for set piece quests once outside into sidening proper we're given a damn getting angry set piece quests 
It's not even just the voice acting, though. The voice actors, though. Then you have to pay the audio engineers. Mm -hmm. You have to. It's, it's, it's a, whole a whole workflow. Yeah. And then, and then you run into the issue where it's like, oh, we want to rewrite this like entire quest line. Um, well, we can't because we already recorded all that dialogue. So the only thing we can do is cut things and recontextualize and maybe do like an afternoon of pickups. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty that's pretty much it. And you would think Bethesda would be. Do you think they've talked about using text to speech before? So it's like, do you think that they are like making the whole quest of text to speech and then getting it acted or like? Because it really does question. feel like it really does that feel is... like they get locked down by. Oh, well, we already got the voice acting, so yeah, we can't change what doesn't work because it seems like if you would have it down in the game and they're playing it there's no way they could look at the college of winterhold and say yeah that's something we want to ship <laughs> these ads keep um yeah ads are a problem a redfall ad oof can i change mid street the ad settings midstream. You can turn off skippable video ads. Chat's being good to me today. But you know that means I have to turn on the waifu wars. Sorry, them them's the rules. a small stipend and directions to go to Caius Casati's house in Balmora. Now, of course, you could just beeline it there. The Silk Strider in town goes straight there for much less than we got. But let's talk about short form tutorials. There are two kinds of tutorials, long form and short form. A long form tutorial. The greatest short form tutorial, Fallout 76. Tutorial gradually introduces all the mechanics, how they work, and make sure that there is nothing that can surprise the player because the developer is afraid they won't see it, they won't engage with it. Short form is then naturally less insulting. Morrowind's tutorial does not take you aside and teach you about magic, because not all characters are going to use it. Likewise, it doesn't force you to use security because some players might see stealing as a bad thing. When it introduces the plot elements, it doesn't have a dragon swoop down from the sky to save you from an execution. It just tells you, hey, the Empire is releasing you on parole provided you complete these conditions that can be easily ignored. It doesn't have the Emperor get assassinated by Mehrun's Dagon cultist as he hands you the amulet that is protecting the world from invasion by demons with the instruction to find a priest at a priory and help him find his illegitimate son. It's just like, explore this port town and get used to how things work. And it does so in a way that isn't going to hurt you in the long run. Sidonine has barely anything to do with anything after you leave town, so hurt feelings get left behind. Speaking with people, you can meet Fargoth, who mentions he lost his ring. Sure enough, the one you found is his. And returning it to him gives you a disposition booth with both him and the town trader netting better prices. While at the trader, you can meet a Nord who wants to collect Fargoth's debt, who tells you you can watch from the watchtower to see where his hiding spot is. Then you could take the money and leave. This teaches some good lessons. It teaches you that doing good things in the world, even for unimportant people, can get you bonuses. It also teaches you that sometimes the best quest reward is the one you don't turn in. Another quest inside Anine starts after you find a body in the swamp. Turns out it's a local tax collector. If you're honest and turn in the money he was carrying, you'll be tasked with solving the murder. If not, you keep the money but end up with a net lower reward. Asking around, you find out the tax collector was in a relationship. What's wrong with this? Uh, I do not know. It's a 16 by 9 clip that's been squished into 4 by 3. Oh. <laughs> ...with a lady in the lighthouse who says that... Oh, yeah, okay, and now I see it. Her ring back. You can confront him and he will admit it, giving you a choice. Kill him and get paid, or spare him and get nothing. So the choice is yours. Then, should you kill him, you get the ring. But remember, sometimes the best reward is the one you don't turn in. You can leave Sidonine with over 1,500 gold provided you do things right. Quests teach lessons, while introducing ideas in a safe manner that isn't going to affect your faction reputation down the line. Sidonine is the second best tutorial I've played in an RPG. To me, it can be a fast affair done quickly before I get into the meat of what I really That's want to do. the best one. Or it can be done slowly by a new player learning the ropes of the world. As for the best, well, it rhymes with... Yeah, I was going to ask chat. Oh, right. Who's got the worst, uh, who's doing the worst April Fool's joke today? Woodgrings. 
Getting to Balmora can be done three ways. Go north and follow the river, go south and can go by Pelagiad, or take the Silt Strider. Each one has its own benefits. The Silt Strider is the fastest, but costs money. North can lead you by some valuable loot. South can take you by some interesting quests. Once at Balmora, you'll be directed to the Corner Club to learn where Kaios Kasadis lives. In there, you'll be told about certain opportunities that will come up in Part 3. And finally, once you meet Kasadis, he says those golden words. Go out on your own. Look for freelance work or trouble. Then, when you're ready, come back, and I'll have orders for you. For open world games... What a beautiful man. <laughs> Morrowind text could never portray the emotion that voice acting could. True, but justice does not count the passage of time. That emotion? The, 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 the renowned emotional range of Oblivion and Skyrim voice acting. What's your favorite emotional scene in Oblivion or Skyrim? Um, in Oblivion, my favorite is um, uh, um. Oh, oh, I know. When when Martin is um, he he's walking through Bruma to the to the gate. That was a cool moment. <laughs> was that even voice acted? Yeah. Every, all, all the all the six voice actors were there shouting Martin, Martin, <laughs> and then and then in Skyrim it was um when uh when uh something something <laughs> Carlisle oh oh no 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 I'm fucking kicking out uh your your Balgra from the palace no 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 was the, an the most emotional voice line in Skyrim. I know, I know, I'm hurrying. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was Arn Gear when you tell him about uh that you know about Dragonrend. Where did you learn about that? Who have you been speaking to? <laughs> Young man. <laughs> Listen, I, that that made me felt that made me feel something. That was like, you know, my mom getting angry. Mm -hmm. It was like, oh shit. Yeah, I don't. I, th I don't think that. I don't think the trade-off's good. I think it's a bad deal. <laughs> it's fucking awful. <laughs> um, I, I gotta get my food for fast. All right, chat. Talk to me, chat. What's up? What's up in your life? You still, you still messing with that girl? You still like, you still playing them games? I am dying waiting for winds of winter. I, I don't know what to say, man. Like... <laughs> Can't remember the last time I played a vid game. So true. I don't play video. Go on, chat. Go off, kings. Who plays it? Who plays video games anymore? It's such a bad hobby. It was like the redeemable values went away and it decided that it would just become what everybody said it was, which is like um pointless time wasting dopamine uh dopamine like high intensity dopamine training so that you can't feel any joy in life and you just get depressed. You work out, don't you? Um, not as much as I should. Not as much as I could. Once I get a house, uh, the, ho the home gym's coming in, and then it'll be go good from there. Who sleeps in ceilings? 
fucking walls are where it's at. You gotta be in people's walls. Yes. No, man, you need to complete the battle pass, man. Stop not playing the game. Oh, but yeah, battle passes Co are the worst. Music. Scoreboard? The FOMO board? What's weird is, like, Fallout 76 doesn't even have the most offensive, like, battle pass, because you can just kind of, no. like, yeah. it's competitive games with battle passes that really suck. Fucking life out of it, like Halo Infinite. Why is everybody using this one specific gun for 30 matches? Mm-hmm. Oh, we got we got three people on my team trying to grind the same challenge. Guess we're gonna lose this fucking match. Yeah. <laughs> I love when Siege makes the worst fucking operators the challenge, so you know that it's just gonna be an annoying week. Oh, <laughs> look looks like people have even more reason to play Dokabai this week. This is such a simple thing that is so often forgotten. In so many of these games, I wonder, when am I supposed to actually engage with the world? Because so often they drag us, quest, the mission with the utmost of urgency. I'm the sort of person to do what is the most urgent matter first, you know. I think Hogwarts Legacy did a good job with this. I was very surprised by it. Really? Mm -hmm. So I would I would think with the um, with the audience, you know, the, the movie audience, they would want to really get that strong grip and narrative going ASAP. They kind of, like, design the quests to add in space time between quests to give you opportunities to go off and do your own thing and have it not feel too jarring. It's well, like, so that was, um... we're going to have to go research this and come get back to you on what, like, the next good step is. And then it's like, okay, so then we can have some decent time to go off and, like, I, I don't know, kidnap animals. Well, that was the um the people who did uh, Shadow of Mordor and stuff, right? I mean, not really, no. It's Warner Brothers, but it's not Monolith. Oh, who did? Was it? Who did that? Uh, who's the developer? Uh, some new studio, or it's Avalanche, uh, but it's kind of a weird development situation. But no, it's not Monolith. Oh, uh, okay. I don't know what Monolith's doing. <laughs> Making MOBAs or some shit, who knows. They force you to go to Classel. I mean, you are a student. Really? They force you to go to class? Yeah. So oh, like, man. Main... I, I want to play this game even more now. Yeah, it's, it's... If you're looking for Bully, it's not that. <laughs> please, please don't be one of the people ah. that goes. I wish it was more like Bully. That's that's wow. been like one of the more annoying parts of the discourse. Like the only thing more annoying than that is like the boycott people <laughs> saying that like I'm literally endorsing murder just because I'm talking about the game. Like I never even said I bought the game. I could have pirated it. I could have said the first thing: you should only pirate this game because of consumer action. But no, like literally referencing it exists is apparently uh, murder. So that's why I'm not going to talk about it in the video. A reasonable person. And so often I can burn through an entire game before looking back and realizing, hey, wait a second, when was I supposed to actually engage with the world? So, word of advice. If you're making an open world game and put some measure of effort into making the world interesting, please give people an opportunity to step off the train and play tourist for a little while. Let's talk about character creation. You know what? Fallout 76 through... actually did that. Yeah. All right. I give them credit for that. They did it in several several instances. Uh, Fallout 76's quest line is like creative enough to give you chances to step up and have it not be too dissonant. Because mm -hmm. there's not really a whole lot of urgency because like we are the problem. <laughs> <laughs> we are the vector. Like I kind of propose that the player should have the Scorched Plague and I know I hate the trope of the the player character's sick and they're <laughs> racing against time to find a cure. I I only said that because of like the opportunities with like the Brotherhood of Steel section, but like um 
Yeah, I mean, one of the things you can appreciate about Fallout 76 is it's more freeform um, ability to, like, stop and explore a town if you wanted to along the way. Seven different times. Both for Morrowind and in general, really. I see lots of people spend tons of time agonizing over every detail of character creation and worrying if they have created the perfect character or if they need to stop. Just stop. Here's how you create a character in Morrowind. Step one, create your character. Step two, find problems. No, the only thing getting sick in Morrowind helps is giving you disease resistance. <laughs> like, it's barely a plot point. Step three, recreate the character, having addressed the issues. For example, if you think your movement speed is too slow, take the birth sign the steed that makes you faster. If you think your character is too fragile, reconsider your race. If you find out you like maces and not swords, set blunt is one of your skills. Just identify a problem. God, I hope Starfield's main quest is just take your time. Uh, uh, the, it looks like because <laughs> like the 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 um faction that you associate with originally is like the explorer faction, so I imagine it's going to be something similar where can it's it just, just like yeah. Could it just be a space homeowners association dispute? <laughs> like the lowest of possible stakes. you have and see if you can fix it. Morrowind's intro is so short it can be redone fairly quickly. In fact, if you already know what you're going to do, you can be on the world adventuring in a matter of minutes. And it's not the end of the world if a character isn't perfect either. If you decide later down the road you want to use a different skill, all it costs is money to train that skill up to a usable level, and there is plenty of opportunity to make money in Morrowind. Morrowind has 10 races that you can play at. Nice alpha mask, loser. <laughs> Each race has certain specialties and weaknesses, and these can vary from gender to the gender as well. For elves, there are Altmer, Bosmer, Dunmer, and Orsimer. Altmer are mages, Bosmer are thieves, Orsimer are fighters, Dunmer are a bit of a mix of everything. You can be iconoclastic, making an Altmer barbarian or an orc wizard, and you will experience some short-term difficulties, but nothing that kills it in the long term. For men, there are Bretons, Imperials, Nords, and Redguards. But Redguards aren't actually at more in dis- Shut up. Bretons are good at magic, Nords and Redguards are good at- Guys, it's super important that you know that the Red Guards are Yakudin and thus not actually men. But really, why do they have less intelligence? Hey, Todd. Todd. <laughs> <laughs> fighting imperials are good at conning people not quite the rpg triangle but then again morrowind was more about accurately reflecting these people to the lore and their cultures than it was about balance lastly there are two beast races argonians and khajiit races are distinguished in a few ways attributes change to favor certain specializations with certain races and some magic oriented races get a bonus to their overall magic pool races also see bonuses to certain skills again relevant to their specialization so a bosmer who selects marksman as a major or khajiit with a major in acrobatics or red guard with a major and longsword will all have the highest of net relevant skill at the start of the game. There are also resistances to consider. Some races claim a substantial resistance to disease. Others see resistance to spell effects. Using fire on a Dunmer or frost on a Nord doesn't work because logically they come from those climates. Altmer, on the other hand, boasts a substantial weakness to certain kinds of magic rather than a resistance. Another factor to consider I feel like resistances are more pronounced in Morrowind too. I don't know if you got that impression from your magic playthrough. Hmm. At least in Skyrim. Oh, in Sk wait. In Skyrim? Yeah, in Skyrim, they're, like, way weaker. Oh, yeah. They, like, they don't fucking matter at all. Oh, no, a Dunmer. It's going to take yeah. slightly longer to fire blast them. Yeah, I, I guess I would say Morrowind. Morrowind was a little bit... Because I was, I was using fire spells, and it's just like... Uh, I was thinking I'm fighting, uh, you know, h half the things in, the, in that environment are yeah. uh, resistant to fire. And then in Morrowind, it's like you actually have to know how to cast multiple elements. It's yeah. Like, oh, no. You got to use fire magic on Nords because uh, they resist the other two.
for his disposition. Members of the same race as you will have a slightly higher disposition towards you. Remember that the average person is a Dunmer, and you can see certain advantages in playing one. Gender can also be a factor. Your attributes can differ based on gender, although it tends to be balanced so you're actually just trading one attribute for another with the counterpart sex. There are also certain quests that go differently based on gender, but I don't think there are any quests that differ outcomes based on race. Each race has abilities catered towards their specialization. Imperials have an ability that makes them more persuasive, while real gamer moment you put on the buff after you enter the room so you, like you're down to like a third of your health orcs and red guards have abilities that help them fight simple stuff like that i usually forget they were there by the end of a playthrough so yeah one simple way of making a decent character would be syncing their choice in race and class to what makes sense like you know orc wizard Birth signs are another part of character creation. This is basically a mix of the starter gift and modifier idea from past games. Originally, I was gonna spend a few minutes listing all these signs, but it was kind of dry and boring, so I'll just highlight a few. Oh, just that, that's because that's ever stopped you before. <laughs> <laughs> Says the man who did music for 10 minutes. The warrior and the lover can boost your chances with hit chance. The mage, apprentice, and natronach increase your amount of magicka with increasing downsides the more magicka you get. You'll do better in conversations with the lady, and with the ritual you'll get a massive daily healing power. Which sign is objectively the best? Well, the atronach is a bit broken, and I'll demonstrate why later. It's honestly hard to say because all of them, besides the atronach, become very circumstantial in usefulness past level 5. Morrowind isn't the sort of game that makes later playstyles impossible due to early bad decision making. Bad decision making mostly just impacts how quickly you'll reach the inevitable power threshold not whether or wait not you'll what it. but if you are some hold on what i thought the reason they todd howard insisted on the skyrim design philosophy was because people would play morrowind and they would get stuck with their character builds are you telling me that there's a way to unfuck your characters well, in morrowind listen 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 I made a bad character, and I did that first dungeon that's next to Seda Neen. I'm way too invested into this character to make a new one. Uh, listen, it's, you know, I, I work a 9 to 5. I get home. I don't want to lose 40 minutes Bro, of progress. I'm level 2. <laughs> You're literally killing me. Yeah, you can, you can, like, unfuck your character, depending on how much uh, mercantile jujitsu you can do. Listen, who has a... I'm just going to sit there and sleep in the Balmora Mages Guild until I've killed enough fucking <laughs> uh, Dark Brotherhood assassins that I can just rebuild my entire character. Uh, actually, I'm playing on Xbox, and those don't appear until level 6, so... <laughs> serious stigma against Morrowind because it's too slow or you dislike hit chance, there are baked in solutions to the problem to help you out. You like the limeware platter trick? I wasn't actually looking at the screen. I was, I was eating for a go. second there. We go. Here, go back. All right, now watch what I do. But if you are somebody who has a serious stigma against Morrowind because it's too slow or you dislike hit chance, there are baked in solutions to the problem to help you out. So I did the little survey that Wait, tells was... you which class... What? All right, so if you pick up the limeware platter and drop it, and then the guard will confront you for stealing, that removes the stolen flag from the limeware platter. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, you were telling me about that. And it's worth 650 So what do you do? You just pay, like, the fine or something like that? No, 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 you get, you get forgiven, but the items get removed from your inventory. But when that happens, oh. it removes the stolen flags from the items. But if it's not in your inventory, then it just removes the stolen flag and you can pick it up without um, getting in trouble. <laughs> yeah, you can take the books too if you're a real pro gamer. <laughs> That's probably the biggest departure in Test 3MP is that you can't do the climber platter trick. Yeah, I mean, there's other stuff you can do. I mean, you're acting like the Orcish set thing is Giga Chad when the Giga Chad thing is the free Daedric weapon. Or the free Ebony sword that's in Balmora. Has to play, and I got Monk. 
Sounds about right. The survey is a personality test that tallies your responses and compares them with the stereotypes of the class. So fighting heavy responses get fighting heavy classes. But since it's mostly moral choices, I don't really put too much stock in it. You can also pick from a list of presets and, I mean, the classes are going to operate about how they sound, but you have to think about it. Like if you pick knight, you have to use the weapons knights would use, or you're in for a rough time. This is why the class creator is the best option. Although it's also obviously the option that requires a bit of knowledge about the- no, no, it doesn't require knowledge about the game. If you want to use swords, put long blade in the major skill box all skill names bro are bro how do i know what long blade does how do i want to how do i know what i want to use yet marwin's the first rpg i've ever played how am i supposed to know that i want to use long blades that i want to use Shields and heavy armor. How am I supposed to know that? This isn't very poggers at all. <laughs> you gotta take the Fallout 76 approach of just minimizing all of your skills at the start of the game and then building up from there. Basically that was a big um, value. Specialization course design so choice for sure. Of RPGs giving skill buffs in those fields. Attributes are again fairly self-explanatory. <clears throat> you don't really need to understand the nuances of how the skills and attributes work to craft a functional class that will work for you, provided you stick to the skills you select or train the new skills you have at a trainer. But I will give some handy advice. First off, always take Speechcraft and Mercantile. This is because these two skills will be useful regardless of playstyle and the completion of quests and acquisition of wealth. With eight skills left, I generally have a hard time picking enough skills for playstyle. Imagine style. telling that to a Oblivion and Skyrim player. Extra health per level early and for Having their brain break. <laughs> Hang on. Okay, that's how I do it. Nope. She's she's going through the emotional range right now. Guys, don't kill elf. Okay, sorry. <laughs> personality can help with the early game gold grind. The rest of the attributes will raise up as you level, and they aren't really a concern from any other standpoint. So I hope you see that creating a character isn't really a big deal in Morrowind. In fact, because the great houses are exclusive to one another, to see all the content you have to play multiple characters, barring that one glitch that lets you join two houses. New game is a prevalent option in the main menu at all times because Elder Scrolls is meant to mirror your tabletop gaming experience where you don't just stick with the one character. Unlike the later games, which were made literally with the design philosophy of avoiding players feeling the need to restart because of the character they created, which is absurd. Because even if you make a bad character, it's not at the end of the world in Morrowind. There's training and a difficulty slider. If you've made it this far, and you feel tempted to play Morrowind, I can give you three template characters that will make the game fairly easy for new players. Each template follows one of the three And archetypes. this eventually became its own video. The the most common weapon and armor, with a long blade of 50 and an agility of 65. As so I'm just trying to sword, think. You'll be able to hit monsters <clears throat> and with a strength I'm of 50 yeah, yeah. decent damage. Pause for a second. Endurance and personality. I'm just trying to think. Does Oblivion have more character permanence than Morrowind? Because... Only by metric of it being super fucking tedious. And also limited, um... Limited training? Limited training, yeah. That might be the case, yeah. Because you still have to pick your, you know, your major and minor skills and all that stuff. It works pretty much the same as Morrowind. It's but just you, can... you have less options to, like, pivot. You can grind everything in oh, Oblivion, though. And and fucking level scaling, too. Yeah, I guess, yeah, level scaling can be punitive. <sighs> is my problem with Oblivion that it doesn't have character or, or that it has too much permanence? <laughs> I was the pleb all along. <laughs> I mean, that's the nice thing about Morrowind, though, is like you can salvage any character. Like, it's not stressful at all to min-max in Morrowind. It's almost, it's almost like it's actually fun trying to adapt to the game and stuff and, uh, struggling for a little while as you learn the mechanics mm -hmm. it's almost like the first 20 hours or so that i was playing was some of the most fun i've had in an rpg in a very long time the 
you've also been selected to help with games and conversation. The second is Mage. Again, Endurance and Personality have been picked over Intelligence and Willpower, resulting in a smaller Magicka pool, but also a less fragile character. With yeah, yeah, touch, yeah. It is a th possible, but I recommend... Whatever. I will say up front, the thievery-oriented play... And you can hear the voiceover change, because this is like... From here on, it's mostly... Like, I didn't really tweak too much what, between the original release and the remaster. I just added stuff. Yeah, there's, there'll be a VOD after. Don't you worry, chat. Uh, real fans know that his name is Steals Your Wallet. And I'm afraid I'm going to have to do a free character change here. Through tend to be my least favorite when it comes to Morrowind. Part I love single arm shoulder piece design in uh, Morrowind. That you yeah, can, you can be <clears throat> asymmetrical if you want. Yeah. Partially because a little bit of thievery is expected in all playthroughs, and a little bit because thievery just doesn't quite work right. Despite that, both no, 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 it totally works. You just need the eighty percent chameleon amulet and maxed out skills. My thieves guild and my house Hulalu characters actually ranked as my more favorite playthroughs that I did for this series. Steals your wallet, a Khajiit thief, took his stipend, and figured the only real goal worthy of life was the acquisition of cash, cash money. I think the rule for um, how many factions you should do per character is you should play until like level 16. Interesting. And then once you get past that, like you should start a new character. And like, I That's... mean, if you're almost at the end of a faction, you can finish it out. You don't have to hard stop at 16. And then you should yeah, take th one of those level 16 characters into the DLC. I think... Um... That's pretty much how it's going to play out with the characters that I have planned. Because I'm only doing at most like two factions per character. Yeah, and I feel like there's a comfortable balance at like two factions per character. Two characters, some side quests. Up front, still and then whatever I like the most, take it into a uh into the DLCs, and then one character per DLC. Like, it's alright if you want to do a, a, an everything run of Morrowind. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just, um, it's like its own beast. The game's gonna become way too easy, I feel like. No, I just keep adding the difficulty in the INI file. Right. <laughs> Close your wallet is a bit distinguished from the other characters as a beast race. I recently did a playthrough where I went straight to Solstheim with level 1 character and it was one of my favorite playthroughs ever. Yeah, I've streamed that. It's a very common challenge because um, it's very difficult. So it's like if you're good at Morrowinds, it's kind of a good thing to do. We could do that in Test 3 MP sometime, just change the starting location to um, Solstheim. <laughs> and like, well, well, I'll turn on the hardcore setting. We'll see if we can make it to the end of the main quest of Sol of uh, Blood Moon. Listen, we, or as we we did the bitter cup thing, uh, we did the bitter cup cheese. Yeah, the chat the bitter cup cheese is insane with level one characters. There were two of us, but that didn't change the fact that like there was heist prep in involved. <laughs> of like literally more more heist prep involved than the fucking in heist in in a uh, seventy six. And Oblivion. Yeah. Yeah, because it was like we were checking um, the lock levels that are in the dungeon and like what level the skeleton war wizard is and like what's the best magic to use to steal the bitter cup without having to kill the skeleton war wizard. And I, I, I even I still died doing it. You had to grab the cut the cup and uh, recall out. Yeah. And I died when I got out of there. Like it's so insanely challenging to get the bitter cup at level one, and then what was what was the stat that got dumped? Wasn't it speed? 
Yeah, it was speed. Yeah, it so went down to 10 speed. We had to play on with him on 10 speed for a couple levels. <laughs> we say in 2019, as a furry. Kaji, in particular, I find it funny that since all characters start with shoes, and furries can't wear shoes, that steals your wallet came to Vardenfell with one of his few possessions, being a pair of common shoes he can't wear. Now, if, if, <laughs> if Todd Howard was a furry, surely he would have noticed that, like, maybe the Beast Folk races shouldn't start with shoes that they can't wear. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, I think the, um... The MGS5 adaptive difficulty system could work in an in Elder Scrolls game. I'm all for stealing ideas from MGS5. Uh, so I know you haven't played it. So the way it works is <clears throat> if you do a bunch of missions and get like stealth ratings, the uh, security forces will like increase the amount of stealth countermeasures that they use. Mm -hmm. And then what you can do is then you can go combat heavy for a few missions and they'll increase their combat countermeasures and like they'll cool down oh. on, the, on the stealth stuff. Oh. You know what's funny is so like I'm considering for Skyrim playing through MGS5 like just as like a as like a um comparison. Well, I, I really just want to play MGS5, but I also want to compare like an open world uh open world stealth game to like some of the stuff in skyrim just just to see like get get it like um just get some ideas and yeah you you telling me that just just is just justifying that even more yeah i can give so, you all kinds of reasons you should play <laughs> that game <laughs> and so dishonored has a similar system right they have like the chaos system yeah um more guards are in high chaos and mm -hmm. like more chaos uh well more stuff happens that encourages combat if you yeah. kill a lot of people it's so, not as good but yeah so what i'm thinking is i'm gonna play mgs5 thief and probably dishonored one that sounds and, yeah uh, that sounds like a good mix since you're yeah. talking about stealth stealth yeah because the reason is is like i have virtually no exposure to the stealth genre i played mgs3 that's it and i did not do stealth playthroughs in mgs3 let's put it that way so it's like, if I want to actually talk about stealth, I feel like I should, you know, brush up on uh, decent stealth games. Yeah, the in MGS5, they have some stuff to make it harder to, like, instant trink people. Uh, obviously, if you're patient, you can, like, shoot people in the leg and wait for them to eventually pass out, but... And yeah, like, knockouts are super powerful in MGS5. They're kind of underrated. Trank Fulton. Trank Fulton. Yeah, the stealth archer of... Uh... <laughs> Lots on stealth in Hogwarts Legacy. Kind of a meme. Given how powerful you can be in that game. This isn't the only limitation placed on furries and scalies, however. Another is the inability to wear closed masked helmets, due to the structural limitations of the Khajiit and Argonian faces. Perhaps a note on beast races is the fact that Vardenfell has institutional slavery. Although outlawed in the Empire, Vardenfell and the broader province of Morrowind were never actually conquered by Tiber Septum, instead signing an armistice. A great many things were hold over of the pre-Empire Morrowind as a consequence. One of these was slavery. Now while technically any race can be enslaved, including native Dunmer, the ones you'll generally see being used for slave labor are the two beast races. I should note that it is impossible to be enslaved unless you spend time in an imperial corrections and rehabilitation center there is an abolitionist quest line and you are able to free most slaves you encounter while there are sometimes different quest paths based on your character's gender it does not seem to matter much your character's race you can join and become a leader in most xenophobic factions as an argonian steals your wallet true to his name enlisted with the thieves guild now while other later games would establish the thieves guild as an ancient establishment vardenfell is quite different as i said earlier morrowind wasn't Ancient code of honor among thieves. <laughs> the Thieves Guild. And steal from the rich and give to the poor.
We are the the cult of Nocturnal in Skyrim. It's not conquered, and so the Imperial Thieves Guild has only recently entered. Have the you done the Thieves Guild yet? Now, what is the function? Not in this character. What have you done? We could probably go straight to that. Uh, I got through most of the Mage's Guild. And I did some of the main quest up to, I think it was the stuff in Vivek, like getting the book in Vivek and everything like that. All right, that, that's a decent chunk. We should be able to uh, get through that. We're going out of order. You realize you're going to miss big plot elements. Is that a bad thing? There's important information in the Thieves Guild section that contextualizes the mate. <laughs> oh. <laughs> is only hinted at if you decide to play the Stooge. Our Mage's Guild character started off by picking everything from Sidonine to Balmora, and once she got her free 200 Gs from Caius, joined up with the Mage's Guild. Turns out the early Balmora quests deal with picking mushrooms and flowers that I happened to grab. Who could have seen this coming? Uh, well, me, because I've done this before. Between the collection of mushrooms and flowers, we're tasked with replacing a soul gem with a fake in our boss's rival's desk, slowing her research. She'll come downstairs, and due to her faulty AI, this means I'm free to leave the cell and come back, and that traps her downstairs forever, which is a more convenient... Doesn't work on OpenMW. <laughs> ...location. I'm not sure about these early quests. They aren't introducing alchemy, asking the player to create a potion with the ingredients or anything like that. It's just go out and fetch some ingredients. As for the soul gem quest, it isn't usually the case that static NPCs move around during quests, so that isn't introducing anything new either. You also don't need to use magic. It might have been handy to have a quest involve learning a low level unlock, like five points to unlock her desk to perform the switch. As it stands, it feels like the designer is showing off that they can script NPCs to move around during quests, which, again, isn't useful information for the player since it doesn't happen again, nor is it impressive from a technical standpoint, since all it does is highlight the fact that NPCs don't work on a schedule and just stay in the same spot all day. It would be like me bragging that I can edit out all these coughs. <coughs> Our next quest is to take 10 gold and buy a ceramic bowl. This is so that the cell can reset so that when I return, stolen reports will have spawned. We're then tasked by a panicking Najira to find said reports. Yeah, I usually make sure not to steal the soul gems. It's on like select playthroughs that I'll do it just because of the uh, extra money. This is the closest the game comes to teaching a lesson, and the lesson is just look around the environment and you can find stuff. And that's it for what the with fuck are you I talking about? No, I've been hard on these five quests, but that is more from an analytical standpoint than anything else. The Thieves and Fighters Guild have you playing out these fantasies, but the Mages Guild plays more like assistant busy work. We're presented a choice: work with Rannis, Athras, and Balmora, or Edwina, Elbert, and Elbert. So. Rannis's quests are um, oriented towards the guild <clears throat> as a magical ra The quests, dur like during the intro of, uh, of the Mage's Guild, made me retroactively go back and reevaluate the, uh, like, um, the Mage's Guild in, uh, in Oblivion. And suddenly I was just like, oh, wait. So the characterization of Oblivion's Mage's Guild was actually kind of in line with how it was characterized in Morrowind. Because uh, I, I always thought it was a little bit weird how dysfunctional the, uh, the Mage's College um, appeared, the Mage's Guild appeared in, uh, in Oblivion. But, um, yeah, it turns out that's just kind of how they roll. It's st they're still, like, they're not that stupid in Morrowind. In Morrowind, no. No, it seems more like everybody's kind of working against each other. Everybody just has their own agendas. The, on the only, the only stupid one that I felt was, like, the, uh, Trevonius Arturius. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's like that that's obviously intentional. Like they're setting him up to be a bit of a buffoon. As but opposed it's, to it's more realistic like, as like an academic institution of like sabotaging and yeah, know, interpersonal drama. Whereas the Mages Guild and Oblivion's like uh necromancers are evil. Well, Joe, you see. Um, <laughs> necromancy is actually uh, forbidden art. RK would not want you to be reanimating your loved ones. We don't 
I feel like, do we ever even come across somebody in the Mages Guild in Oblivion that actually has their shit together? Like, literally every character we run into is just, like, the fucking, even the librarian, her shit's like, she's like, oh, I can't find any books in this library, and everybody's bothering me, and it's just like... Um... That's a good point. I think everybody in... Maybe the Enchanter, who enchants your mage's staff. I think he's the only one who doesn't because that depends. Is the <laughs> is the island under his department? Because that, oh, that's, that's a bit of a mistake. If <laughs> that's a good question, <laughs> Kara Hill. Yeah, I guess the battle mages are like the only people that actually are like functioning at full capacity. Are they though? Because they have you set. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That... Yeah, they set up everything. You're just a bait. Yeah, I was thinking of um the battle mages when you go to um yeah when you go to get the soul gem yeah <laughs> they don't even know their positions and it's like I use an axe where should I be in the formation <laughs> you should be at the back <laughs> you can throw that axe right but we got to be prepared for any goblin attacks <laughs> it might be imagine that imagine if like they they like. They, like trick you out and then it turns out that there's an ambush that comes from the rear and if you had your your fucking your fighter back there <laughs> yeah. yeah that that would actually make up for it but they don't so yeah there's two battle mages that are um kind of on top of things and then everybody else is like 90 iq um struggling to keep up Uh, Joe, I read Richard Dawkins, and he told me that RK isn't real. My biggest gripe is the fact that in Skyrim, necromancy is allowed on the college grounds, but nothing prevents you from going full necromage. That's because necromancy is not illegal in Skyrim. Are you sure? Woundfirth said it was illegal. Oh, well... <laughs> well he didn't say it was illegal he just said the, the college doesn't hasn't allowed it in hundreds of years mm -hmm. but yeah I don't think anybody actually cares regulator while Edwina's quests are oriented towards the guild as a researched institution Ran is first asked we take care of a Telvanian Sulapund either recruiting him to the mages guild <clears throat> or killing him while we're out here, we're also to collect dues from a member in Punambi. Over in Aldrun, we're tasked with taking 250 gold and finding a copy of the Chronicles of Nushleft. And turns out, in Vivek, the Archmage has duties for us. He wants us to solve the disappearance of the dwarves. No leads or anything, just solve this ancient mystery that people have been investigating for centuries. And also three games. The trip out to Sulapund and Punambi is a bit of a drastic sh- Wow, where's your pop filter, man? <sighs> shift in difficulty. Ajira was really onto something when recommending us against doing Rannis' tasks, since we're tasked with journeying into Malag Amur. If only there were quests prior to this that could have prepared us for combat. I get to the first cave, and Manway, the person who has been dodging their dues, is performing research out here. She owes 2,000 gold in dues, apparently, and is not willing to pay unless she likes us, which can be afforded for 200 gold. That's the art of the deal. Then we go and meet with the Telvani. He's one of dozens of quote rogue unquote Telvani living out on the frontier doing their own thing. I put quotes around rogue because honestly taking a place and making it your own is the Telvani way. Nothing roguish about that. He doesn't want to join the Mages Guild complaining about how outlanders are ruining Morrowind, but naturally- But don't you consider the property rights of the proud members of House Endoral that own this territory? Where would our society be without the landlords? Actually, this means he can be bought for 200 gold. Morrowind's quests leave a lot to be desired in terms of convincing people through dialogue. You may have noticed that in most dialogues, there aren't often conversation options. And when there are, they tend to exist in a binary. The concept of dialogue in Morrowind having multiple options is actually fairly alien for the series. When I discuss options for quests, it tends to be in what you can do to complete it through gameplay to get different endings that have minor knock-on effects. But actual dialogue tends to be rather lacking in those choices. 
Morrowind's text-based dialogue seems like the perfect place to do an in-depth conversation system, yet it doesn't happen. Why? Well, in part this has to do with the way quest scripting works. The appropriate responses given to dialogue prompts is determined by a quest stage variable. However, go on many quest pages on the unofficial Elder Scrolls pages, and you'll see full bug sections that are consequences of what happens if you do something slightly wrong affecting journal stages. Now, I never ran into the issue of bugging out the journal stages. I also never ran into a situation where I needed to use console commands to progress a quest, which is fortunate since I didn't have access to a console to do so. But I can speak from experience outside of this review series that it does happen. The journal stage system was new in Morrowind and at its most primordial. Bethesda also seemed more concerned with filling out all the content than doing the work necessary to take full advantage of the uh... system that was created. Oblivion would have been the opportunity to expand but what does it mean where's the memes where's the uh every 45 seconds i have to shove in a, a clip from some youtube video <laughs> a true landlord would never resort to such irresponsible and illegal acts like levitation if that's if levitation is what it takes to get rent you got to do it our economy can't handle a bunch of uh non-rent paying peasants uh literally priced out of the market forever always rent always lease always carry a balance on your credit card always pay interest it's the american way what are you trying to own stuff <laughs> you're trying to be unhappy it I, you know what, I want, I want to support the renter economy so much. I don't even buy tools. I just go to Home Depot and rent every tool that I need. I don't if even... I need a screwdriver, I go to Home Depot and rent that bitch. <laughs> what do you mean you won't rent me a saw? I'll just buy one and return it. <laughs> Manufacturer defect. My landlord doesn't know it yet, but I've enchanted his shoes with a constant silence effect. He can't fly to my apartment. What about potions? Here's the problem with America, okay? We live in a levitation-centric, levitation-dependent economy where we don't support pedestrian efforts. If you can't levitate, you can't live in this country. And then we act like it's a privilege, but in reality, when was the last time you saw a job that was friendly to anybody who couldn't levitate? And people are pulling out these 96 months lease for traveler's pants. It's ridiculous. <laughs> a 96 month lease. Oh man, I got a nice 2000 steel blade of heaven. Fuck is the depreciation on it? on a 96 month lease it's only at 200 out of 2000 durability <laughs> i can probably ring another <laughs> i could probably ring another 500 miles of levitation out of this baby <laughs> just don't return it with any stains on it you gotta pay if if the stain is larger than than a quarter you gotta pay for that shit mm, yeah Well, and it's like, when do we take away the levitation from old people? Because it's very dangerous for them. They forget to re-up it, and they end up falling on top of somebody. Esburn. Esburn, at your age, you shouldn't be levitating. Oh, but Delphine, you, under you have to understand. I gotta get to the grocery store. The alchemy <laughs> shop has my ointment. Riften. Riften does not have a bus service, you see. <laughs> Riften is a Not vertical safe. society. How do I get from the rat way to the market? <laughs> I have to be able to levitate. All the elevators are broken. Like that, like the fucking <laughs> the hotel in Charleston. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, the elevator service only comes like once every half hour. When she told us that two of the three were broken, I was like, should we just take the stairs? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We took a risk. And then on we that got one. in it. We got we got in it, and uh, I immediately was like, "The elevator breaks Man. and wipes out a significant portion of the long form analysis community." <laughs> Listen, the elevator only comes every thirty minutes, and only homeless people who jack off use the elevator in Riften. <laughs> Why do you think it smells like piss in there? Mm -hmm.
based on the text-based dialogue system providing a wide swath of potential dialogue options for players and responses. Since it's text-only, you don't need voice actors. But instead, the decision was made to scrap the dialogue system and hire voice actors. Bethesda has stuck with the same engine. Well, you know, China invested $900 billion into its water walking project. <laughs> They've got high-speed water walking canals, and here we are in America still pretending that levitation is the end-all, be-all of transportation. And then you have people like Elon Musk who think that repackaging levitation as jump spells is actually going to be a viable long-term solution. And that means the same journal stage system. Although they're called quest stages now since the journal got peeled back, even Fallout 76, which I haven't played, utilizes the system. And yet its advantage of potentially providing alternate paths for quests has been used sparingly by Bethesda. If you want a full demonstration of its potential, just look at a random Fallout New Vegas quest. You can see alternate paths, endings, and rewards tied all in there, and most New Vegas dialogues are full of optional paths, despite being voice acted. Bethesda, even with the time and grace provided to them to create Skyrim, still couldn't muster the effort to improve its dialogue system and quest staging to provide options beyond, yes, I will do your quest, and no, but leave the door open so I can come back and do your quest at a later time. Anyways, I happened to grab a copy of the Chronicles of Nushleft while I was convincing that Tilvani to join the Mages Guild, and so I started doing more tasks for Edwina since she seemed the most reasonable of the options. She has me FedEx a potion over to Skink and Tree's Shade at the Wolverine Hall, introducing another quest giver who teases at orders once I finish this quest. Edwina now wants me to steal a book called Kaimar Van Midium, and we might have to cast magic to do it. Just kidding, we're given a scroll with a necessary effect on it, but as the, if you keep holding my hand, I'm gonna start to think you like me. This is where I- But Moro- You're criticizing Morrowind? I thought this video was just Morrowind good. We got it. We got to shut this. I'm waiting. Down. I'm waiting for the punchline. I'm waiting for the haha. I gotcha. Actually, let me explain to you why. Yeah, but this China's water brilliant. China's water breathing program is still years behind the U.S. <laughs> yeah, but at least they're investing in the infrastructure. Meanwhile, meanwhile, America says you got to make a profit on your water breathing potions. And that's why stuff like the BART is getting shut down in, uh, in, uh, the Bay Area. I go off on a tangent because Bethesda just hates the idea of magic-themed quest lines requiring players actually cast magic they've learned beforehand, but I just went on a huge tangent already and I'll let it slide for now. So we go to the Vivek Guild Hall, sneak into a closet, and steal the book. Don't worry, we'll return it later. But before we do that, we need to deal with the situation developing up in Margan. Apparently there's a disturbance at Huling's hut. Sure enough, we find the place trashed and a scamp running loose. An apprentice to Huling apparently summoned it to prove his worth, but the scamp was only pretending to be under his control and stole his clothes and locked him in the basement. <clears throat> so much they could do with that premise that they don't do in the later games. What, scamps being intelligent? Well, like Daedra being intelligent in general. <laughs> no, no, we had that one uh, by the gates in uh, in um, what's it called? In Paradise, mm -hmm. where you can do a quest for him. And then that was it. <laughs> Sorry, I had to step out for a second. Don't you capture a Dremora in Skyrim? Yeah, that's the extent of it. What I'm talking about is like, you could have fun quests where it's like a conjuration ritual that went wrong. Like this one where the scamp got loose and like wrecked this guy's house. And it's not even like a big deal in universe. It's just like something that happened. Basement. I kind of like this quest. Edwina is less than thrilled that her time was wasted on something like that. Now we return the book, which I just give to its owner, and she's surprised at its return, and that's that. Now we need to source a Dwimmer tube from a place called... Ar oh, Kid gosh. I got so much better at this. What? The synopsis. Oh, synopsis. It really is just like me... <clears throat> like, it's going somewhere, but it... Um, my modern writing style would, like, do this, but... Mm -hmm. uh, space stuff out better yeah that's basically it 
And if you don't have anything, you come up with like some sort of tangent to go on. So at least it's tan tangentially related. Just to space it out a bit. I like the Morrowind video, but the Oblivion video was a big step up. It's really, really how you should feel about a lot of your work. It's not even an issue of being concise. It should be the same amount of information, just structured in a different way. Stir dumbs. She doesn't actually need any specific tube, just a tube will do. So, while we're on the way up to the ruin, let's talk about the Xbox. The Xbox had a severe effect on the difficulty of the game. Turns out playing the game at a low frame rate compromises the experience, who knew? The biggest culprit of deaths would be when I would press a button, only to not get a response because the button pressed happened to correspond with a stutter, so the input would be lost and my character would just- Whoa, whoa, stand hold on, hold on. Competing. Another offender is weapon- Oh, hang on, we're both competing for the pause <laughs> button. Are you saying that you were having dropped inputs because the frame rate was too low? Well, yeah, let me weird. tell you about <laughs> Fallout 76, where if you have too high of a frame rate, your inputs also get dropped. And then that happens in a dungeon with combat. Huh. Uh, I think inputs just get dropped for no reason in Fallout 76. You're oh, acting like there's was... logic to it. <laughs> no, 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 there, there was, because when I capped the frame rate, the bug went away for the most part. With with the uh, NVIDIA control panel or? Um, so I couldn't see this spoiling the whole the whole bit that I do, but it, it's more involved with than that because I couldn't just do it that way because I didn't have VSync enabled for other reasons. So when I capped it, it, I would get this like horrible screen tearing. So what I ended up having to do was use um, what was it G-Sync? But in order to do G-Sync, you have to use like a third party application because for some reason a, a a patch a long time ago disabled G-Sync for Fallout uh, 76 and it just never got re-enabled. And then you also enable um, NVIDIA's V-Sync. You have to enable both of those and then you can actually cap the frame rate on PC. Because making it an option in the menu, that's way too hard. Yes. Like, I like that each Bethesda game is very consistent in that they'll add the things that were missing in the previous one. <laughs> so it's like by the time they added FOV sliders, they were late to something else. Yeah. Well, so what's funny is they don't even you can't even disable VSync in the uh in the settings. That's that's an I and I thing you have to change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had to turn off. But all you have the grass. to disable you have to disable VSync because it literally like quarters your frame rate for no reason. Well, you see, preventing screen tearing is a very involved process. <laughs> but yeah, you have to play at exactly the right frame rate, which is uh, like 45. Oh, what? Um, Marwind? Uh, no, Fallout 76. 70s. I would argue the right frame rate's like 70 to 90. Yeah, it's something weird. It can't just be <clears throat> 60. No, 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 60, because 60 still feels like it's, like, 40 because of all the micro stuttering. So you want... <laughs> yeah, you want... You, wanna, you want, like, you, you want, want, like, a 30, 30 FPS headroom there. You want to overshoot, but not too much, because then yeah, you'll not have too dropped much, inputs. Though. Yes. What a fucking shit show. God damn. <laughs> and then magic stancing. Those unaware may be used to the idea of pressing a button to draw a weapon. Well, in Morrowind, you have a separate stance for casting magic. This stance was removed in Oblivion, and I have a suspicion about why that was. Do you still prefer Oblivion cast button, or...? Hmm. That's a good question. I think so. But barely. I like both, honestly. I, I Like, if you gave me one or the other, I wouldn't really mind. Right. Because it doesn't... Really no, you have to pick a best. Affect, it really doesn't affect much. Like it's just something you get used to. Who it's, would... it's not like Skyrim where it, it, there is actual like gameplay implications for how magic is cast. Right. But you, just like, you have to understand. You have. To, is it going to be Morrowind's stance system, or is it Goku? Who would win in a fight? I guess. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, maybe, maybe Morrowind I would prefer because if you're doing like a uh, a battle mage. Uh, damn, it, see, it, this is actually really hard. If I was doing a battle mage that uses a shield, I would rather have the Morrowind system because that requires me to give up give up some defensibility for a second. But if I'm a battle mage that's using just a sword, then I think I would prefer the Oblivion casting. And that's why hand system is superior. Yeah, I'm gonna. I, you know, this, this is actually this is a discussion I will have to address in the video. I should write that down actually. Yeah, because so the hand system gives you the option of do you want to cast alongside your sword or do you want to cast alongside your shield? Yeah, no, I actually I actually do like the hand system in Skyrim's the most because there's actual like gameplay considerations and stuff. Um, Who actually uses shields in Morrowind? You can use shields. They give you passive armor rating, and you can enchant them pretty high, so there's no reason not to use shields. They should make the next one play like For Honor, since they care so much about how it feels to play a Nord Barbarian. Like I said, I don't engage too much with the... Um, the has six doomer posting just because like there's gonna be three skills and the game is gonna play itself todd howard might not even be at the company anymore by the time tez six really starts sander development yeah at some it's point so in his far life, he, away. Has to, he has to enjoy his yacht yeah it's so far off and everything it's it, impossible to really say no he's gonna be there forever Todd Howard game uh, gaming Hall of Fame win. <clears throat> isn't isn't that already a thing? Uh, I think it just became a thing, and I think some like someone stupid got on first thing. Like I think the God of War guy got on. See, among the inputs that can be lost in stutters are the transitions from your normal stance to magic stance, or to your weapon, or to switch between them both. I got frustrated more than a couple times when my character would refuse to switch stances. This would have been a standard experience on the Xbox, since it didn't fare much better than the 360 when running the game. It's not much of a secret that the Xbox copy of Morrowind served as a testing ground for ideas for Bethesda. The new multi-panel UI being adapted into Oblivion, for example, before being reverse ported onto PC players, much to our chagrin. The lack of response simply made Magic Stance too much of a hassle to keep in the game. And the God of War guy that made the games that people actually play these days. Not the one that posts has to post bait on YouTube. It's the new cast button that allows you to use magic at any time. I actually prefer Skyrim's system of having two independent hands, even if the magic tangent removed. So what Got him. Wait, what? I started talking about the hand system, and then I cut the tangent. Was that? Were you being sincere there? You, that was a written joke. So that wasn't yeah. added in editing. Yeah, no, no. But I, like, were you actually being sincere that you prefer the Skyrim hand system over? Yeah. Okay. All right. Because so I think I'm not. That, I'm not, I'm not crazy. Then. No, I don't think it's too crazy. I think it's a reasonable position to say it gives you the most flexibility with magic to do mechanically interesting stuff. Yeah. Even if magic in Skyrim fucking is not, <laughs> is the just because worst. they, just because they fucked up the execution does not mean it's a good idea. But yeah, there was never a tangent there that explained that. That was a written joke. <laughs> what are some other quirks of the Xbox? Well, the AI stopping and taking a think happened quite a bit. It seemed the game prioritized keeping itself running over the AI pathing. However, this wasn't consistent. If the AI knew what it was trying to do and then the game stuttered, the AI would continue on its collision course independent of my ability to respond, button presses being ignored, and of course, since this is being played suboptimally on a controller, this ended in a fair few deaths that wouldn't have- Yeah, it's so good, you... good for magic, bad for two-handed. That's probably a good way to yeah. explain Skyrim's hand system. Yeah, that's actually a good point. Um, they, they so just... my question is- uh, continue with your thought. Uh, mine's, the way that, the way they balance two-handed stuff is they need to just make it like, like three times as powerful instead of like twice as powerful. Mm -hmm. 
So it's like, yeah, there's a trade off, but you can do crazy stuff with two handed weapons. So, yeah. Go on. It's, um, I, especially like if you actually had swarming enemies and stuff like that, two handed yeah. would be great for crowd control. Because there's there's a lot of when I was doing my two handed testing and everything, and I was actually spawning, you know, twenty enemies around me at any given time. I was like, oh wow, this is where two handed would be really fucking powerful. Too bad this these engagements never actually happen in the game. Um, but so my original question was going to be, uh, why are you doing the Xbox comparison thing right now? Um, it's like a general topic that you can kind of put anywhere. Okay, that's that's what I was figuring. And you just needed something to break up the uh. Yeah, the, the mages to break up the mages guild yeah yeah because i'm trying to think about like what a better sections like maybe the morag tongue uh you Where's do you... you do have to remember so this came out as like the parts came out individually originally right yeah yeah, yeah. so there was a little bit of like front heaviness to it have you played tamriel rebuilt yet yeah Alrighty. Would have happened if I was playing with a keyboard and mouse. I do this for love. Ranged combat in particular was quite difficult. At a high resolution, it's easy to spot enemies from the environment, but squeeze that resolution in, knock it down a few hundred pixels, sprinkle on some aliasing and bad lighting, and all of a sudden target acquisition in Morrowind is quite difficult. And aiming with a controller, I mean, my god, I don't want to harp on the weaknesses of controllers this much, but trying to aim with some measure of precision was a nightmare, especially since the projectile trajectories and collision models were built with the idea of being used with a mouse first. Moreover, playing with a dominant strategy is encouraged because of the loading screens. Loading is near instantaneous on a modern PC, as is expected, but on the Xbox I spent probably hours of my life just waiting. Optimally it was a good time to take notes, but sometimes when I was just forced to reload because I kept dying on difficult fights it was less than appreciated. So playing in an order- Hmm, yeah that's- that would be rough, because for me, Morrowind, yeah. there's, there is no loading screen. Yeah, literally instantaneous loading. like. If you play open in W, I would be surprised if you even knew that there was like overworld cell loading. Yeah. Because it's like streamed to be instantaneous. Yeah, that that was what I found surprising when you were walking around Vivac and it's just like you just had to stand there and wait for that loading. Mm-hmm. Man, you know game has a lot of loading on PC? Fallout 76. Yeah, especially because oh. Fallout 76 with its fast travel system encourages you to use free fast travel points to then connect yeah. oh, to other places. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like you fast travel back to your camp and then you go to the train station you want to go to and it's like, so you're going through two loading screens. Or how about how about if you have a, uh, a shelter in your, in your camp? So you have yeah. to fast travel to your camp and then <laughs> go through another loading screen to get in your shelter. And it's not like they can't, uh, they have ways to add options to fast travel. So it's not like they couldn't just say, do you want to fast travel to your shelter? Yeah. Well, yeah, they, they have that with um, Ford Atlas. Fast travel to the interior or the exterior. Xbox 360 was a disaster for the gaming industry. They didn't have a ton of awesome and classic games. Um, kind of, but not really. You're probably more so thinking of the 6th generation than the 7th generation. Like, 7th generation was uh, really the beginning of the modern industry, and so, I mean... What's the famous Xbox 360 exclusive that we're supposed to be missing out on? Halo 3. Oh, the, wait. It's the, on PC now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> even, even the classic arguments of, like, well, you have to have one to go play Halo 3. It's like, oh, that's not true anymore. Plus, like, you can miss Halo 3. Um, hmm. Like, I'll be honest with you, Halo 3 is pretty mid. Uh, I don't know. I consider it... I actually consider... Well, remember, I'm, I'm the multiplayer guy, so I consider it second. 
Halo 2 is the best than Halo 3. ODST, that came to PC too. Yep. No, they're all on PC now, thanks to the MCC. That doesn't mean they all work well, but... Yeah, I mean, Halo 2 crashes like half the time. Yeah. <laughs> Which is funny because um, that was the one that was... That one actually had a PC version. It was, it was for Vista, but, you know... Well, you know, that's too much work, and we'd probably have to pay the company that made it. I mean, if it's a choice between... Oh, I didn't fix it. If it's a choice between paying Gearbox and not, um, I'd prefer not to pay Gearbox. I tried installing all of the MCC, and it was over 100 gigabytes. Why would you install all of MCC? That would mean you'd have Halo 4 on your computer. Halo 4 is one of the best halos let me definitely tell you definitely underrated halo dude i really cannot believe that we're at the point now where people where that is actually becoming a thing again where people are saying no halo 4, you know halo 4 really just wasn't that bad and people like, are sleeping on halo 4 you are out of your fucking mind <laughs> i would i would accept people saying halo 5 is better than halo 4 i will not accept that Halo 4 <laughs> is some sort of, like, missed gem. It's better than Reach. 4? Yeah. I don't know about that. Better than 1. What? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, now now I know. <laughs> April Fools. Oh. oh, sorry guys, it took a while, but we got to the, <laughs> fun, the April Fools punchline. Gonna have to cancel the stream now. Halo... Fight like arguing over Halo 4 and Halo Reach is I would only accept that if your first game was Halo 4, in which case just I'll mark it up as ignorance. But <laughs> oh. the Halo 4 is trash, but the question is, was the 360 like are there a wealth of amazing games on the 360? Is there a wealth of games on the PS3? Um, well, no, Last of Us finally came to PC. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not in a great state, but it, it came. See, I didn't have a PS3, so I can't really answer that. I'm sure there's some, like, really cult classic. I, it's, uh, it's fine if you JRPG. like stuff that came from the 7th gen, but, like, you have to admit that, like, it is the beginning of the end. Two thousand, two thousand eight. That's the cutoff. MGS four and Demon Souls. Yeah, I guess you got that. I mean, I don't know why you got a movie in there, but ah, I get it. <laughs> get it. <laughs> The 6th gen was a way better time. 7th gen is when uh, publishers started to really ruin companies. Mm -hmm. Orthodox ways was discouraged. Let me give you an example. Ever notice how every Skyrim playthrough you see ends up being stealth archery at some point? Dominant strategy. The upsides of the strategy always present themselves as an option should the downsides of the situation impede progress. For Morrowinds, the dominant strategy is to use enchanted items with powerful on-touch effects to nuke enemies to death and then run back and forth timing enemies' attacks and swinging in between rounds. As long as I had room to maneuver in Morrowind, victory was guaranteed. The fun then came from trying to play in newer, interesting oh ways. My trying God. Magic a loading screen on an interior or, cell? Or oh, no, I recalled. <laughs> okay. I was oh, like, okay. I looked away. I didn't know what was going on. I was like, holy fuck. So this is interesting. I, I think the 360 is held in such high regard because it was so good for player interaction with one another. I mean... PC existed, but yeah, for like more casual experience, I could see that. That's where a lot um, of people got in, but what they don't realize is you got in after the market exploitation started. Yeah. If you look at it from a game's history perspective, there's no way you can look at the seventh gen in a positive light. There's a lot of fucking asterisks with the games that came from that time period. Yeah, it was definitely a lot of monkey paws. Like, the 6th gen being so good is why you probably got in at the 7th gen. P 
PC wasn't centralized. I mean, yeah. Yeah, that wouldn't happen until like mid to late seventh gen. Yeah. When you would see a big like move towards PC. None of your high school friends were on PC. Well, fuck the high school friends. They don't have any taste. I, w I was a console pleb until until I got a job in like 2013. So 2012, 2013. The Soulsborne genre started in the seventh gen. Uh, have you heard of Kingsfield? Fifth time and I say, looks like I'll have to get a little bit serious. Overall, playing on the Xbox made me hate this game, and at the same time, appreciate what exactly about Morrowind would cause me to waste so much time analyzing it. To me, underrated gem of playing game on 360. Because now everybody's doing the I'm going to intentionally torture myself thing. Because it's the <laughs> only way to prove you're still human. <laughs> so do I have to play Skyrim on 360 now? You, no, you have to play it on PS3. Oh right, the PS3 version's even worse. I forgot. Yeah, that, that's the, the worst save corruption, version. the save corruption and shit. Yeah, you gotta look up a list of things that you're not allowed to do on that version, <laughs> like, like drop items. <laughs> it's the ultimate testament of respect, as the thoughts say. If you can't handle her at your worst, you don't deserve her at her best. Go off. Even if sometimes her best is also her worst. Now that we've got the tube, we're tasked with checking in on a Dwemer Ruin expedition. This is, naturally, in the middle of Mala Gamor. Luckily, Edwina gave us a couple handy intervention amulets to facilitate the travel. Turns out the site's guide has gone missing deeper inside the ruin, and worst of all, we had to report Edwina once. Some investigation reveals the test of pattern. There are three lights, each with a corresponding lever. Two lights are broken, one light is not. Which lever is the correct one to pull? Well, don't worry, it's the lever that is across the room from the hidden wall, as shown on the minimap. Yeah, the Dunmer guide is dead, but he did manage to find a book before dying. The Mage's Guild rep. It's interesting that they tried, but like. I just quick saved and then. You know, okay, here's how they could have done that. I actually know how they could have done that and gotten away with it. You can um, script those uh, blocks, like the level blocks, to appear after a certain point in the quest. And so, like, the, the correct pathway can not even be on the local map. Mm. And you can use the lever script pull to like uh, re add them to the game. And so it wouldn't spoil which one's the right one. Isn't too bothered by his death, and we take the report to Edwina, who says the book might be useful if we knew somebody who can speak all Tamaris. Our next task is to acquire some Dwemer Scara plans from the ruin of Newslept up in Sheo Gorad. And this is a little high level, as evidenced by the fact that all the orcs can one-shot me. I won this fight, eventually, by using a paralyzed spell to freeze the orc, then cast a spell that had a 50% chance of working to nuke him to death. This took quite a few attempts, and involved a trip back to make the nuke spell. Now oh, I have the plans. Oh yeah, 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 this, this one, this, this dungeon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this massive the difficulty step up. <laughs> uh, my, my strategy was kiting them to the front door and then just hopping in and out oof that's always a horrible strategy yeah i didn't have paralysis paralysis is illusion in this game right uh yes yeah that's why i didn't have it the one thing i didn't spec into Yeah, I've been doing the pacifist run, and uh, so Illusion's pretty useful for doing that. Should Paralysis be Illusion or Alteration? Um, Both. That's why we had Burden. Yeah, there's all kinds of solutions to actually freeze people. And then Paralysis, I think, is just the... The, your mind is tricked into being paralyzed. Has six. Fire, fire, frost, and shock damage have different AI reactions. So, like, fire can make your enemies... Oh, wait. They already did this, kind of. Fire can make your enemies run away. Frost would freeze them and they can fall over. And then shock... I don't know. They piss their pants or something. I don't <laughs> Figure something out for it shock. It does more damage if they're wet. 
<laughs> so yeah, you freeze them and then you thaw them out with fire, which makes them wet, and then you shock them. <laughs> Penny and for a pound, surely there's something valuable here. Well, there's more orcs. Luckily, I found a use for the lock spell. Why do you want a spell that locks doors and creates future hassle? Because NPCs can't unlock them, and can be hit through them. A tactic I discovered early on was the locked door tactic. The enemy's AI pathfinding would lead it through doorways, but can only account for obstacles like doors by opening and traveling through them. To the AI, it should be paradoxical that they can detect someone through a locked door, as if the door is locked, then the player can't have come in the room. That's obviously not how it actually works, but the point is, from a design perspective, what I'm doing only works thanks to an exploitation, or rather, a clever use of game mechanics. The only other thing you can use- You might as well just steal Magicka's system. I mean, why not? We need to play Magicka sometime. Uh, I've played it before. Oh, Pretty good. fun. Magic is great. It's just, I uh, gotta get used to those controls. Use lock for is if you care to level your security up, and you really shouldn't do that. However, the other half of this is a ranged spell with an area effect. I always felt it was a shame what happened to spell making in the later games. In Oblivion, it got relegated to a high level reward for Mages Guild members, or DLC, while in Skyrim, it was cut entirely. Using the Spellmaker allowed me to make a fire spell that was perfect for hitting through locked doors, maxing out the area and setting it to low damage, high duration, making it magic up. Spellmaker's as well. so good. Then I just nuked the door until I stopped hearing footsteps on the other side. It's a beautifully stupid tactic, but hey, it works. I like to imagine I'm just heating the room up until the people inside burn to death, which is brutal, but hey, shouldn't have been the one shotting me. In addition to the Scarab plans, I find a book named The Egg of Time. Edwina thanks us for the plans and recommends we speak with Hastat, Antabullus, and Valmora about the book. He says the book is written in Old Maris, which is a dead language, so we should take the book to one of the older Telvanni, but he doesn't have a recommendation who. Edwina says the miners in the Nysus egg mine found a Dwemer ruin in the mine. So true! To... This, These are things that happened. <laughs> da Rut says, what the fuck? Didn't this dead language thing happen in Skyrim too? Yeah, but with the uh, Balmer. find anything that's down there. Specifically, you know, plans. I have to bribe the door guard for the key, and another guard lower in the mine threatens to kill me if I don't leave. So I leave, in the direction of the ruin. It still counts. Near the entrance, I found some Dwemer airship plans, as well as a book named Divine Metaphysics. Leaving the mine, I hear some ruins that Nysus has a rogue Telvanni wizard living in town, so I pay him a visit. His name is Balados Demnavani, and sure enough, he can read Aldmeris. The Hanging Gardens was written in both Aldmeris and Dwemer, so it's able to be used to translate the other two books. Wow, sounds like a useful resource. Do you think Todd will retire after Starfield releases? That's been my theory for a long time. I think I'm still holding out that it's going to be when the Indi Indiana Jones game gets released. Have you seen him? The deal he made with the Necromancer, he's so old now. <laughs> the phylactery is taking its toll. He's like 80. <laughs> they can't delay it any longer because Todd's going to die before it comes out due to uh, accelerated aging. Todd, do you qualify for AARP yet? I mean, mind you, I've been off the Bethesda train for a while, so it's like, yeah, it doesn't fuck. I've been off the RPG train for a while. <laughs> like, I hate this genre. The Egg of Time is a refutation of a theory from the time of Resdane and Erevar. The theory said that using the power of the Heart of Lorcan carried more risk than reward, and the Egg of Time figured that the reward was worth the risks. Divine Metaphysics is about how the Dwemer tried to make a new god using Kagranak's tools, 
and using sacred tones on Lorcan's heart. So, extrapolating meaning from these two books, we can conclude that the Dwemer tried to make a new god using Lorcan's heart, that the great risk that was warned about came true, and then the Dwemer disappeared. Thus, having discovered both the plans to a functioning airship, as well as solving the mystery of spontaneous extinction of the Dwemer, we will return for our rewards. Edwina has none. She's disappointed because she wanted the plans to build a robot, not an airship. Trebonius, the Archmage, also has no reward, taken aback that someone had actually managed to complete one of his missions, let alone a mission that entailed solving a centuries if not millennia old mystery. You do get some Well, it's like the modern games can't, like, I was talking about this with Fallout 76, um, the game threatens to be good by having an interwoven narrative where plot elements are introduced and not abandoned. So it's like instead of having a one-off character to do something, they'll use a character that can like return to serve a role multiple times. I know. I know. How insane. I would also let you save on uh on voice acting. I don't have to hire as many voice actors. reputation so more people know your name but scholarly work itself pays very little despite this the mystery i don't think that i think that bethesda is gonna um be split up after starfield i think there's gonna be a fallout division and there's gonna be an elder scrolls division guys we cannot keep releasing one game in each franchise every decade so I, really I think emil's Emil's going to join the, like, Fallout division, and then I think somebody else is going to be in charge of the Elder Scrolls one. I'm fine with that. Fallout 76 definitely killed any enthusiasm I will ever have for another Fallout game. History of the Dwarves is one of my favorite quests. The fact that it starts off giving you zero information... That's not based on anything, either. Don't be like, uh, you making that up? Like, you know, no shit. That's the smart thing to do. It'd be really dumb for them to keep doing this, like, one Bethesda for all. Tension while doing other quests is just, it's just fantastic. So where do we go from here? Well, one rank requires we pay our dues, so that's a couple hundred gold. Fallout 4 is bad? What? No, did you play settlement building? No, no, this can't be. Gold gone. You'll also need a wizard staff to reach the rank of wizard, so we can either pay 5,000 gold we don't have, or we can um, ask. Yeah, ask a former guild member for one, who lives in a cave called Sud in Sheogorod. I don't think she'll let us ask. Once we got the staff, we can get promoted. Oh, but hold those horses, because we have something big to talk about. Training. One of my favorite aspects about Morrowind is that factions require you have the necessary skills to properly fill your rank. Every faction has attributes and skills they prefer. Now, assuming you're being a logical person and playing to the specialization of the faction, these are reasonable skill requirements. However, this is an instance where the game is just twisting that knife into me, and that is due to my format. Had I played the one character doing all the factions, I'd have been alright. It'd have been fine. It'd have had two contractions when I should not have been using any. Point is, I have seven characters, and for six of them, the same thing happened at least once. They outquested the requirements. Now, if you play this game like a goddamn normal person, you're doing stuff like adventuring, freelance quest work, even working for other factions. That's what a reasonable person who isn't playing faction by faction in order to make a video series does. We have enough faction reputation to complete the final quest and become the Archmage, but we're severely underleveled. I need to gain 30 levels in a single skill to reach the requirements. This happened to Steals Your Wallet, and to a minor extent, Mace as well. Mace was actually very close to the necessary requirements in his blunt weapon ability, and that's because fighter skills tend to level really well compared to stealth and magic skills. So, in order to progress, I need to use a trainer. Trainers are a bit different from the later games. Later games put stipulations that you can only train five times per level. Morrowind has no such requirement. Cash provided, you can train from level one to max level, whatever that should be for your character, at trainers. But it isn't that easy. Like the later games, the trainers themselves have their own skill levels, corresponding to their lore level of mastery. You need these master trainers because only they can train you past skill level 70. Most skills, and mind should be paid to the word most, most skills have master trainers. Some don't appear. Some do appear but don't offer training, and some just don't have trainers. Of the ones who do exist and do work, only about two-thirds of them are mentioned anywhere. The rest have to be found. Hell, some of them may only be mentioned. 
One is hidden in a locked room. Another is hostile and attacks on sight, having to be calmed. Two require a high rank in a specific faction. So not only are their trainers rare people, but training costs money, and high level training costs lots of it. I'll talk about making money in part four when I discuss House Halau. Just bear in mind that large stopping point in every playthrough, besides my final main quest playthrough, was stopping and setting aside time to farm money and skills in order to meet the requirements to level up. Again, this doesn't normally happen unless you're laser focused on completing factions as fast as possible with new characters. So once I finally reach destruction level 80, Edwina says that I should talk with the Archmage Trevonius about stepping down, as I'm clearly more committed to scholarship than he is. I ask him, and he accuses me of lusting after his position, and demands we settle this via duel to the death in Arena. This is what Hannibal Traven deserved. <laughs> nah, he knew he wasn't going to win that fight. Just cut out the middleman. See, he was being efficient. True. And it's a pretty cool duel. Turns out he had an artifact called the Necromancer's Amulet that made him such a powerful wizard. Edwina said he was a strong battle mage, but he hardly met the conditions of battle mage. Anyways, the Mage's Guild, scholarly institution, settles its management disputes via trial by combat. He was the necromancer the, the whole time. I'm not sure going to get a letter in the telling me I'm being replaced. You don't understand. What does it say about the character? <laughs> what does it say about the themes? The Imperial Guilds of Morrowind are the bridge between the tutorial and the broader content of Morrowind, since Caius pretty much flat out tells you to go join one. Which is why it is important to pay attention to the starter quests, since this is likely to be the first impressions of everyone who played Morrowind past the first Mud Crab. The intrigue of the Thieves Guild mine, the fun stuff like the Boudet Egg Mine and the Golden Eggs, or accidentally running into a powerful vampire in the Fighters Guild, and the mystery of the Dwarves quest requiring a bit of astute problem solving or uh, internet research to figure out. Despite how hard I may have gone on these guilds, they actually are pretty good. But when the Thieves Guild throws you into the deep end of crime, the Fighters Guild starts pitting you in unfair fights, and the Mages Guild engages in bureaucratic busywork, it colors people's impressions of the factions. One thing to mention, because of the non-linear approach to faction quests and Morrowind, oh, my experience right, that. in the is slightly different than what yours can be. Uh, that's fucking um, intercepting other people's uh, target spells in midair. Yeah. That, that caught me off guard with this game. Yeah, it's such a cool thing. Yeah. <laughs> It makes you wish that the AI were better at using target spells. <laughs> yeah, if anything, it became more like annoying in, in certain situations like this and like hallways where I'm just trying to hit them and they just keep spamming spells. So I just can't get it hidden. Yeah, so you got to like tire out, tire them out and then. Yeah, I did not expect that whatsoever. That, that took some getting used to. It makes you wonder, like, why didn't Skyrim bring that back? If they wanted a. A more visceral magic system give your give your magic like literal impact then no slow moving bullet <laughs> lightning bolt like light, lightning bolt slowly traveling through the air i love i love lightning bolt because it has such a limited range it travels instantly. I was meaning the Oblivion one. <laughs> oh, the Oblivion one. <laughs> B. I mentioned Skink and Tree's Shade, but looking back, I never went and did his quests, or that many of Rannis Athrith's quests either. This non-linearity is what I love about Morrowind, and at the same time, is the biggest risk in terms of personal enjoyment. Which is probably one of the big reasons Oblivion Onward focused on linear quest lines leading players by the nose into controlled experiences. The Imperial Guilds and Morrowind are a strange thing. Between the Fighters and Thieves Guild War, and the rather straightforward if simple Mages Guild, you hit the three archetypes of role-playing games. In the next part, we'll be discussing the Great Houses. You see those same three archetypes, but a lot more political intrigue. I think if love was shown to any of the factions, it was the Great Houses. Still, the guilds serve as a great starting point for any character, especially for players new to Morrowind. All right, uh, that's the Mage's Guild. He feels satisfied. Hmm. I don't know. It didn't really. 
didn't give me a whole lot. It reminded you about spell impacts. Yeah. Uh, spell impacts? Um, actually, I'll take note of that. And the differences between spell casting. Like uh, a blue Skyrim, Skyrim's hand system. I don't really intend on going through like blow by blow. It's not it's not like going to be a, a deconstructed analysis. It's going to be more like a... Hey guys, I tried playing Morrowind despite being an o oblivion boomer. Pretty much, yeah. That's a, that's a good good synopsis. It's the only thing I'm good at. <laughs> All right, I've jumped ahead to the main quest. Now I hope All you right. see that there is more to Vardenfeld than just a dozen or so faction quest lines. Umbra was in fact able to carve out an entire adventure out of side dungeons and random quests. Morrowind is a rich world to explore outside of its semi-scripted quest line experiences. Oh my gosh. Whoa. What happened there? <laughs> adventure out of side dungeons and random quests. Morrowind is a rich world to explore outside That's of its semi-scripted quest line That's when you live in the Mages Guild, that bachelor lifestyle. <laughs> oh my. What happened here? Derfine. Feel the need to sort this room. Oh, Esburn, you know we don't have enough space space in the stash limit, in the stash box. So Esburn, out, did you pay for Fallout first? So what I found out this this is interesting. If you pay for you know you get Fallout first and stuff, and you put everything in the scrap box and the uh, in the ammo box, when Fallout first expires. That stuff stays in the box. And you, so, you just can't add stuff you, to it? Yeah, you just can't add stuff to it, but you can still pull stuff out and use it for crafting and everything. That was, um, I was expecting it to just dump it all into my infant, into my stash. Mm -hmm. And then I would just log on and say, like, I have, you know, 2,200 2, out of like 1,400. Oh, yeah. I, was, I just wouldn't I'm, be able to. I'm impressed at Bethesda for not doing that. Yeah, that is. I, I applaud their restraint. No, no, no. Delphine had the ranger outfit. Esber, <laughs> Esbern wore whatever he found. Esbern wore whatever Delphine said he would wear. Including the bomb <laughs> collar. <laughs> Esbern. Do you really I, I, think that you can go anywhere by yourself? <laughs> You're too old to levitate. I'm telling you, De Delphine, the, the pills... The pills that the doctor gave me, they, they're working now. Esbern, you know doctors are run by the Thalmor. <laughs> Esbern, you think you think that Parthenax is living in your walls? What does this have to not... do with Alduin's wall? <laughs> if I wasn't supposed to take the pills, then why did you make put the sign above my bed? I meant a different thing by medicine, Esbern. Says. <laughs> Guys, we made it through five and a half hours of video. Aren't you impressed? You guys said that this was going to take 30 hours. But it's only been four hours and 42 minutes. Where's the hate for the Breton waifu? See, she's not the ugly version. I should load up the ugly version so you guys can see what you're missing out on. The Breton librarian. Here we go. This is what you, you could have gotten. You cheated and skipped parts. What? No, we've started at the beginning. We're just watching at 1.25 times speed. That's why we were able to get this far in. Alrighty.
How far into the main quest did you get? Perfect. Um, yeah, I think that was the last. No, you're not very far in. No. We are finally shaking the yoke of these black bars and terrible resolutions. I'm using OpenMW instead of playing the base PC copy, partially because the base game is in 4x3. It's a stylized part of the game though, right? Well, no. Unlike a hand-drawn art style, Morrowind is a 3D game. It can afford to fit on my, and now your, screens. Uh, actually, it should be ultra-wide, 21 by 9 <laughs> So what do we get for playing on PC? Cheats. That I didn't need or ever use. I've had a few quests bug out over the years, like a playthrough where my Telvanni stronghold never actually appeared. Or common longer term playthrough issues like Silt Strider guides falling off their platforms. But I've honestly had a pretty stable time playing Morrowind for this series. Now, I suspect this is in part because of the fact that I avoided playing a single character for everything. So because none of my characters got more than 20 hours in game, there wasn't enough time for any game breaking bugs to happen. Because remember, I was not playing on an exactly stable port of the game until now. I was playing on what should have been its buggiest incarnation. Another perk of the PC is this godly user interface, and one right click and instantly, all the interface you could need for any situation. On the Xbox, there were four separate panels that you navigated with the black and white, or on more modern controllers, bumper buttons. That is because your average Xbox player is playing from across the room, sitting on their couch, and needs to be able to see information on screen, meaning that the smaller text and icons on the PC version won't cut it. Here on PC, if I say, I want to cast a spell, I just right click, no need to switch over to another panel. And the screens are customizable. You're able to change the size of the windows, so non-magic players can diminish their magic menu. You can also sticky one of them onto your screen so you can continue seeing your map while you play. But of course, that convenient and godlike user interface was traded in for the inefficient, divided, panel-based system in all Bethesda games going forward because console parity. We also get a steady frame rate. The AI will no longer forget what they're I doing think for multiple seconds. One of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite aspects about um, Skyrim's interface is that it also sucks to navigate with a controller. Yeah, it's, it's like the the Oblivion interface was actually better just to navigate functionally. It's like, oh, god damn. no longer lose button presses into the void of stuttering frame rate. Overall, we're in for an immensely enjoyable experience as I begin to try and break this game in every way I can. I'll be brief, because if you know anything about Morrowind, you know about the Alchemy Snowball. In effect, the effectiveness of any created alchemy potion is determined by a few factors, one of those factors being intelligence. Some merchants in Morrowind restock an ingredients immediately after ending dialogue with them, and some of those ingredients fortify your intelligence. So, grabbing a free set of Master's Alchemy equipment sitting unsupervised in the Caldera Mages Guild, we go to work. The early game will look like this. I repeatedly buy 10 alchemy ingredients until I have a few hundred or so, spam the Create Potion button, sell the byproducts, and profit. Once I have a decent chunk of cash, I go and buy hundreds of Ashiams and Netch Leather, which is used to fortify intelligence. Fortify intelligence increases the effectiveness of potions created and the value of potions are determined based what on their the effect fuck? values, meaning that I'm grinding these useless drain personality potions out, and their value is gradually increasing, decreasing the intervals between when I rest and allow Nalkaria to restock her cash supply. And so, Morrowind's market was flooded with useless drain personality potions, and my pockets were flooded with cash. You can go farther with this. These fortify intelligence potions increase my magicka by tens of thousands, in a game where a thousand magicka is close to the normal limit. However, the real draw is for training. While doing this, I gain skill points in alchemy. Then I go train armor skills like heavy and medium armor and a third attribute skill. So every level I'm getting max points in intelligence, endurance, and a third attribute like speed or strength. Your overall health in Morrowind is determined by endurance. In particular, however, it's determined by your endurance at all levels. Endurance affects starting health as well as health gain per level. So if you have 50 endurance, you gain 5 health a level. Our goal is to get to 100 endurance or 10 health per level as fast as possible. This comes pretty quick as I strategically decided that heavy and medium armor were not major or minor skills. This meant training was cheap since I was starting at skill level 5. By the time I start playing, I'm around level 20. I have several hundred hit points, magicka, fatigue, and high levels in skill in many weapon and armor types, as well as utility skills skills like speechcraft and mercantile. And this isn't even the most you can min-max in Morrowind, but it is pretty close. So let's go a step farther. With a handful of artifacts, we can take our character to the next level. Again, this isn't the most min-maxed build in Morrowind. You can go farther depending on what you want to accomplish. The first is the Apprentice Ring, which is pretty close to where we start inside a need. This is basic stuff, plus 10 to intelligence and willpower. This helps the early game alchemy snowball and helps us with some magicka issues. Our next grab are a pair of boots. Going north out of Caldera, we meet a woman desperate for escort to Nar Mok. You'll notice she's quite quick, and sure enough, after the escort, she's willing to part with her magic boots. What makes these boots magic are two effects. Fortify speed 200 points, blind 100 points. By default, the boots will make you very fast, and also make the screen look like this. And your game will sound like this. 
Luckily, there is a Resist Magicka effect, which works for negative spell effects, but not the positive ones. Meaning that if you were to reach 100% Magicka resistance, you could resist the blind effect. But 100% Magic resistance must be pretty difficult to reach due to being overpowered, right? Well, no. We're already at 50% by default on this character. We have the Atronach sign, which removes our ability to naturally generate Magicka, but we get two times the max Magicka and can absorb 50% of hostile spell effects. In addition, we are a Breton, which comes with an additive point- Sorry, I've been distracted with the, the VTuber software. <laughs> yeah, well, what the f- <laughs> So this is- this is Caius on one of his skooma trips. Now compare this with Esvern. <laughs> Tell me what you prefer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um whoops i forgot that this part was gonna spoil uh oblivion uh, for you spoil oblivion or morrowind sorry <laughs> it's okay it's a little bit hard to follow at 1.25 so i've missed a couple steps here and there plus there's a. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> There's, there's, there's some, something going on. Something going on on my second monitor. Listen, you have to forgive me, okay? I'm finding settings. <laughs> Is here's how to break the game an overdone uh part of Morrowind videos? Is it? I don't I wouldn't know. I haven't watched many Morrowind videos. Mm. I love I love parts that are about breaking breaking games. That's why I do it in, in Skyrim and stuff. My Skyrim videos. I go into it a tiny bit in 76, because, I mean, that was literally my build by the end. It's just, all right, here's the meta. This is what I did. I mean, for me, a part of... I love games that let me just break them. Skyrim tried, you know, they really tried to... make it so that you can't break it, and, uh... When there's a will, there's a way. Put it that way. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think, um... Part of this is that you have to remember we're five and a half hours in. We've done most everything. Now it's time to really demonstrate just how broken this game gets. Yeah. prefer games that dare you to break them as part of the experience i actually kind of don't like that i like games where they can be fun on occasion but really it should be like a curated kind of experience yeah i i, I like games where it's accidental because it feels like i think because part of the thrill is doing something that you know you're not supposed to be doing like one of my favorite things that's why halo 2 is one of my is my favorite halo game was specifically for the glitches and stuff, just getting out of bounds of maps and everything like that. They never intended for any of that to happen. And then after I learned about the development, <laughs> the development history of Halo 2, I understand why that game was the way it was. But um, yeah, it was, it was, it was always yeah, like the well, the Halo 2 scarab gun was that was intentional. That was that was an Easter egg. I'm talking like. You just watch what like the fucking speedrunners do now with like butterflying and everything or uh ghosting it's like that's that's stuff that i like that was gen genuinely one of the things i loved about oblivion was that they tried they tried to make it so that you can't break that game 
and then oh fuck man does yeah. that game break <laughs> that game breaks from you just playing yeah elders uh bethesda's at their worst when they're trying really hard to stop players yeah. from breaking their games when they're trying yeah. to balance things out it's good that if you have an intentional design um but there should be like some some upper crust of it and a lot of it's unintentional but if you don't go around like trying to fix stuff um you don't like alienate the people that are there for it to be broken but so i think one of my favorite examples is um goat simulator i look at a game like that and i have abs i a part of me actually hates that game just from a conceptual standpoint where it's like yeah the game's going to be broken just because it's fun it's like and ruins really does like take the take the thrill out of it ruins the spirit it's like it's like fucking with somebody who's just like they they're just not going to get pissed off or anything like that it, it eventually just saps the fun out of it no you gotta prank people yeah exactly it's like why am i gonna prank somebody who just immediately uh just starts laughing about it and tries to get in on the joke well, that's the spirit of April Fools, of course. Yeah. Hmm. Why do Why do I hate April Fools? <laughs> How many Mario sixty four alternative universes are you in? I don't know. I don't play Nintendo games. Can you beat the moon at half a press? <laughs> The fuck are you doing? <laughs> I've listen, I've discovered these magic effects. <laughs> to help transcend <laughs> my mortal limits. So three dollar for a model change, two dollars for non anime model, uh five dollars for a new effect. Hmm, yeah, that's that's a good point. I could charge <laughs> money for this. <laughs> it has to be minimum two dollars because I don't think YouTube lets you send a message for one. So it's like, how are you going to request what you want? <laughs> I wonder how this looks on other models. <laughs> <laughs> April Fool's fucking blows. Yeah, April Fool sucks. I I I love I love a day where literally the entire internet is completely unusable. That's why we're here doing a completely normal stream. Seeing other people's April Fool's content makes me just want to release like a really good video on April on April 1st. It's impossible. Don't do I it. I literally watched somebody's video this morning, and it inspired me to just immediately start um, editing my next video, as opposed to watching his video because it's an April Fool's Fool's thing. So you're going for that like uh, stylized manga look? You look like a good Joe. Daggerfall video win? Never, ever. Jeweler did the uh, did the comprehensive video on it. Reminds me how Ross premiered Freeman's Mind 2 on April Fools. We all wish for that energy. <laughs> Five times to our Magicka and 50% Magicka resistance. Long story short, we can resist half of the effect by default dimming our screen to 50%. In addition, if we can cast a 1 second 50 point resist magic effect, then put on the boots, we fully resist the blind. For the rest of the game. And it's a cheap spell effect. Because the game never updates to check if the resist magic effect still nullifies the blind effect. Which is something that I'd like oh. actually like to see. <laughs> but yeah, you can you can just like... Um, set, it I, up, set it up once and then just let it... Mm -hmm. And the only, way, the only way it gets reset is if the boots break. You have to re-equip them. Um, I am curious, like, res should resist Magicka affect positive effects as well? 
Yes. From a balance perspective, yes. From a fun perspective, I think... Well, here's here would be the solution, then. You have, like, three different types of resist magic effects. You could have one that blocks everything, one that only affects negative, and one only that affects positive. I don't even know why you would want the positive Weakness one. to magicka should affect positive effects. Can you imagine... <laughs> You cast 100% weakness to Magicka effect, and then ha your Fortify spells oh. double. Yes. Yes, that's that's actually a great idea. There's so much, like, potential that you could do with that, like, intentionally yeah. using that. Do you, that you... do that while playing as an Altmer. <laughs> well, my ideal system would be the spell cost is, like, can be decreased by adding negative effects but you gotta be careful with the weakness spell because if it's a weakness spell on self that means you're like amplifying the magic effect so it's got to increase it whereas on a target it should um well no on a target it would it, it would increase the spell cost but i mean like say you have a healing spell but it drains a skill it makes it cheaper you could game that that way by draining like some skill you don't use but I'm thinking of it as a system that lets you really uh, gas how powerful you can make your magic on an economy budget. Our next stop is to the Blood Moon expansion, doing the Tim Vol in the Well quest. It's pretty easy to dodge the higher level enemies given we have 200 plus speed, and Tim Vol is willing to see reason easily, giving us the Mantle of Woe. The Mantle of Woe has a great many effects. It fortifies magic of five times. Look at this fucking item. I just, I want you to take a second to look at it. That. Hmm. Is that what I think it is? <laughs> oh, yeah, it's in Skyrim now. <laughs> so, what do you think? Like, okay. Work through this one. Tell me what this does. Okay. Is this, like, to be... Like a vampire? Kind of, but vampires are in the game. Yeah. So yeah, you do take sun damage. But it's a removable robe. And how often are you needing tons and tons of magicka outside versus in a dungeon? Yeah. But look at that fortify mag maximum magicka five times. <laughs> that's pretty uh yeah that, that's pretty good <laughs> yeah whoever balanced this item worked under the assumption that you would be forced to wear it and not that you could just take it off when you don't want the negative effects even like the weakness to normal weapons isn't that terrible no it's not <laughs> because there's not that like at high levels there's not that many enemies that use normal weapons which is additive to our 2.5 times. It also fortifies Conjuration 50 points. In exchange, we have a 20 point weakness to normal weapons, 100 points drain personality, setting it to zero, and sun damage 20 points, which turns us into a vampire. But, 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 we don't need to wear the robe all the time, which means we can get in fights and access our near 1200 points of magicka, then take it off the rest of the time. One more artifact, the Necromancer's Amulet, which you get from Archmage Trevonius Artorius, resists normal weapons 25%. Oh yeah, you can look at this one too. Wait, restore health one point on self? Yeah, so it, is that, it, that, is effect, that a constant effect? Yes. Oh, God. So you're just constantly under a restore health one point effect. So it's <sighs> passive health regen. And spell absorption 25%, just just to, just to pop it off. With the with stacking with Atronach. <laughs> and fortifies intelligence 25 points, more magicka. Restores health one point on self, and absorbs spells 25% on self. So now we have regenerating health, 75% spell absorption, and a partial normal weapons resistance. Yeah, this build wasn't worth it. This is because Morrowind will rarely rise up to the challenge I've issued, and that's part of the charm. Later Elder Scrolls games bent over backwards to try and balance the big three specializations out. Morrowind was unapologetic and allowed wizards to really shine. The more creative and more able to take advantage of the game's system- You can see how fast it's regening despite having, like, 
Yeah, let's look at the carriage. We've bent sheet. over backwards to try and balance the big three specializations out. Morrowind was on. So I got 237 health. Watch how fast it, the, it's regening passively. Apologetic and allowed wizards to really shine. The more creative and more able to take advantage of the game's systems you are, the more you're allowed to get out of the game, and it's great. So let's get started with this main quest. Oh yeah, I don't know if you know, but uh, Atronex sign, if you use a shrine, it counts as a magic effect on you and you absorb it and get full magicka. Oh. But you still get, do you still get the effect from it or does it nullify the effect though? Uh, it if you absorb it, it nullifies the effect, but the free magicka is like far more worth it. Hmm. Couldn't you? Oh wait, right, because you'd be in an interior that you can't rest in. Yeah, you you can't restore magicka by resting with the Atronex sign. Oh right. That's why this is so powerful. Oh. <laughs> Now that I've got this stupid character. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> they have taken you from the Imperial City's prison. First by carriage and now by boat. To the east, to Morrowind. Fear not, but I am you. you have been chosen. One month after our arrival, we returned to Caius, who had given us 200 gold to start our work. We're now a member of the Blades, a secret intelligence agency working in service of the Emperor. Our first few tasks seem inane, but from the very first quest, we're going to be introducing concepts and ideas that are important throughout. Caius will insist you acquire some experience, and I think this is going to reinforce it. Our first two quests will involve going to the local guilds for some information, you know, just in case you haven't joined them yet. It's no coincidence that, as most new players will commonly pick fighter characters, our first task is to meet Hasfat Antibolus over in the Fighters Guild, and ask him about the Nereverine and Sixth House Cults. We've dealt a bit with the Sixth House Cult before, but the Nereverine Cult is a new one. I promised that that name wouldn't come back up, and I lied. Unfortunately, Hasfat doesn't have much info on them, but he can tell us about the Sixth House, in exchange for a small favor. He wants us to get our hands on a Dwimmer puzzle box, located in a nearby ruin of Arkenthand. This is a great first quest. In order to find the ruin, you have to pay attention to the directions given. That said, it's also a safe quest. I like quest. that the Morrowind map has a note for Snowy Granius. <laughs> also, I like this little map I've made. Yes, there is a Caius model, but are you really going to take away our, our golden <laughs> angel? <laughs> uh, holy crap. <laughs> oh my god, we stepped into the sun. It like gets subdued here, but like... I'm becoming more powerful. <laughs> I'm trying to see if I can get it on jo oh Okay. If you get in over your head. All right, let's. Um, what was causing that was the ambient occlusion. Gotta get it just right. All right, we want Caius. you're right next to a legion fort with all the necessary amenities. Meet Snowy Granius, or as I call him, the Bridge Wizard. He's a gear check. If you try to play Morrowind the same way you would play Skyrim, Granius is your rude awakening, and Caius warned you. 
On the surface, he's little more than a wizard bandit. He's only level 3, he knows some basic destruction spells and can summon a skeleton. But because he is, ostensibly, the main quest's first mandatory combat encounter, he's garnered a reputation. Obviously, he's no match for the monster I've created, but he deserves recognition because if Morrowind had those Dark Souls bloodstains, they'd be right about here. Before we enter the ruin proper, we have to figure out how to open the door. I could be wrong, but I think Hasfat has a throwaway line about it. This crank here opens the door. Arkanthand is an alright little first dungeon. You could it's basically fix two it. dungeons. The first a bandit area, the second a more traditional Dwemer ruin. Our objective, and indeed the only reason you're sent here, is actually right by the door, tucked away in an area not immediately drawn to the eye. You could explore this entire dungeon, reaching the end, a large vertical area, and not find the puzzle box, only to realize it was by the door the whole time. Yep. This is owing to the fact that dungeons in Morrowind are non-linear. But... Did you get trapped? Um, well, it was more like I was just going through the whole dungeon, and then it was literally the last room that I checked. I was like, oh, I still haven't found the puzzle box. And then I got to the end, I was like, well, I didn't explore that side of the place, let me go over there. Now I expected it to be like a whole other part of the dungeon, and it was just, oh wait, no, it was just one room, and the box was there the whole time. I don't think it's a troll. Like... Um, Boss Credo's room is like a, um, kind of like a command center for the area. So, like, it makes sense that it would be in there and not at the end of the dungeon. But that isn't even entirely true. Some dungeons in Morrowind are non-linear, and some dungeons in Morrowind are a single hallway leading into a room. Dungeons in Morrowind are realistic by the standards of the universe, because in what world would the leader of a group of bandits put his living space as far as possible from the door? And in the real world, some people were buried in a mausoleum, and some people were buried in the pyramids. Once we return the box to Antibolus, he gives us some notes on the Sixth House, and recommends we speak with Sharn Gramuzgob. You can read the notes at any time, as we'll be getting them back later. Indeed, Caius's next orders are to speak with Sharn Gramuzgob, a local alleged necromancer working out of the Mages Guild. Again, this is Bethesda subtly pushing the player towards a faction if they haven't already joined. She'll tell us what she knows about the Nerevarian cult, in exchange for a small favor. She wants us to visit an ancestral tomb, grab the skull of one Halival Androno, and bring it to her. Read into this. She wants us to defile a local tomb, steal the skull of a native, and give it to an all-but-confirmed necromancer. Uh... Yeah, get used to that feeling. She does give us some tools to handle the undead in the tomb, which is a nice introduction to the concept of creatures who are immune to normal weapons like iron and steel, as they aren't going to be going away. I don't have as much- Yeah, didn't pick Man. up the necromancy thing. Man. Oblivion and Skyrim really is just, uh... <laughs> yeah, fuck couldn't quest you. <laughs> they really don't get you to start reading between the lines there, do they? Alright, that's going in the notes. Bridge Wizard solos Frost Ape. Possibly. Bridge Wizard is pretty powerful. See, this is this is the stuff that I'm looking for. Things that I fell for, things that I, that didn't work for me. Mm -hmm. I like I like when I when I get unexpected, unexpectedly uh, blindsided by something like that. And it makes me go stop and go. Oh, wait. That's what goes into the video. There's much to say about this quest. This is the other one. It's more of the same. Go to place, grab a thing. The tomb is much smaller of a dungeon, easier to get to, and more linear. I guess there is something to be said for making absolutely certain players are prepared for the coming escalation in difficulty. We get some notes on the Nerevering cult and report back to Caius. Caius, as an academic, wants us to corroborate her findings from the last two missions, with a big and complicated mission to collect- Camera shutter noise driving me crazy. That's just the screenshot sound. Like, you don't have to- <laughs> I'm not in your walls. Like intel in the big city, Vivek. I don't like questing in Vivek, and yet, I like this quest. First, it matches the theme of the Blades as an intelligence organization, collecting information and doing favors. Second, each leg of the quest follows the same format, but does something unique. Third, each leg is set in a different part of Vivek. Not just different cantons, different sections of the cantons, making them distinct in a way most Vivek quests just aren't. 
We're looking for three people, Halea, Adhiranir, and Mera Milo. Halea is in the foreign quarter and is about to be the victim of a hate crime before we step in. You can persuade them to leave Halea alone or just kill them. Afterwards, you escort Halea across the canton and he gives you some notes on the Dereverine cult. Adhiranir is hanging out in the sewers of St. Olm's. This isn't for fun, she is actually hiding down here and finding her will entail searching the canton. She's hiding due to a senseless and excise agent looking for her. We deal with the issue and she tells us that the sixth house has become a big client for smugglers, but nobody knows why. Mayra Milo is in the library up at the temple. She asks we follow her into the back where it's more secluded. Yep, this is all things that happen. Well, so it, this is actually not too bad for me because um, this is reminding me of the stuff that I actually really liked about this quest where you're doing actual investigation. And, yeah, uh, you have to figure out where these people are. And... and you can actually use logic to deduce a lot of it. And like, so it was, I at no point did I feel frustrated while doing this. But it took some time and, you know, thought. And it was rewarding every time I found... Like, the lady in the fucking sewers? I, f I felt big-brained when I found her. Because I was going off of basically just, like, some scant clues that somebody gave me. And then I was just like, what if I just go down to, like, the lowest level? I don't even know what's down there. Well, let me just go down to... The and there she fucking was. I was like, alright, that's pretty fucking cool. Blood on the ice moment. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, chat. We are making a Skyrim video, or another Morrowind video, as in you are going to help me make this video, because you <laughs> need to take responsibility. and tells us a bit about the Nereverine cult, and suggests we find a copy of the book Progress of Truth. She even establishes a code word we can use in the event something goes wrong, like this is a proper spy story. The book can be found in a variety of locations, but the easiest is to just buy it at the local rare bookstore you happen to have escorted to lay it to. Its rarity is owed to the fact that it has been a Buy it. ...officially banned by the temple for heresy. If you're curious where this is going, don't worry, we have one more quest before the big reveal. Caius is now interested in establishing an informant with the app. Alright, so that's where you're caught up, right? Um... Let me see, which one is this one? Um... I might have done this one. Uh, did you go to Aldrin and talk to an Ashlander? No. I, I did that for the Mage's Guild. Alright, so you haven't, you haven't done this okay. quest yet. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations, chat. We finished the, the Morrowind video. I know, I know, it seems strange, like we haven't finished it, but we totally have. Well, the Telvanni to bring back why See? Bethesda choose Master Nell. We're at the end. I know Divith Fear is controversial, but Master <laughs> Arion was literally the perfect candidate. Neloth isn't leaving Vardenfell just because the island exploded. And I was going to cover the Morrowind DLC for ESO, but that would require playing ESO, and I'm not thrilled at the prospect. All right. Oh. But they're doing Silence. the expansion now. Out of things to say, so I guess it's credits time. The footage you're seeing was some videos I recorded of character resolutions I wanted to include but failed to finish, so they fit in here. Firstly, music. Jeremy Soule's Morrowind soundtrack was of course used. I also used the Oblivion soundtrack during the Tribunal section and the Dragonborn soundtrack during the Blood Moon section. I used the song Escadian Idol from ESO just to make a point and do now songs from Skyward. Now Third he's now he's rising. And <laughs> I can't believe this fucking guy. Alright, uh, hey chat, what do you want to do? You want to ask us questions, now's the time. And I was expecting to be here till like 12am, but... Yeah, we knocked it out. It was a fun stream. Play ESO. No! Ugh. I'll pass that- Ugh. I pass that to private sessions, you can make an ESO oh. video. God no, please. Why would you do that? Mm -hmm. I don't play video games. I'm sorry. I can't answer that question. <laughs> Time to start the Oblivion video. I mean... I want to throw rocks at cars on the road. You should throw rocks at levitation users.
Thoughts on quantum real-time communication. It'd be interesting if it was real, but uh, I have a hard time believing. Have you learned to find joy in Fallout 76 yet? Yes, it was good until I played the DLC for it. <laughs> Trust me, it was better at launch. It was just broken. Rose's Rose's quest sucked, but the rest of it was alright. Any Battlefield Bad Company 2 opinions? That game's getting shut down, so I think it must not be very good. I own Lich them Battle Mage. I haven't played it yet, though. Any white pills for Elder Scrolls 6 you have? I don't have white pills. I don't participate in the black pilling, but that doesn't mean I have white pills. Quick question, what helps you focus on writing? Having some issues with that recently. End this with Redguard. Um, all right, uh, focus on writing. It, it's something that you kind of have to pay forward to yourself, which I know isn't going to help your current situation, but I go on a lot of walks and I talk to myself while I'm on these walks and I kind of like work through some of the ideas I have so that by the time I get to the part where I am writing, I've already kind of given it so much thought. And you have to talk. You have to talk out loud. I know how crazy that seems, but um, <laughs> if you talk out loud, you commit it more to memory. And so you will have a baseline. And so like, while I was at the tail end of the Morrowind video, I was thinking about the Oblivion video. While I was at the tail end of the Oblivion video, I was thinking about stuff I would say in, like, the Skyrim video. And so, yeah, like, if, if you're doing it for your first time, while you are recording, you want to be, like, kind of talking about it and getting used to the idea so that by the time you get to writing, um, you've got that focus. Yeah, so what helped me with writing the 76 video was that I was recording our audio at the same time. So when I went back and reviewed the footage, I basically had in real time my thoughts and my notes. So that was that was pretty helpful. Um, the way I approach it actually is when I leave the house or when I'm not working on stuff, I try and wipe my memory completely. Uh, so I go in with as fresh of eyes as possible and then i just for me it's discipline remove remove distractions just sit down and just focus and work things out and then iterate and i do i, I spend a lot of time in like revising and everything i'll reread a section like 20 or 30 times while i'm writing it and sometimes you just need to skip forward you don't have yes. to write everything in a script linearly or in, yeah. even in, in like a, a fictional story. Yep. Yeah, definitely. If you feel like you're in a roadblock or something, or there's a section that you feel more compelled to write, go and do that instead. Co go back. Go back later. Because then, because then, what that does is it gives you a, a point, two points to work between. Because like, say you wrote some stuff in the beginning and some stuff at the end. Now you have now you have two like a, a you know where you originated from and a destination that you need to work towards, and that can actually help think of like some way to connect it instead and it, it just helps recontextualize certain things do you like blades do you like the mobile game the elder scrolls blades oh oh that was for me yes yeah, um i've you. never played it oh oh wait no i take that back i did play for like an hour so one of my ideas for the skyrim video was that i was going to play blades and I installed a, um, I installed a, like an Android emulator, uh, but that requires me to go into my BIOS to like change a setting. And I can't be bothered to play, to even go into my BIOS to change a single setting just to play Blades. So that idea basically died. R. That's how, that's how little of interest I really have with playing Blades. How do you decide project priority? What do you decide to do first and why? Uh, for me, it's just like intuition and like what I want to do. 
So like whatever I'm doing that leaps off the page the most basically is what I shoot for. Uh, for me, I usually, I usually don't start a video until I have some sort of like vision of it. Like what is, so I'll use the Fallout 76 video as an example. My goal was to make a video that's about like players, like the, the journey of, of the player. And in this case, it was me and Patricia playing. So uh, the, the idea for the video was just, all right, I want this to be a story about us. And then ev everything just basically inf gets informed by that grand vision. And then every, everything else is actually a very regimented series of uh, priorities and tasks and everything very i'm very regimented when it comes to actually doing production fallout retrospective win um fallout 3 and new vegas aren't off the table it's just kind of um they don't leap to me as like inspiring projects to do well let me ask you the question then what what does inspire you uh like elden ring and cyberpunk like, I kind of, I kind of want to get out of the old games and do something more modern. Mm hmm And maybe just get away from Bethesda for a while. I have played Kingdom Come Deliverance, and I never ruled it out, per se. It was more so, like, at the time I couldn't do a video about it. It's not impossible that I could go back and um, hit up Kingdom Come. Since it meets my metric of having all of its DLC out. If it has any, I'm not sure, but... Uh, it does. I think a lot of it's small. I, I actually recently bought the whole thing. Like, I think it was like 20 bucks on sale. Think of the bag, Pat. Do fall at New Vegas in 3. Well, yeah, that is kind of like the big thing is that it is like <laughs> a next step, obviously, but... I mean, this way... This definitely... It's not an oversaturated topic yet. Uh, Dark and Darker, no... Near Automata, probably not. Uh, Fantasy Star, no. Elden Is Ring over. Is anyone gonna get to play Dark and Darker? Elden Ring overstays its welcome, in my opinion. I, I kind of disagree. It's not really that repetitive. So, Breath of the Wild. I know there's a new one coming out. The only problem with that is I'd have to get a Switch. Hmm. I assume. I get. Well, I know I he I heard stuff about people running it on PC, so. Is there an uh, emulator for it yet? I don't think it's an emulator. I think there's a way to play it on PC. Dark and Dark is really getting their arm twisted. See, this sounds like a situation where one, one person's trying to sound like the victim and the other one is they can't say anything because they're a big corporation. I think there's a lot more to the story than the public's getting right now. I want to approach Fallout 3 with a more open mind, and it's going to be a Fallout 3 New Vegas like comparison if I do it. Um, <clears throat> I don't hate Fallout 3. No, that's a lie. Um, <laughs> you said Fallout 76 is better than Fallout 3. Yeah, I think that's true. <laughs> I think Fallout 3 is definitely a low point, and like, I know people think that it's overdone, the bashing on it, and that's kind of why it doesn't inspire me too much. Um, what would have to happen is there'd have to be some sign that like I've been wrong about Fallout 3 and I don't think that's the case hmm man I did the Fallout 3 comparison Fallout 3 writing comparison to uh, Wastelanders I'm sorry the fucking the Raiders Raiders questline that was worse than anything I saw in Fallout 3. Well, by uh, far. if we're talking about the DLC, of course. <laughs> I'm talking about the base game. Uh, the base game. I don't know. There's not much there. See, the thing is, like, in the base game, there's just not a whole lot there. I got a lot more out of it than you did. Yeah, I guess so. Fallout 3 is the only one I finished. Well, Whoa. see, okay, here's the thing. I was told when I was working on Oblivion and Skyrim that those are done and dusted. There's nothing left to be gotten out of those. So, you know, I've heard that talk before. 
Surprise, no, so, surprise, surprise. I always, so I always pull something out of the well. There's so much. I think that it's just groomed just for good, big, like, uh, deep analysis videos of Fallout 3 and New Vegas. All the ones that I've seen, just not good. What was the Sorry. last game that excited you? Uh, Old Hogwarts Legacy. I'm trying to think. I still haven't played Fallout 4. It's not been on sale for cheap enough to bother. I think it's been like $6 before. Did that excite you for how upset it made people? No, I was considering Hogwarts Legacy like months before the controversy had even started. You know you can get games without buying them? <gasps> That's illegal. You should borrow them from your friends. So Hogwarts Legacy video? Probably. Um, because I do the other Harry Potter stuff, and my thoughts on Hogwarts Legacy is that it's literally like an amalgamation of every Harry Potter game, but ditching all of the bad stuff. And not written by J.K. Rowling. That part's important. Like, the whole reason the boycott seems silly is, like, J.K. Rowling had more to do with uh, order, the Order of the Phoenix game than she did Hogwarts Legacy. Is it worth it if you're not into Harry Potter? I'd say so. I don't fucking... I'm not into Harry Potter. Yeah, I'm waiting for it to go on sale before I get it. I'm into magic, not Harry Potter. And so, like... If you're playing it for just the magic, my main advice for people who want to play it is like the Middle Earth games, don't buy any talents. Get talents, but get like the stuff that unlocks more spell slots for you. And that would be it. But yeah, I'm not going to touch the, the politics surrounding Hogwarts Legacy because the thing is, the boycott has nothing to do with the game itself. It's entirely about the rights holder. And it's fine if you want to if you want to um, boycott something because of the rights holder. I, I think that's to be encouraged, really. Because uh, it's just a matter of, like, I can talk about the game without recommending people buy it. I also look at it from a uh, from a video production standpoint. It's like I've never seen a video where they get into like the deep drama and stuff, and in like three years that actually aged. Uh, well, I think the Hogwarts Legacy thing is going to be a bit of a longer lasting deal because of the broader politics surrounding it, especially with what happened in Nashville and what's been going, what was going on yesterday surrounding mm. that. It would be really funny if, like, a Harry Potter video game was a political turning point. <laughs> Did you see the Breath of the Wild 2 preview? No, but I have seen stuff from that game that's made me consider trying it. I just have to get my hands on a Switch. Well, you know, they were uh, they were inspired by Skyrim, so of course you gotta play it. Alrighty, I think we're gonna wrap things up here. If there's any more pressing questions for either of us, you better ask them now or lose the chance forever because I'm gonna stream again in five months. <laughs> What's the next big thing that's happening? Uh, well, E3 got canceled, so... Oh, the, um... There's the Starfield the... thing. There's probably going to yeah, be, yeah, like, yeah. a Starfield research stream where I go over all the promo. Uh, sometime oh. this year, before September, so... That'll be a stream. 
Yeah, I would you should probably do that like a couple weeks before when all the trailers are finally out. Tell private sessions to call me. I don't have your phone number. They're doing another Mass Effect? I thought they were joking. No, no they are. Was Mass the, Effect 4. Was the WoW video scrapped? The Liminal Space one's basically gone, yeah. Just never felt the energy to write it. And that happens sometimes, like... Um, mm -hmm. if, if I don't get a script written, uh, chances are good the video gets scrapped. If the script's written, then there, it has a chance of survival. Like I've said it before, think... the Jedi Knight video... That one got written, and then I made it, like, six months at later. I think I've thrown out more videos than I have produced at this point. I have a pretty good track record of not investing myself too much into games that, like, I cancel the project. But, yeah, that does happen occasionally. Usually they get canceled, like, halfway into recording it. Like, Fable 1. If I don't officially tell my Patreon that I'm working on something, then it's just a spitball idea. <laughs> What would a Mass Effect 4 even be about? That's why I thought it was a joke. <laughs> we don't know, but speculation is the Geth are coming back. Hearing Pat and talk we, about the are, isn't it? apathy threshold was great since it explained observations of mine that I had never been able to articulate prior. No, it really is a case that like mm -hmm. the more tedious a user interface is to use, um, the harder it is to get people to actually use it. Because it's like, you can technically explain on paper how you can mechanically solve a problem, but if it's just like, if you can't even find the will to do it, it doesn't matter. Watching any anime. I rewatched Evangelion recently. Might rewatch the rebuilds, don't know. So who did you want to die at the end of Evangelion? Me personally? Uh, mm -hmm. nobody. I, usually people I introduce it to want people to die. <laughs> oh, I want, I wanted Shin gone. Shinji. Yeah. I guess that makes a lot of sense, but at the same time, I just feel bad for him. Thoughts on Attack on Titan's anime finally ending? Can someone answer the question if they did the manga ending? Because if they did, that's hilarious. Did you watch the Netflix adaptation where they removed the gayness? Bro, that's like so important. Favorite prescription medication? Um... Caliburol. They did, and animation makes it even more hilarious. Oh, good. They uh, continued the moral plotline that abuse is okay as long as a woman's doing it. Uh, based? Shame about the liminal spaces video. Um, well, and part of the problem with the WoW video was that the time to strike was during uh, Battle for Azeroth. I'm not saying Dragonflight was like a a, uh, a good step for Blizzard, but more so the case that like Battle for Azeroth was really a great time, or uh, Shadowlands, I should say. Shadowlands was really a great time to come in and go, hey, look. Um, this world has this problem where it's fucking empty because the sharding technology and the everybody's leveling in dungeons, so like none of the zones are full of people, and so it's really weird. Ever thought about trying Disco Elysium? That might be something I do this year. Well, Todd Howard aged soon. He's already uh, the effect the effects of the deal are taking hold and the accelerated aging has begun. He stopped his aging for 10 years at the price of 
20 when it was done. No, I, I stopped reading uh, serialized manga when One Punch Man completely changed uh, the part that I wanted. Play Cultic? Yeah, I've heard that recommendation before. Will you become a Paradox YouTuber? No. I think the train's already left the station on that. Yeah, I was going to say, you're a few years late on uh, making, yeah. making a profit from being a Paradox YouTuber. Unless they fucking turn their, their business around. Yeah, they're uh, they're really uh, trying there. When when I returned Vicky 3, a game that I'd been waiting for for like four years after an hour of playing it, yeah, that's it's kind of a problem. I played And they haven't even they haven't even announced like any expansions for it or anything. The, the biggest announcement that they had at their PDX show is, oh, we're gonna give it a quality of life update. And it's like cool. Alright. Yeah, I think they're kind of struggling right now. Mm-hmm. I think they needed uh Victoria 3 to not be terrible. Which, it's like, that should have been a money printer. It should have. If you do have a New See. Vegas video, a good possible point of comparison would be the Wasteland series. I've often, yeah, I've often heard that. And people want Wasteland videos. Crusader Kings 3 burned me the same way. That's kind of the thing, is that, like, it seems like everything Paradox is doing right now is burning people. Yeah. So, like, there's only so many times that they can do that before, like... They the only were... reason the only reason they're getting they've made it this far is just due to the sheer amount of goodwill they've generated. Well, they and had it... a they had a streak where it was like they had Hearts of Iron, they had uh, yeah. launched Stellaris, um, Shit, they had even, the City even, Skylines. Even Stellaris was like that was the beginning. Well, like, what Stellaris what's... was. Solaris was a surprise hit. Everybody was like, whoa, okay. Well, and even now, you can look at their DLCs and stuff and be like, all right, the Solaris team is clearly insulated from whatever the fuck's going on at PDX because they they seem to be still making good content for that game. But what's happening is they're burning what, the, what they built up from their streak, and they're returning uh -huh. to the way that things were when Hearts of Iron 4 came out, except they have expanded needs now. They can't go back to making that amount of money because... They probably have more staff now. So it's like, um, yeah, they can't afford, afford to have Imperador be a fuck up, Crusader Kings 3 be a fuck up, uh, yeah. Vicky 3 to be a fuck up. And yeah, the, the DLC is bothering people too. Sims ripoff? Um, check out Power Lives. It's a indie dev that's making a Sims clone instead. I have, I have more faith in that than whatever PDX is going to cook up. Paradox is more profitable than ever? Maybe, but at the same time, like, is that keeping up with their uh, growth uh, projection? Like, their liabilities are going up if they have more employees spread out over more projects. Is their income coming in from sales, or is it coming in from DLC? And are they actually telling the truth about their sales? Because I heard that they were lying about the Vicky 3 sales. That they oh, were like, really? yeah, they were like counting pre-orders and actual sales like twice. <laughs> so like they were saying, oh yeah, it sold 50,000 or 500,000 copies on launch or something like that. But then it was actually like, well, actually, um, how many reviews does it have right now? That's, that's what I usually go by. Do you have plans for a mass solar rejection? I own firearms. That's about it. I'm probably going to die. I don't know how to grow food. 20,000 reviews on Steam right now. I'm sorry, that's not a game that sold 500 plus thousand copies. Not not with this community. What are the chances of more streams like this? Hopefully I do more. I do enjoy streaming, it's just a lack of topics. And it's not like nothing's going on, it's just more so like I'm not going to boot up a stream because of like uh, Twitter drama. You just gotta, you just gotta do more. See, it's like streaming is like, it's like a skill or a muscle. You just gotta do it more often and it gets easier. No, I think they need to do more trade shows. I think spring sucks. <laughs> like I haven't uploaded in spring because spring sucks.
And I'm just now reaching the point where, like, maybe I'll put something out in the next month or two. Boot up a stream to talk about Star Trek. I think it's too late on that. Become the new Moist Critical. Um, do daily uploads. Okay. I think Paradox is slowly starting to realize the community is turning their back on them. It's only a matter of time before they do something about it. It depends. They could go that route or they could continue to, like... You know, do what every other publisher has done ever and yeah, just I mean, fucking ignore that and chase yeah, money instead yeah just keep uh chasing dlc sales until i like that people act like the creative assembly guys are greedy when fucking paradoxes in this industry like <laughs> it's it's pretty surreal when you look at uh how much how much this is actually a good comparison right now let's see how much it costs to own like everything in eu4 yeah, and, and mind you, the difference is that EU4 DLC will add new mechanics. Um, Some of it. The Creative Assembly DLC will add those mechanics for free. And so all you're paying for with the CA stuff is like the new wars. $445 to get all the DLC for EU4. Paradox is Creative Assembly's personal hero. I think Creative Assembly's jealous that they can't... Uh... Creative oh, Assembly's right. refusal to patch glaring issues is so infuriating. Yeah, they're like... Uh, they're they're the clown show right now because they're juggling like 5,000 problems. You can subscribe to EU4 on Steam now. You can pay a monthly subscription mm -hmm. to get access to its... to all its fucking immersion packs and expansion packs and everything of course the money's in subscriptions what if somebody forgets to cancel their fallout first <laughs> did you cancel your fallout first yet i haven't done it yet i still need it i i, I bit the bullet and i just canceled it i'm like yeah. if, I... if you need something you can just ask me anyways so Not true yeah I, I i got everything I missed needed, opportunity I for you to do a completely uh fallout first list playthrough Fuck and, that. And let me be the pay piggy. <laughs> Fuck that. I survived three days, I think. No, two. Two days. And then I had it. Yeah, you because... I think it... I was going to fucking survive that long without the survival tent and the scrap box. Uh, you just ask me for the survival tent. <laughs> and I'll just give you all my, all my junk. Thoughts on DLC prices increasing lately? Um, there's this thing going on called inflation. Yeah. I have no pro look, I have no problems paying for games. Like this I feel like the $70 game like price hike was long overdue. I have no problems paying for games. Make it worth my money though. Don't yeah, make me kind of regret problem. it. Yeah. Is uh if Chaos Dwarves is as good as like say the Torox DLC or the Grom DLC then like $30 not too bad. And, like, a lot of people oppose it just because they don't want to spend more money on stuff. But, like, there's only mm -hmm. so far that this industry can go before... Games are $40 standard, though. You mean the inflation that didn't touch video games for ages? It did absolutely touch video games. It's just they did it through shadow transactions. Yeah. Like, literally, that's why microtransactions and <clears throat> subscription services and battle passes and season passes and all that stuff was because they wanted to charge more, but they couldn't, so... Yeah. They, nobody nobody wanted to break that seal of... Here's the thing. If you don't think a Christ. game is worth $70, you don't have to pay $70 for it. And if that yeah, means... Especially, that... Since, especially if you're playing on PC, on, like, Steam and everything, you just wait a few months and just pick it up on sale. I doubt I'm the only person here who has a backlog of literally hundreds of games. But it's like at the same time, you can't expect um, games to continue operating in these ways and not keep up with inflation. They're going to have to make up that money somehow. And it, it the, the question has transitioned from before, like, let's say 10 years ago, them wanting to increase the price to $70. Yeah, that's kind of greedy because it was never worth $60. Now at this point, like... They got to make up that money somehow for payroll. And yeah, they're being greedy. If they're shoving in fucking all the extra transactions on top of the $70 price point, like I think Call of Duty does that, then yeah, fuck yeah. them. 
but we don't pay f we don't charge for Warzone. It's a free to play game. But like Hogwarts Legacy was sixty dollars, and it's got none of the things that I take issue with. In most and they don't even have games. any plans for post launch DLC or anything. They're like, yep, it's a sixty dollar game. Yeah, I mean, like Hogwarts Legacy is literally what pe con consumers say they want. Yeah. And like, yeah, I get it. I get why people don't want to pay $70. Not just from a, I don't want to spend money perspective, but from a, you're not offering that value proposition. Yeah. But I mean, like, there's going to be a violent reckoning where the value just becomes a problem. And there's, there's only think, so long that like, they I can think continue we're to, there. they can continue think, to ring the stone dry. And so something's going to happen. And I'm just yeah. saying, if you don't think games are worth $70, don't fucking buy them for $70. You know, that means you don't have to buy games. Sounds like the industry's about to fucking fall apart. I don't I don't see anybody coming in with any bailouts. So these aren't banks here. So if people don't pay for it, and well, it falls it's like, apart. If Hogwarts Legacy was seventy dollars I and I played it, I wouldn't have felt ripped off. So that's kind of that's kind of the deal. Double A publisher is becoming a thing again. Is a really is really great though. Is it becoming a thing? Yeah, kind of. I mean, Private Division is a is an indie publisher on paper, mm. but they're really a double A. But and they and they fucking suck dick. <laughs> That's not what people are really talking about. But yeah. That's kind of the thing. I mean, you should be on board with accelerationism. Make the triple A industry worse so that the indie market can have more of a uh, market power. Yeah. Private Division is just a branch of Take-Two. Yeah, but they, spe they specialize on paper in indie games. And that's the point I'm making. But Take-Two are fuckers, so... Unsurprisingly, Private Division acts the same way. Are you saying you were not impressed by the Outer Worlds remaster? <laughs> How do you feel about Horse Armor? Horse Armor sucks. The problem with Horse Armor was that um, it, it was just lazy. Like, the value proposition was bad for what it actually added. So it's like, how do you come up with an accurate value for a DLC like that? Like, how long did it take them to make that, you know, what did it cost to pay the modeler? What did it cost to pay the person who implemented it, who bit, did barely anything? And then spread out across all the people who bought it is, what was it, 250 Really a good price point for that DLC. It's like a $0.10 cent DLC. Yeah. But of course, they can't charge $0.10 cents for it. So, in that case, you do what developers had always been doing, which is you make it part of an expansion pack. Because an expansion pack is just a bunch of 10 cent DLCs all bundled together so that it's got a good value. And that's what they did with, uh, with Anniversary Edition. They took a bunch of 10 cent DLCs and charged you $20. Wasn't Horse Armor testing the waters for microtransactions? Kind of, but that's kind of a twisting of the narrative. What happened was Microsoft was um, like trying to get a bunch of people who were coming out on the 360 to use uh, the Xbox Live Store. And so, but they didn't have, like Microsoft didn't have a vision of how the Live Store was gonna get used. And so like they told people what DLC was and kind of like what it should be, but that was about it. So it's like, it should be something that gamers can easily download and it should be kind of cheap. And then a bunch of different developers had different interpretations of what that was. And that's why you had like Bungie putting out map packs. Well, Bungie was releasing map packs before that actually. Selling them on disc, though, in the Halo 2 era. Yeah, it w I'm not saying that was anything new, but, like...
big box bun game bundles. Um, yeah, Humble Bundle now. Actually, um, Steam is starting to do that too. Uh, I got, what was it? Um, Medieval Dynasty and uh, there's another game in there that I really wanted. Planet Crafter, I think. And a, yeah, yeah, it was Planet Crafter and Medieval Dynasty in a bundle. Two completely unrelated games, but they were both like survival crafting type games. And yeah, I just I bought it. I won both games. And I bought it. I was like, that's pretty awesome. So leave it to leave it to Valve to resurrect a, an old idea. It's kind of like the film industry when they sell DVD versions of stuff. That tends to be like the last little dribble of revenue that they get from the movie, but they just squeeze that little bit more out of it. Pat muted. This is a lie. I hear you. Map packs were amazing. I miss map packs. I miss when map packs were good. I, you know, I'm, I just miss shooters that had good maps. Let's let's put it that way instead. I miss, yeah, I miss good level design. Yeah. I miss when shooters had a level, had like a map that was only designed for one or two game modes and that was it. Well... But the problem, I don't know what's going on with the level design in the like competitive uh, industry. Everybody saw what League of Legends did with the three lanes, and now that's what we all that's what we have to live with. I I think what it is, maybe what it is, is like games are maintained by uh, skeleton crews, and mm -hmm. the skeleton they don't put like uh, oh no they don't put. Uh, level designers in the skeleton crew yeah or you're like you know you're a a list developers and stuff you're gonna put them on the next big project so the people maintaining it are kind of new hires inexperienced people you know so they're not gonna really do anything crazy I'm trying to think of like the last shooter that I played that had really good map design. I'm coming up empty. Like Halo Halo 2 is still like my uh that's my gold benchmark for uh map design. Outsourcing contracting maps is a thing as well. Well, it's like the mm -hmm. problem is what these games need is iterative design. So you run the map for a season and then you get feedback on like what the main problems with it was and you make small changes to it to try and see if like you can over time tweak the map into being a good space. No, you just give give people uh you give the uh MLG people map design tools and then they just make the maps so that it's perfect for their game mode. And then yeah. you just take those maps and then put it into the rotation. To mind, I think Valve is the only company that's actually doing that. Um, is is three four three using Forge maps yet in Halo Infinite? Uh, not that I'm aware of. At least not. In I mean that that was knows. that was a Bungie and three four three inherited that idea from Bungie as well. You know, when you have Forge. But you can't do like obviously struck like major structural changes to a to a map. It's like oh we're gonna put a wall here. Uh yeah, you'd have to go to like you, it, the problem with Bungie's era was like Forge World, mm -hmm. so all the maps look the same. Okay, they are now. I mean, they they got it right. Made that made that whole system for a reason. Yeah, I mean, how, who else is going to maintain Halo Infinite but the community? <laughs> the 
Morrowind video rewatch is over. Yeah, I'm going to end the stream in like three minutes. I'm just waiting for that nice round number. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if I can stream a round number, but... 343 three decided players had too much freedom and started banning people that were making offensive maps. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's not surprising. What's your favorite food? Uh, chicken and rice? Uh, hot dogs? I like it when they're sliced before they're microwaved. Is this Skyrim video coming out? I'm gonna assume that one's for me. Uh, uh, eventually. Sometime in the summer, hopefully. I want it out before Starfield. I want it done before Starfield releases. Let's put it that way. Would you implement a King Crimson time skipped magic effect from Morrowind? That would be way too fucking convoluted to even try to implement. And I don't have- I only have 40 seconds to explain why. Okay, King Crimson, it keeps the effects that he wants it to have. It, like, keeps the effects but removes the cause? Or is it removes the cause but keeps the effects? I think it's the, the latter. So you could use it to, like, get shot through but kill somebody. But, like, um, I think it'd be too complicated to really try to implement that into a 3D system. You erase the enemy's action on touch. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I would start with, like... I would start with, like, Dio's power or something before I would go to, like, uh, you know, King Crimson. 